Chapter One of The Perfect Frame by William Ard. Read by Ben Tucker. I said, Yes, ma'am, my name is Timothy Dane, and those were the first and last words of pure truth spoken in my office that afternoon. She said her name was Evelyn Huntington, Mrs. Walter Huntington. She said she had married Walter Huntington six months ago and separated from him four weeks later. Walter, she said, drank. He had strange habits. She patted a tissue-thin handkerchief to her eye as she told me about the night she had found a brassiere in Walter's overcoat pocket. She crossed her legs. She said I knew the type of man Walter was without going into all the details. Lurid ones. She adjusted her skirt. Did I know what it was like, she asked, to be, well, considered attractive and be put through an experience like that? It was awful, she said. I just sat there and stared across my desk at her and didn't say anything. She was that pretty. She told me that naturally she knew how busy I was. Then I thought, you know something I don't. I told her that I didn't generally handle divorces, which wasn't a lie because I didn't generally have any to handle. Oh, she didn't want to divorce Walter. That wasn't it. She was here because she was frightened and because Walter might be in some kind of trouble. You mean, I asked, something aside from yourself? What? Nothing, I said. She said she knew she wasn't giving me much to go on, but would I help her? Then she took a deep breath, and her fine young bosom heaved. I switched my gaze to the tip of my thumb and asked her who had sent her up here and what exactly was her problem. There was a silence, and when I looked up she was watching me with a strange look on her face as though she were about to say something she wasn't supposed to. But then her face composed itself, and she told me that she had opened the classified to the private detective listings closed her eyes and made a jab with a pencil. When she opened her eyes again, there was a black dot between the words Dane and Timothy. I grunted and went back to looking at my thumb. I said, Just how can I help you, Mrs. Huntington? Oh, you're wonderful, she said. Her light blue eyes were round and earnest, and the bodice of her beguiling black dress rose and fell again, emotionally. She did that very well, and my own eyes cheered her on. What she wanted me to do was visit a place called the Harmony Bar, it was over on the east side, at 21st Street and 3rd Avenue. Why? She gave me that strange look again and said that was what she wanted me to find out. Why? She said she had gotten a message in the morning mail, a note it was, that advised her to be at the Harmony Bar that night if she wanted to learn something important about her husband, Walter Huntington. That sounds very much like divorce business, I said. I don't think it is, she answered. Why? She said she just had a feeling, that's all. I asked her who the note was from. She said it wasn't signed. I asked to see the note. She said she lost it. I smiled. This isn't a divorce mill, I reminded her. I don't snoop around wayward husbands, no matter how many overcoats they stuff with brassiers. It isn't for a divorce, she insisted. But Walter is still my husband, and I'm worried about him. I'm afraid to go down to that place by myself, she said. Oh, wouldn't I please, please help her? I turned in my swivel and looked out the window, out toward the buildings that stretched for the sky and above them in the blue springtime that blanketed the city. But that didn't make me any less aware of that girl at my back. Blonde she was, honey blonde and cool. At first glance, cool, but beneath the coolness was an honesty, or innocence, if the word doesn't gag you, that made the other thing seem like a veneer, a defense against something. When you looked beyond the covering, she was a beautiful girl from somewhere that was simple and uncomplicated, not at all like New York. But she had come here with a magic wand that was supposed to set the big town on its ear. What had gone wrong? She certainly had the build to work magic. It was a display figure, stacked carefully and generously. A figure to be shown to men and to be admired, to be inventoried, and if it came to that, to be bargained for. She looked like she could be anything she wanted to be. But what had gone wrong? I swung back to her and said I would help her if I could. But saying I would help her didn't, for some reason, seem to make her happy. I had the unusual feeling that she had changed her mind, that she wished I had turned her down. Then she smiled and said, Fine, would I go there tonight? And if nothing happened tonight, would I go back to the Harmony Bar tomorrow night? That was all, so she told me that she could afford. How much would I charge for two nights' work? I looked into her wide blue eyes and thought about the rent that wasn't paid. I thought about the shirt on my back and the clean one, the last clean one, 
in the bureau drawer in my room. I thought about the no-nonsense letter in this morning's mail from the telephone company. I remembered, as if it was something you're likely to forget, that this pretty girl was the nearest thing to a client I had seen in three long weeks. I looked at her and said, Fifty dollars, casually. Fifty? She seemed surprised. I opened my mouth to say forty, but she spoke first. Well, she said, that's certainly reasonable. And taking a neat roll from her purse, she laid five new ten-dollar bills on my desk. Another hundred or more went back into the purse, and I sighed. She asked me if I understood what I was supposed to do. I answered that I guessed all I would do was go down to this bar and see who it was that wanted to see her. Yes, she said. Just find out what kind of a place it is. See what's going on that concerns Walter Huntington. I'll call you in the morning. Then she stood up, uncertainly, and hesitated before my desk for a moment. You seem like a nice person, she said. Are you happily married? No, I said. I'm not even unhappily married. It must be wonderful, she said, to be married to a man and make him happy. She turned and walked out of my office, swaying her nice up-tilted behind at me. If the day ever comes, I said silently to the behind, that you can't make a man happy. That's when we all shave our curly locks and join a la Masserie. End of chapter one. Chapter two. How much is one dollar? One dollar is the price of a cab from my office at Broadway and 44th Street to the bar on 3rd Avenue and 21st Street, where I would keep a date for Evelyn Huntington. Half of it is the price of a whiskey and water when I got there. One dollar is only a single buck, to be spent without thinking on all the trivial incidents that attend a man's daily business. Also, one dollar is the price Charlie Fong charges to launder five shirts for a bachelor. One dollar is one of the meals at Child's. No appetizer, no dessert. One dollar is a whole buck. And a whole buck comes hard when you're fighting desperately to hang on in the world's toughest city at the kind of work you want to do. I should be at thirty, and with a law degree, an eager junior partner in some pine-paneled Madison Avenue law firm. I should be, if not that, the bright-eyed law clerk to Judge Reynolds in Washington, as he keeps asking me to be, and getting my hands into that lush political mud pie. I should be living in three modern rooms in Georgetown or Scarsdale or Shaker Heights or just outside Los Angeles, but I'm not any of those things or in any of those places. I'm a starving private detective in one room on the third floor rear of a converted brownstone fire trap on 53rd Street, where I'm lullabied to sleep each night by 25 Dixieland bands blaring along 52nd Street Strip Row. And I'm not taking any dollar cab over to 3rd Avenue. I'm walking, and I'm almost there, and the broken neon sign reads Harmony Bar. The place has been carved out of a warehouse that rises behind it, and it hides under black nighttime shadows of the 3rd Avenue L which it should, because it's the crummiest dive I've ever walked into. And that, kiddies, is crummy. The bar is scarred and dirty, and the glass of beer that the weasel-faced, dirty-necked bartender sets down is smeared and unwashed. There are three dirty tables next to the bar, covered by dirty, checkered cloths. And if there were any customers sitting at them, I'm sure they'd be dirty-necked, too. But as it is, it's just me and the bartender, and he doesn't like my looks any more than I like his. This is the first time I've ever felt conspicuous because my shirt is clean and my suit is freshly pressed. There's nothing strange about such a filthy bar on the east side of New York, and the only reason I mention it is that Evelyn Huntington must have been intuitive about not wanting to come down here. It is no place for a girl. Not even a tawny-skinned rumbler on Okinawa, and their hair below a mainline debutante, would walk a marine gunner, and their hair above a marine general, into a derelict trap like the Harmony Bar. I stared down into the flat slush in the glass, knowing I would never drink it, and then decided to do something this place had never seen. I went back to wash my hands and hoped that the alleged message writer would show up while I was gone. When I stepped out of the john, I gave the back of the place a quick look. To the rear was a shadowy, grime-streaked wall hung from ceiling to floor at the far end with a painter's tarpaulin. That's all there was to the back, and all that was up front were the tables, the bar, and the bomb behind it. And a customer. Or maybe he wasn't a customer. He had taken his place at the empty bar directly behind my untasted beer, and he was a very big man. Big from the floor, where his big feet were planted to the bristling top of his close-cropped black hair. Big in the chest, in the hands, in the face. 
big from the slope of one thick shoulder clear across to the other. The mahogany-colored mole on his forehead was bigger than my eye. I didn't keep on walking toward him to make an issue out of my beer, but to find out why he thought he had to guard it, and to find out where he had appeared from. The little bell over the door hadn't tinkled while I was gone. God knows he hadn't been there before. I was very polite. I said, If that beer is in your way, I'll move it. And I reached for it, but stopped because his thick fist wrapped itself around the glass. He had watched me, scowling, all the way across the room, scowling and thinking, and it made cavernous wrinkles in his forehead. You want this beer, Mac? He said and the voice was a rolling growl from somewhere deep inside a keg-like chest. I shook my head and grinned up at him. "'How'd you like this beer?' he asked. "'Right in your kisser. Glass and all, Mac.' "'I wouldn't like that,' I admitted, and waited. He eyed me with a tight grin across his broad face, and I watched his mammoth fingers tighten on the glass. But he didn't lift it from the wood, and we just stood there like that, eye to eye, for more seconds.' Eh, let the bastard have it, Bull. The bartender's voice was a low, nervous whine in the room. What the hell are you stalling for? Bull's eyes didn't waver from my face. He lifted the glass of beer slowly. Then his left arm swept out suddenly, snatched my right arm in a vice, and jerked me toward him with a force that almost pulled me off the floor. His hand slipped down my arm to my wrist, and with a sharp upward twist he doubled it back in a good hammerlock. What that beer now, Mac? He snarled close to my ear. I could feel the tendons snapping up and down my forearm. It's going to break, I told him. His answer was to force my arm tighter, and I began to chew on my lower lip, trying to stay as erect as I could to move with the last extra push he would give my arm. Don't you want that beer now, Mac? No. You sure? He brought my wrist as high as my shoulder blades, and the real pain was shooting up and down my arm and into my side. It's going to break! I said again. Drink! No. He snorted and dropped my wrist. It fell of its own accord and hung there beside me. His right hand grabbed my shirt and tie and the fist came up under my jaw, jamming the back of my head against the wall. He pulled me forward and did it again. I came off the wall with my knee raised high and plunged it deep and hard into his groin. The big man gasped loudly and bent over like the blade in a jackknife, the back of his neck directly below me but I couldn't lift my right arm to hit him, and that cost me the round and the fight. Something swung from behind the bar, cracked against the base of my skull, and the dirty room went all purple and yellow before my eyes. I should have let myself fall immediately, but I didn't, and the bartender had a second shot at me. That one toppled me across the bull, who was getting over the nausea, and he stood erect, pulled me back up with his hands under the lapels of my jacket, and ran me into the wall again. And another time. The shock of it began to clear my head and help my eyes focus. Don't you crummy Seamuses ever get enough? The bull was angry about something. What's a Seamus? I mumbled. What's enough? The wall met my head with a sick thud. What's your pal Jameson got? He roared. That's enough. Jameson? If I'd been able to speak again, I might have asked it aloud. If I'd been able to think, I'd have wondered what the hell my client had sucked me into. The bull was shoving painfully against my Adam's apple, convincing me that I'd been taken for a ride by a beautiful blonde with a hypnotic behind. I was a shill. You ought to get what Jameson got, he was saying. He swung me out of the corner and swept me along toward the door. The bartender, grinning out of a face with teeth missing, rushed around to see how he could help. But the bull didn't need any. With his free hand, he opened the door, and then with both hands, he threw me out, backwards, onto Third Avenue. I landed on my shoulder, but not full enough to keep my skull from cracking hard against the concrete sidewalk. And tell the party that sent you, the bull shouted from the doorway, to keep you and every other crummy snoop the hell away from here. Next time, Mac, he warned me, I get rough. The bartender's ugly little head peered from behind the other man's mountainous bulk. Next time, Dirty Neck screamed. We fix you good, you lousy good-for-nothing bastard. The door to the Harmony Bar closed. I had the sidewalk on 3rd Avenue all to myself. <laughs> Next time, I thought, getting slowly to my feet and grimacing at my dirt-smeared suit. I get smarter. When I found I could stand without reeling like a drunk, I edged toward the doorway again. 
I wanted to take another long look at what had happened to me, but the bull was nowhere to be seen inside. Wherever he had come from five minutes ago, he was there again. And if it was magic, the bartender wasn't as impressed as I was. He was sitting behind the bar again, calmly reading the pink edition of tomorrow morning's news. I could make out the headline clearly from the street, but it didn't say where the bull was. A lot of things climbed in and out of the wood inside the Harmony, but nothing the size of him. I knew if I walked inside, it would bring him out. But what was still operating among my scrambled brains told me that it would bring me out again, too. Right out on the Third Avenue. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 As I turned north along 3rd toward 22nd Street, I had a lot of unanswered questions in my mind, all of them starting and ending with Evelyn Huntington. But I could find out why she had sent me down here at my leisure. The pressing problem, literally pressing and banging inside my tender skull, was the bull. Where had he come from? Where had he gone? And what was he watching in a dirty little dive like Harmony? Why did a fire trap like that one need a bouncer, especially a bouncer as efficient as the bull? In spite of everything else I thought about him, I had to admit he had talent. For all his mammoth size, he moved like a slick cat. And unlike most men in the 250-pound-plus class, he knew how to make every ounce of it count. He was a muscle boy with sharp coordination, and somebody was paying a nice fee for the use of those muscles. In the wrestling racket alone, he'd have made himself a soft 200 a week. Somebody was making it worthwhile to keep him off television. And if he was guarding the Harmony, how was I going to lure him out of there long enough to find out what it was? In case of emergency, says the telephone directory, call the police. What made me think of the police, me of all people? And what did the police make me think of? It was something about that bartender, something he had been reading in the news. It was the headline in the news that I had read. I stopped at the newsstand on the corner of 22nd and spent three cents for a copy of my own. The headline was Police Hunt Bronx Strangler, and below it was a five-column picture of a woman draped like a rag doll over a very must-up bed. Under the picture I read, all police units in the city were alerted in the search for the madman rapist who entered the apartment of Miss Tilly Bartell above in the Bronx, attacked her, and then strangled her to death as she fought valiantly for her honor. Story on page three. What story was left? I reread it, knowing damn well that 3rd Avenue and 22nd Street is a long way from the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. And probably the bull hadn't been near the Bronx since the Giants were home last, which was over a week ago. Still, it was worth a try. Anything is worth at least one try, except maybe a rumbler on Okinawa, or so a marine gunner told me. I glanced up at 22nd Street, and in my mind I could see the two dull green lights out in front of the 13th Precinct, two short blocks to the east. The news said, All police units were alerted. Let's see if that took in the 13th Precinct. I ducked into an all-night candy store, dropped my dime, and dialed operator. Give me the nearest police station, life or death! She plugged me in immediately. Thirteenth precinct, said the bored voice. Sergeant Winkler. The Strangler, I gasped. The Bronx Strangler. He's in the Harmony Bar. The what? Where? I came down two octaves. The guy who strangled the dame in the Bronx tonight. He's in the Harmony Bar. H is in Henry. A is in Apple. I know where it is. He was excited now. He's there now, I shouted back. Insane drunk, armed to the teeth. He's yelling at the top of his lungs. He says every cop in New York City's a yellow son of a... He did! The receiver slammed against my eardrum, and by the time I was out of the booth, out of the store, and back on the street, the cops were charging down 22nd. Two green and white cars overtook the footman at 3rd Avenue and leaped down to 21st, sirens screaming. A third and fourth carload screeched to a stop right behind them, and more cops running filled 3rd Avenue still buttoning on their hardware and swinging those nasty little black sappers. I followed them leisurely, like a man out walking his dog, except that he had no dog, and took up a spot in the doorway opposite the good old Harmony Bar. It was better than a seat on the 50-yard line of the old Army Notre Dame fracas, and I didn't need a program to tell who the players were. This much can be said for the bull. Whoever was paying him had told him to keep all cops out, whether they were private and came one at a time or public, precinct at a time. With a bottle in each tremendous mitt, he met the first blue squad in the doorway, and back they fell. But when the squad grew to a platoon, the
the blues swarmed inside. The ape gave ground dearly, only one foot a minute, and those yard arms hanging from his shoulders swung about him murderously, dropping eager policemen in every direction. But then they sent a flanking line over the bar itself, and this crew immediately tipped the furniture, beer spigots, bartender, and all into the center of the small room. That narrowed the bull's fighting room to a couple of feet, and suddenly his great head disappeared from view below an ocean of blue-coated shoulders. He had definitely resisted arrest, if that's the word I'm looking for. This much can be said for the police. They may not dress as pretty as the Mounties, and they may not always get the right man, but when the desk sergeant tells them to hop down to the Harmony Bar and get any man, my George, they get him. And the only reason they got the bull alive was that the coward became unconscious before he became a corpse. Now they were dragging him out heels aloft, and his skull was bouncing along the same pavement that the back of my head knew so well. The Harmony was a shambles, and my heart was breaking to see the bartender lift himself to his feet and stare around dazedly at the wreckage. Then he put on his hat and coat, closed the door carefully behind him, locked it, and headed in the direction of the Bowery, where, I imagined, he slept in some diamondite flea bag. When his back had disappeared into the shadows of Third Avenue, I crossed over and let myself inside. I have no secret knowledge of locks. It was just a matter of lifting the door as far as it would go on its hinges and leaning against it gently. I stepped carefully over the broken glass and around the upended bar to find the place, wherever it was, that my boyo had disappeared to in between calls from me and the police. Something on the shelf of the bar caught my eye. Something that wasn't natural. It was a bottle of whiskey, and it hadn't been broken. It looked unhappy and alone, and I took it along with me on my search of the harmony. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Except for what had happened to the front of the old dump, it was still the same old dump as I poked around for the bull's hiding place. The sidewall had no hidden door, nor was there any exit in the bar area. The only way to leave the tiny john was the way I got in. That left only the rear wall, and sure enough, when I lifted the painter's tarpaulin, there was the door. I pushed it open and stepped through. Now I was in a warehouse, a huge barn-like place lighted by occasional dim bulbs. It was used to store a great many files and wire crates, and I came close to one of them to see who they belonged to. It said, in stencil, Property of Oceanic Brokerage Company, New York City. Somewhere, sometime, but only vaguely, I had heard of Oceanic. As the name implied, they were brokers, insurance, as I recalled, and Oceanic meant marine, marine insurance brokers. So what? Where did the bull figure? Did the big guy work for Oceanic? Insurance brokers stored old policies, that I knew, and probably kept night watchmen. But again, the bull was not the night watchman type. Night watchmen are old men who get paid 60 cents an hour to stay awake during the time when they can't sleep anyhow. But the bull was working for somebody, and for some reason this warehouse was where he kept coming from and going to. Now I was wondering if Evelyn Huntington hadn't been leveling with me all along. Maybe she didn't know anything about the bull. He might even be working for Walter Huntington, and she didn't know about that either. Maybe my business with her had nothing to do with the Jameson the bull had told me about. I wasn't a shill, after all. Maybe. I pulled open one of the files, not expecting to find any answers, and I was right. The file held nothing but old policies from various insurance companies. They were the broker's copies, all plainly marked in red with the single word, Cancelled. I lifted one out and studied it. It was a policy of an English insurance company that protected the White Circle tanker fleet for all hull damages up to $33 million. A hell of a lot of money. And this policy in my hand was only one of the several hundred in this particular file. I looked around. There must have been over 500 files and crates in the rooms, and maybe Oceanic Brokerage had other warehouses besides this one. It looked like a very healthy outfit, Oceanic, and hardly one that needed personnel like the character the cops had just hauled out of here. Nor did Evelyn Huntington, blue eyes and all, go with an operation as obviously dull and straight-laced as this huge brokerage firm seemed to be. But just to keep all the loose ends in order, I decided to call the Oceanic's claims man and see what ideas he had whoever he was. He wouldn't have any, naturally, but he should be interested to know what was going on around his warehouse. And if some outside job ever came up, as they do, he might remember Timothy Dane. I let myself out of the Harmony Bar as I'd entered, except that the door wouldn't relock and I took the whiskey bottle with me. With all that had been spilled on the floor, who'd miss the quart I was going to spill into me? 
The candy store from where I'd alerted the 13th precinct was still open, and the old man in the back gave me a bored look. Had some excitement down the street, I said. He shrugged, which is all you'll ever get on 3rd Avenue. I found the Oceanic brokerage number listed and got the night man on the wire. Everybody's gone home hours ago, he told me. Yes, he'd give me the name and the telephone of the company's claims agent. He's Mr. Robinson, he said. Plaza 2-1516. Robinson? I asked. That wouldn't be Jocko Robinson. The man didn't know about any Jocko, but the Oceanic claims agent was Mr. Robinson. I thanked him and dialed the number. I almost didn't believe the voice that sounded a sleepy hello. But it could belong to nobody else but Jocko Robinson, the grim little Englishman who had been the top operative at the old Pioneer Agency in Chicago while I was learning the business. I gave him a big greeting. I called him an old jackass. "'What do you want, Dane?' he asked flatly. "'What do I want?' I laughed. "'Still the same old Jocko. Always happy to hear from his pals. Always ready for a party. How are you, boy?' Dane, it's nice to hear from you. What do you want? I don't want anything, damn it. What's biting you? Don't tell me you got married. Look, Dane, I'm a respectable man. I work from nine to five now. What do you want? Okay, Jocko, the hell with you. What I'm calling about has to do with your nine to five oceanic job. We're full up, Dane. If a vacancy comes up, I'll keep you in mind. Will you really, Mr. Robinson? Honest? Listen, Junior, if a vacancy comes up, you can take it and... Have you been drinking, Dane? Is that your trouble? Hold the line, Mr. Robinson. Don't go away. I held the bottle to my lips and took a good pull. Yes, you anemic little bastard, I said. I've been drinking. Now, does Oceanic have a warehouse on 3rd Avenue and 21st? A warehouse? He sounded much different, a little off guard. Why? You got a watchman there? Why? What's it to you, Dane? You got a watchman there? Why, Dane, what's there to watch? Don't you know, pal, maybe there is a job open down at Oceanic. Yours. What's this all about, Timothy? Why should an Oceanic warehouse cause you any trouble? Well, Jocko, since you put it that way, I was wondering if you knew that a guy about ten feet tall was doing a lousy public relations job for Oceanic down there. Really? I don't know of anyone that we have in that warehouse. Do you know what's in it? No, tell me. It's for cancelled policies, that's all. They're of no use to anybody. But the insurance laws say we have to keep them stored for twenty years. Why? Jocko Robinson explained. Protection from our clients, in case anything comes up that they might have been covered for when the policy was in effect. Maybe some seaman got something in his eye ten years ago, and it doesn't start bothering him until last week. Or maybe a ship sprung a small leak on a trip a few years back, and nobody finds out till tomorrow. But aside from that, these policies are worthless. Jocko Robinson paused for a moment, then he laughed, if that's what the sound was that came over the wire. <laughs> Even then, they're not much good to anybody. It takes some proving before we collect a loss on a cancelled policy. But the law says keep them, so we keep them. Is that what you're called about? I wasn't even interested in the policies, I said. I just thought you might be interested in this character who hangs out in the warehouse. Well, you know Third Avenue, Dane. But thanks for the tip, old man. I'll have the police look into the place tomorrow. Good night. The police already looked into it, Jocko. What? They got the guy down at 13th Precinct. I don't know what he's booked for, but he was arrested on suspicion of murder. What? Murder? I laughed. Just a gag, Jocko, but he'll probably spend the night there or in some hospital. Is that so? Well, you certainly have strange tidings, Timothy. Well, good night. Before you go Betty by, Jocko, I just want to ask you one question to convince myself of something. What now? I was just wondering if, offhand, you ever heard of anyone named Walter Huntington. There was silence on his end, then quietly. Why? You know him. I was amazed. Why? Now, look, Jocko, don't start that routine again. Who's Walter Huntington? Jocko was deciding something. Huntington is a vice president of the Oceanic Dane. But what's it to you? Good night, Jocko. Thanks. Dane, are you on a job? A job? What's a job, Jocko? I remember hearing the word in Chicago. The Pioneer Agency used to get things called jobs. What's Walter Huntington to you, Tim? Maybe I can help you. Now it was Tim. 
You already have, Mr. Robinson. Thanks again. Stop clowning, Tim. I meant that I might be able to help you pick up a few dollars investigating that warehouse setup. God knows I've got enough to keep me busy tracking down these claims every day. Maybe you'd stumbled onto something down there. You think so, Chaco? Who knows? Tell you what. I'll have you come up to see Mr. Forbes tomorrow morning. Mr. Forbes is president of Oceanic. Oh, that'll be nice. I'm trying to do your turn, Tim. Then you can tell Mr. Forbes what you suspect. What do I suspect, Jocko? That something is out of order at the warehouse. I'll recommend that you look into it. It ought to be a nice little job, Tim, and certainly very little effort. You think so, Jocko? This time he chuckled. It sounded like Scrooge before the Crockett's got to work on him. Believe me, Tim, there's nothing at Oceanic besides claims that need investigating. It's a very respectable operation. And you've got everything under control up there. I have everything under control. Everything, Timothy. Well, I'll see. What's that? I said I'll see you tomorrow, Jocko. Have a good night's rest. Don't worry, Timothy. I shall. Good night. And that, as they say, was that. Evelyn Huntington had used me as a decoy, and she didn't seem to care what risks she took so long as it was my body. And now my ex-partner, the guy I once stopped a thirty-eight slug for out in Chai, the guy who spent two weeks on his back after pulling me out of a hop joint on the south side, the guy I roomed with, ate with, lent money to, and borrowed money from, now Jocko Robinson was setting me up to shill for something else. Or thought he was. Maybe I thought Evelyn and Jocko were putting out feelers for the same game. But whatever the game was, I didn't have any idea. Not yet. It didn't matter so much about the blonde. Women always try to use men for one reason or another. But Jocko made me good and mad. So mad that I almost forgot to call this fellow Jameson. The one the bull had rearranged. I located his night wire in the red book and a woman answered the phone cautiously. She said I couldn't speak to Mr. Jameson. Whatever it was, she said, Mr. Jameson wasn't interested. Who was she? She was Mrs. Jameson, and she didn't care whether I wanted to help her husband or not. He wasn't interested. Right, I said. But tell your husband, for whatever it's worth to his morale, that the bull has gotten his. Mrs. Jameson said she'd tell him, but she didn't think it would interest him. He wasn't, she said, interested in anything anymore. He was very sick. His head hurt, and he had terrible pains in his stomach. He... She hung up abruptly, but not before I heard her crying into the mouthpiece and trying to hold it back. Wherever this thing led me, whoever else I was due to meet before the end of the line, I told myself to be sure to look after the bull's keeper. Personally. Professional courtesy, let's call it, to a private man named Jameson who was sick. I headed back uptown to my office, wondering what tomorrow would bring. The night guard took me up and I asked him to wait. From my desk I got a small white envelope, wrote the name Jezebel on it, put in $49.90 of Evelyn Huntington's money, and shoved the envelope into the safe. That made me feel much better. Sure it did. Now I could go home and it would be like all the other nights. Not a client on the books. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5 The telephone answering service, Secretaries Don't Grow on Trees, gave me two messages when I arrived back at my office the next morning. One was from Mr. Franklin Forbes of Oceanic Brokerage, and I was to call him at my convenience. The other was from a woman, no name, and I was to call her immediately at Plaza 6-1000. I thanked the operator for the service and sat down to open my mail. The first letter was from the telephone answering service. All it had on it were some dates with figures next to them. Someone had written the word PLEASE across the bottom and underlined it dramatically. I filed it in the basket. The next letter was from the people who own this building. Very nice people. Very polite. Polite but firm. The next letter... Oh, hell, this goes on and on, and my reaction is always the same. Tengo no dinero, the little poem starts. Caramba, this is hell, it ends. Jerry the shoeshine boy dropped by with my copy of the Times. I asked him if he'd trade his news for it. He shrugged, Puerto Rican style, and thought he didn't like the idea. He wasn't sure if maybe I might not come into a quarter one of these days and want to shine. I got his paper, and he went along sadly with mine. This was a final edition of the news. The headline said, Nab Bronx Strangler, but they weren't talking about the bull. 
It was some other guy, and he'd been hiding in the basement of the Bronx apartment, and he'd made a full confession. I was almost back to the centerfold before the 13th precinct got a break. There was no picture of the bull. In fact, he wasn't even called the bull. He was Clarence. Sick, erat scriptum. Hulbert. Police, said the brief story, arrested Clarence Hulbert last night on a charge of disturbing the peace. Hulbert, police said, used abusive language to an officer, and when asked to desist, he continued to be abusive and profane. Hulbert, police said, listed himself as unemployed and was booked on the additional charge of vagrancy. He was removed to Bellevue Hospital, but no further details were given. I added them up. Abusing a police officer, disturbing the peace, vagrancy, resisting lawful arrest. It came to at least six months, and I hoped that the Jamesons read about it. I thought about that for a few minutes, and about the honest scrub woman who hadn't nipped at the bottle of Seagram's in my desk drawer. It was just as I'd left it, a quarter full. I pulled the cap off and took a mouthful, and almost choked to death. It was plain water. Terrible stuff. The thieving scrub woman had drained my precious liquid and poured back water. That made me feel good enough to return the urgent call to Plaza 61000, and the no-name woman who answered was, of course, Evelyn. She sounded nervous. Are you all right? she asked. Shouldn't I be? I don't know. I, I've been worried about you all night long. Why? Were you afraid you were running out of fall guys? What? The party's over, sweetheart. I went down to the Harmony, like you said. I ran into that big ape, as you knew I would. I didn't get killed, but that's not your fault. Oh, Timothy. Don't call me Timothy. You call me sweetheart, she said, sounding very young. Believe me, sweetheart, I didn't mean it tenderly. I don't even know what to call you. You're certainly not Mrs. Huntington. I know, Timothy. Anything you want to say, I deserve it. She was crying. It came over the wire softly, saying more than a thousand words. There was a sound of a girl at the end of a rope, a beautiful girl from a nice little town who was somehow deep in trouble in the ugly city where all the slickers live. I couldn't think of anything to do about it. I'm sending back your fifty dollars, I told her. Buy a ticket with it. Get on a train and go home. Oh, Timothy, I'm in trouble... I need help. Go back home, I repeated. I can't. Not now. I need help. She spoke like that, slowly, jerkily. Get on a train, I insisted. Get out of town. Whatever you're mixed up in, drop it and run before you get knocked down. I can't. She sobbed the words. Oh, I want to, but I can't. Won't you please help me, Timothy? Please. Goodbye. I said as softly as I could. Good luck and no hard feelings. Timothy! I held the receiver at arm's length and looked at the little holes in the ear cup. I could still hear her voice crackling out of those little holes. Crackling, but plaintive. And I remembered what she looked like and how she probably looked now. I should have hung the damn thing up. The voice meant nothing but trouble. More than fifty dollars could ever buy. I started the receiver back toward its cradle. I heard the small sounds again. Please, Timothy. Then I spoke into the mouthpiece. Where are you? I asked. It came at me in a rush. 321 West 44th. The apartment's in the name of Barnes. She's my roommate. Oh, oh, Timothy. Now look, I'm not promising anything, I growled. I'm no Boy Scout. Yes, you are, she said. Hurry, Timothy. I love that name, Timothy. It sounds so protective. Hurry. She sounded better. This time I did hang up, but of course it was too late. I shrugged and wondered what was wrong with me while I dialed the ocean brokerage number and asked for Mr. Forbes. His secretary sounded like a nice old lady. She said her boss would be able to see me at twelve noon. Noon? Yes, she said. Noon. I shrugged again and said I'd be there, silently wishing that I'd taken time this morning for some breakfast. Then I was off to Evelyn's if that was her first name. Jezebel envelope in my pocket and many doubts in my mind. It was ten o'clock. 321 West 44th Street's one of those apartment hotels just off 8th Avenue that are made to order for show people, actors, actresses, chorus girls, since they provide a central location in the city, the convenience of hotel service, the privacy of an apartment, and are not especially expensive. They are also made to order for trouble, though no one blames show people for that. 
It's a strange fact, though, that the New York police have found over the years that the city's most bizarre murders, orgiastic parties, and daring robberies have occurred in apartment hotels as against apartments, hotels, homes, or tenements. They are also made to order for girls who are in a special kind of show business. They say these girls never leave the premises, but always have the rent when it's due. That's what they say, but I don't know for sure. But the desk clerk did. He knew about it. That is, he had heard it on good authority. Probably even seen one once for all the good it did him. I asked him for the number of the barn's apartment, and for some reason, that was funny, because he giggled. Then he lifted an arm very gracefully and studied a tiny watch that was strapped to his dainty wrist. At this hour? He asked archly, and his thin lips drew back in a haughty smile. Just tell me the apartment, I said. That made his eyes close and brought a droop to the wide padded shoulders. He was resigned to the fact that I really wanted the number of the apartment. For C, he told me, utterly fatigued. Then he smiled again, prettily. I told him to keep his powder dry and got into the elevator, which was run by a man. Oops. He was wearing trousers and had a shirt and tie on, and his hair was cut like a man's. Those things fooled me. The look I got from him didn't. We got to the fourth floor without the cable slipping. I mentioned these things, the place, the clerk, the elevator operator, to help explain why it felt so good a moment later to see an honest-to-God woman, a clear-cut member of the opposite sex, open the door to apartment 4C. Clear-cut is a good description of Evelyn, as she stood there in the doorway, sunlight streaming in behind her, and a now-you-see-it-now-you-don't negligee made of some green cloud-like stuff. My long-legged huntress, the blonde who baited her traps with me, and I thought she looked just fine. She was cool this morning, the way she had been at first glance yesterday. But now, maybe it was the green thing. She was cool even at a second glance. I stepped into her den, dropped my hat on a chair, and spread out tentatively on one of those curved two-seater couches. We still hadn't spoken a word. Now she picked up my hat, sat down on the chair, and put my hat in her lap and raised her head as though she were going to speak. But then she held her head still and sat there watching me with a funny little smile on her face. Hello, Timothy, she said. I gazed across the room at her, puzzled. Hello, she said again. So, hello, I said warily. I guess I sounded sort of silly on the phone, she said. I looked at her. Not necessarily, I told her evenly. But I have an idea you're going to act silly now. What do you mean? I mean that I think you've decided not to tell me about this shakedown you're mixed in, or about the job I was supposed to be on last night. She avoided my gaze. I'm not mixed in anything, she said. I stood up then. I even smiled down at her. I'll take my hat, I said. Fifteen minutes ago you were in a jam. Now you're playing games again. Dangerous games. My hat. She sat there without moving, my hat in her lap and her eyes full on my face worriedly. No, she said. Yes. What do you think this is, a rehearsal for the senior play? How many corny routines are you going to try out on me anyway? I stood above her. I fell for your line yesterday. Apparently, I fell for it again this morning. Now, all I want is out. No more goddamn theatrics. You may have all the equipment, I growled at her, but your technique is childish. I'm a big boy. Give me my hat. She slipped to her feet, clutching the hat against her flat stomach. Don't go she said. Give me time to think. You're all out of time, I said, and reached for my hat. But she darted her arms behind her back the way a kid does. But she wasn't a kid. This was a woman. A well-grown woman. I reached around her, not playfully. She held her arms outstretched behind her and turned her face up into mine. I reached further, and that was when she stood on tiptoe, dropped the hat to the rug, and brought her arms up around my neck. They were slim arms and very warm through the sheer green material that covered them, and they were arms that were strong enough to hold a man. I am in trouble, she whispered into my ear. I am in trouble. There was nothing childish about the way she said that. I kissed her, and she held my head in both of her hands, and we rocked back and forth gently on the soles of our feet. That helps, she murmured. Then, oh, that... That helps. Oh, Timothy, where have you been? When I held her away from me and looked at her, her eyes were still closed and there was moisture beneath the lids. Tell me about it, I said. What kind of a jam are you in? 
She shook her head. It's terrible. It isn't fair to tell you. Fair? To you. You were right about last night. I used you as a decoy. I'm not married to Walter Huntington. I don't even know him. My name isn't even Evelyn. It's Sally. I had to laugh. It was a good act, I told her. His drinking, the brassiere in his pocket. I don't think I believed all of it, but I wanted to. She lowered her head. I know you did. I was hoping you wouldn't, so that I could tell you the truth right then and there. Who's behind this thing? Who sent you to my office? Her eyes avoided mine. Don't ask me about him, please. Who, Sally? She was biting her lip and shaking her head from side to side. Someone, she said lamely. A man. He says he knows about you. He told me to be careful. Tell me who he is. She turned from me and sat down on the couch. I'm... Well, I'm afraid he... Oh, I know it sounds silly, but I'm in a position where I more or less have to do as he says, at least for the time being. Why? Who is this guy? His name is Castell. Her voice as she spoke the name was subdued. Castell, I echoed softly. How in the name of God did you get mixed up with a louse like Rocky Castell? She smiled wryly. I guess you do know him, then. Her smooth shoulders hunched forward. I don't really know myself how I got mixed up with him, she said. Oh, I know how it happened, but it's all such a nightmare. Why did Castell send you to me? I asked her. What business has he got with the vice president of Oceanic Brokerage? She spread her hands in a helpless gesture. I don't know anything about it, Timothy. Walter Huntington seems to be important to him. All I was supposed to do is what I did, talk to you and send you to that bar. Like Jameson? I asked quietly. Sally covered her face. That's why I couldn't sleep last night, thinking about Jameson, thinking that the same thing was going to happen to you and wishing I were dead. Apparently, I told her, Jameson and I only had nuisance value to Castell. We were supposed to bother somebody as far as I can make out. It seemed to me that Castell had enough guys on his own payroll who know all there is to know about annoying people. I know what you mean, she said. I've met them. What's Castell got on you, Sally? Money? She stood up, turned her face into my shoulder, and buried it there. Her voice came to me half-muscled against the cloth of my jacket. If it were only money, she said. It's something worse, Timothy. Something shameful. It's pictures, I said then. Her head snapped back. How did you know that? With Rocky Castell, I said. It's two things. Money or pictures. I scowled at her. How did he ever get you to pose for things like that? She began to cry again, silently. But I, I didn't. I didn't pose for them. It was... I don't know how it happened. Want to tell me about it? I asked as softly as I could. She nodded and brushed at her eyes and took me by the hand to the couch. We sat down, close together. I came to New York, Sally began, from Montpelier. That's a city, not a city like New York. It's in Vermont. She took a breath. I won a contest. It was statewide. A talent search, they called it. I sang a song, and I won. You wouldn't have to sing, I told her. But I can sing, Sally said. Anyhow... We didn't display our talents in bathing suits, if that's what you mean. Go on with your story, I grinned. At least I had snapped her out of her tears. So I came to New York looking for a job. Did you register with an agency? She shook her head. No, I just began walking around from place to place asking if they needed a girl singer. And what did they tell you? They wanted to see my legs. One man asked me if I had to wear falsies. Did anybody ask you to sing? Now, she smiled. No, she said ruefully. You should have gone to an agency first. Let some little guy as tough as the bookers do your selling for you. You got the kind of treatment you ask for. I guess I did. But about the sixth place I tried was down in Greenwich Village. It looked very nice inside, all chrome and those glass bricks that light up. I was very impressed with it. It's called the Cabin Club, isn't it? Yes, but... And Rocky Castell was there when you went in to audition. Yes. And he hired you. Or he was there when you were hired, right? Sally nodded in surprise. All right, I told her. Then what happened? 
Well, I sang for a week. I was sort of a hit, in a mild way. Monday nights the club was closed. Then Costell invited me to a party. He said it was to be a private party at the club on Monday. He said it was sort of a celebration for my first week's success. And you told yourself that New York was easier to get by in than Montpellier, Vermont. Sally bit her lip. That's what I thought. I went to the private party in a brand new dress. I was all excited. Who wouldn't be? Who wouldn't? I agreed. What happened? Well, I hadn't had many drinks before that night. A few on Saturday nights up in Montpellier. But nothing in a big way, do you know? I nodded that I knew. But that night I couldn't refuse. How can you refuse to drink at your own party? You can't, providing it's really your party, I said. Yes, but that wasn't really my party. Not the way I expected it would be. How many drinks did you have? She shook her head. Not so many. Maybe five, maybe six. That's the point, Timothy. I really don't remember. You passed out. Yes, she said. But I wasn't sick. I just got very dizzy all of a sudden, and my body felt very warm. Then my eyes seemed to get heavy as lead. It was very embarrassing. I don't even remember being taken away from the table. How many people were there at the party? About ten. Six men and four girls, myself and three others. Did they pass out? I don't know. You see, I don't know very much about that evening at all. And when you did wake up, where were you? It was the afternoon of the next day, Tuesday, and I was here in the apartment in bed. My roommate had gone to work, but she left a note to call her. I called her, and she said she was waked at five in the morning by the desk clerk. A taxi driver was in the lobby, and I was in his cab unconscious. The driver had been told to drive me here by two men in the village. The men told the driver I had been drinking more than was good for me. My roommate, Jenny Barnes, and the clerk helped me up here, and Jeanie got me to bed. I lit two cigarettes and handed her one. Did you go back to work at the cabin club that night? I felt very sick all day, very restless. I couldn't seem to sit still in one place for more than a minute, but I went down to work. And you talked to Rocky. I tried to avoid him. I had no idea what had happened at the party. I felt ashamed of myself for passing out. But when my last number was finished, he came back and knocked at my dressing room door. He had some news for you, I suggested. Sally nodded her head slowly. He had news for me, she said. He said I was quite the life of the party. I asked him what he meant. I said I was sorry for acting like such a little girl. He said no, that I'd acted like quite a big girl. I didn't know what he was talking about. Then he took a picture out of his wallet. It was a shot of me singing at the microphone, the same one I'd just finished singing at out front, with one difference. Sally looked away from me, and I could see that the memory of the picture was making her choke up. With one difference, she said again, slowly. Oh, Timothy, I was naked, completely naked, and the way the picture was taken, it looked as though there were a lot of people watching me. But there weren't a lot. It was the same bunch that had been at the party. But there I was, at the mic, and smiling, kind of dopey-like, not the way I really smile. And there was a big spotlight on me. Sally dropped her head to my chest. And I didn't have any clothes on. It was horrible. I sighed and stroked the back of her neck the way you do with a kid or a beautiful little girl from Montpellier who's been taken by a vicious racket. You were doped, baby. Weren't your arms sore the next day, full of tiny holes, needle holes? Not my arms. The soles of my feet. How did they do it, Timothy? Well, I explained in a low voice. First they knocked you out with the drinks. Nothing violent. Nothing to get you sick. Then they let you sleep for a few hours. Or maybe they shot some digitales into your veins. That would revive you, I said. Or at least shock you awake. But from then on they kept you high on opium. High as the big blue skies. You were in dreamland, Sally. Your mind was. But you could still walk around and respond to orders. Then they told you it was time to sing for the crowd, and you sang. To you then, you never sang as well. And the fact that you didn't have a stitch on seemed perfectly normal. That was when the pictures were taken. The flashlights popped, but the chances are you never noticed them. Not that it would have made any difference, because all you wanted to do was sing for the people. The fact that there wasn't any music, though they might have played a record, didn't make any difference either. You just stood up and sang. Don't, Timothy. Don't tell me any more about it. 
I won't, baby. In fact, we'll both forget it ever happened. And pretty soon I'll get those pictures back and that'll be the end of it. You will? Her face was beaming with joy. You really will? Oh, Timothy? I'll get them, I told her. But first tell me what Castell wanted you to do about them. He said they were his insurance. Insurance? Yes, those pictures were guaranteed that if he ever had any special favors to ask, I'd be glad to oblige. Favors? Not that kind, Timothy. At least not then. He's been hinting about that lately, but not in connection with the pictures. He says he wants me to be his girl. If it ever came to that, I wouldn't care what he did with the pictures. What did he say he was going to do with the pictures if you didn't do what he asked you to? He said he'd send them to my folks and to the people I know in Montpelier. He said he'd attach a note about their little girl making good as a singing star in New York. It was horrible. Just thinking about it was unbearable. My mother and my father, they'd die of it, Timothy. A thing like that would kill them both. He's a nice boy, that Castell, I said half to myself. We met once. We'll meet again. That's how I came to see you with that story about Walter Huntington. A few weeks ago, it was a private detective named Jameson. You apparently know about that, too. Yes, I said. I know about that, too. But don't you worry about it any more. You were framed as much as he was. Or I was. But you have no idea what Castell wants from Huntington? She shook her head. Cross my heart, Timothy. She actually made a cross over her heart, and I smiled at her. Well, I said, getting up again. I'll be finding out some answers very soon. I'm on my way down to Oceanic right now. Sally laid a hand on my arm. Don't, she said. I got you into this terrible thing. Please, now that you know it's bad, get away from it. I looked at her. Bad? Hell, I think you steered me into my first job in weeks. It might even be a big one. That reminds me, here's your retainer, ma'am. Since it's Castell's money, I added, handing her the envelope. It's not only dirty, but probably unlucky. I don't know what to tell you to do with it except hop a train to Montpelier. She was standing next to me once more in that green transparent cloud. Is that what you want me to do? She asked, that mischievous look back in her eyes. It's what you ought to do, I told her. What I want you to do doesn't mean anything at all. It doesn't? It shouldn't. It shouldn't? This is silly, I said, and held her the way I'd held her after the hat trick a while before. I kissed her, and it was good. Better than good. I said I would be seeing her. Do you really have to leave? I nodded. Yes, yeah, sweetheart. Business is business. And besides, I added, looking at my watch, it's awfully early. I didn't know why I felt self-conscious about that precious little desk clerk. Sally just looked at me for a moment, and, and then she came across the room, picked up my hat, put it on my head, and kissed me again. There's your old hat she said. I left her apartment and ducked into the subway for Wall Street, thinking about many things. But for every nice idea I had about the wonderful blonde from Montpelier, I had a savage one about Rocky Castell, the guy with all the foul ideas. And apparently he had some ideas about Walter Huntington. There's an excuse for a kid fresh off the train from White River Junction, but the vice president of Oceanic Brokerage should know better than to involve him with someone like Castell. And if he knew better, then what was the game? How did the warehouse full of canceled policies figure? And the Harmony Bar? Hell's bells. Rocky Castell owned a small army of gunmen who could have looked the Harmony and the warehouse over from wall to wall. Why make shills out of Jameson and me? Then I had it. At least, that part of it. My playmate up in Bellevue. The big guy with the big ache in his head. The bull. The bull would know any of Castell's boys. They all went to the same dancing class together. The bull wouldn't know me, or there was a good chance he wouldn't. So whatever it was Castell had in mind, he was playing close to his chest. But maybe if I sniffed around it long enough, we'd get everybody out in the open. And then I could go to work on getting Sally's pictures back. They played, and on this I'd lay odds, a bigger part in this caper than just a lever to use the girl as a front to hire detectives. All out for Wall Street. Watch your wallet. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6. 
New York is a tight little village of nine million souls and twice that many contradictions. Wall Street, that quaint, torturous little path twisting like a berserk artery through this planet's financial heart, has more than its share of paradoxes. You can, for instance, throw a baseball from the steps of the bank in New York and be sure of hitting some penniless derelict on the South Street gutter. Or you can bump into a man coming out of the subway, as I just did, and he may look harassed because the company won't raise his salary to $60, even though they trust him with $3 million of their assets. And while a citizen in Harlem gets 30 days when they catch him peddling a 10-cent policy slip, on Wall Street the cop on the beat touches his cap to the lucky guy who just guessed the million-dollar number on the big tote board they call the stock exchange. And Wall Street is where you enter the lobby of a mammoth granite skyscraper, zoom 43 floors in an all-electric elevator, step into a leisurely, deep-carpeted reception room, and pass through many hands before you enter an office three times the size of your own. But this isn't the real one. This is only the secretary's hangout. The nice old lady who made the appointment for you. But now a large oak door swings open, and there he stands. The big boss, Mr. Franklin Alonzo Forbes, president and proprietor of Oceanic Brokerage. And what do you do in the presence of this tycoon? Search me. But one thing you don't do, no matter how strong the urge, you don't laugh at the timid, befuddled, gray-haired little man who stands shy and dwarfed in the middle of his office, waiting for you to make the first move. You wonder, as you go forward cautiously, if this is the third bookkeeper or the assistant stamp licker who wandered out of the mailroom. It can't be Franklin Forbes. I heard the big door shush behind me electrically, and I came to a stop a few feet from him. Mr. Forbes? I asked. He blinked his large round eyes at me and nodded politely. I'm Dane, sir. Timothy Dane. I'm Forbes, he said. Franklin Forbes. Yes, sir. I held my hand out toward him, and he leaned away. "'How do you do?' he said in a thin, quavering voice. "'I never shake hands. Easiest way to spread germs there is.' The voice trailed off, and he looked at me absently. "'What was your name?' "'Timothy Dane,' he nodded. "'I knew your father,' Mr. Forbes said. "'You favor him?' I cocked my head in surprise, and my puzzled eyes followed him as he turned and walked to the great desk at the other end of the room. Your father was a fine man, Mr. Uh, Dane, did you know my father in Chicago? Chicago? he asked, almost disappearing from view in a broad-backed chair. I don't think I've ever been in Chicago, he told me. You've got me confused with someone, Mr. Forbes. I doubt if you knew my father. He stuck pretty close to Chicago. Are you from there? I was born there, I said. My father died when I was very young. I've been in New York most of the time since then. Good for you, he said. This is the uh, city of opportunity, isn't it? Fortune to be made on every street corner, eh? He smiled. Though it seems hardly worth it, doesn't it? Terrible taxes, abominable situation, don't you agree? It was my turn to smile. Never really noticed taxes, sir. Don't notice them? He said with the nearest thing to life that his voice had held yet. Well, I must say, Mr. Dane, sir, like the dog... Great Dane. Can't stand dogs, Mr. Dane. Frightened to death of the vicious things. Man's worst enemy. Well, thanks for dropping by, young man. Give my best to your dear father. Mr. Forbes, I said in a different voice, I'm here about that business at the warehouse last night. I think Mr. Robinson mentioned it to you. He blinked at me again. Mr. Robinson. Warehouse? What warehouse? The Oceanic Warehouse on 21st Street, Mr. Forbes. Do we have a warehouse there? Whatever for? Aye. You keep your clients' old policies there, sir. Cancelled policies. Why do you want to buy cancelled policies, Mr. Uh, Dane? I don't want to buy them. Can't say as I blame you for that, he told me slyly. We were interrupted by his secretary's soft voice, but she wasn't in the room. Her voice seemed to come from all four walls at once, and I jumped. Mr. Dane is a private investigator said the voice. You hear about something suspicious that is supposed to have happened in our warehouse last evening. I read you Mr. Robinson's memo about it this morning. Mr. Forbes looked down at his desk. I don't remember it, Mary, he seemed to be saying to the blotter. I'll have Mr. Robinson come in, then, said Mary, and that was that. I looked around me and saw nothing on the wall but paintings of flowers and apples and pears. 
The ceiling was solidly plastered, and the rug ran wall to wall. Wherever the speaker was hidden, it was a good one, clear as a bell. Mr. Forbes had been watching me look for it, and now he held a bronze paperweight in his hand. Extending below it was a wire that continued on into the desk. My microphone, he explained. The speakers are in all those paintings, camouflaged. Very clever, I said, wondering why all the hocus-pocus. Walter's idea, said Mr. Forbes, and there was a great difference in the timbre of his voice as he spoke. He was proud, and then he looked at me sharply. Oh, he cried, now I remember about the warehouse, of course, but you should be seeing Walter about it. Walter is in charge of everything like that. The voice from the paintings again. Mr. Robinson, it said, and the door opened to admit the man I had worked with in Chicago. I stood up to face him, noticing that his thinning, colorless hair had grown no thicker, and that he was wearing steel-rimmed spectacles now. The glasses blended right into Jocko's thin, high-cheeked, expressionless face, as if he'd always owned them. He was like that with everything. A new suit, a new tie, even a new mustache. Once Jocko had them on, you would swear he'd been with them for years. He would always look the same. A short, wiry, quick-moving character who'd started on his first ulcer when he was eighteen, and been nursing it along for another eighteen I liked him very much in Chicago. Hello, Jocko, I said, amid outstretched. He strode toward me brusquely, touched his dry palm to mine for a brief second, and said, Hello, Dane, in that clipped, monotonous voice. However, he was no more effervescent with his boss, so I didn't take the brush off to heart. Besides, I knew from our conversation last night that Jocko had something on his mind, something that I had put my foot into. Dane called me last night, he said to Mr. Forbes, on business at once. He'd like to investigate privately some activity down at our warehouse. "'What does Walter say?' asked the boss. Jocko glanced at me swiftly, and I shook my head. "'Mr. Huntington doesn't know anything about Mr. Dane, not as yet.' "'That's very irregular, Jocko,' Mr. Forbes told him. "'You know that Walter should be informed of everything immediately. You know that, even before I'm informed. You know that.' Jocko had taken the ball, so I decided to see where he'd run with it. But Jocko was passing. "'Just as you say, Mr. Forbes, but perhaps Mr. Dane has something to tell you about the matter. I know very little about it myself.' "'I have no objection to talking to Mr. Huntington about the warehouse,' I said to them both. "'In fact, I don't see how it can be avoided.' "'Dane thinks his investigation may involve Mr. Huntington,' Jocko put in. "'I didn't say that.' "'Involve Walter,' Forbes seemed upset. "'In what way?' I have no idea, Mr. Forbes, I said. That's why I'm suggesting a look-see. All I know is that something peculiar is going on at that warehouse. Something peculiar in Walter's department? Mr. Forbes stood up from his desk, not timidly. That's ridiculous, young man. Investigate Walter. I won't hear of such a thing. He wagged a bony forefinger at me. Walter Huntington is as close to me as a son. My goodness, investigate Walter. Why, I brought Walter to Oceanic myself, took him straight from college, made him my trusted assistant. Walter has been like a son to me for almost twenty-five years. The old man was so wrought up that he even made so bold as to come out from the protection of that great fortress of a desk. He glared up at me like an outraged sparrow. I won't hear of such a thing, he piped. Okay, Mr. Forbes, I said, holding my hand in the air. Okay, I'll just poke around by myself on a speculation basis. If I come across any dirty wash, I'll hang it out, and maybe you'll want to buy. Or I can bring it down to the police and trade it in for a little goodwill. The steam went out of him. The police, Mr. Forbes murmured. My heavens, Jocko whirled on me. That'll be enough of that, Dane. You don't try any of that strong on extortion while I'm around. He sounded just like the old Jocko, but I didn't like it turned on me. What kind of extortion should I try while you're around, Jocko? I got all kinds outside in my carpet bag. Being a Weisenhammer is going to get you out of here on your backside, Dane. I laughed at him. You got the wrong script this time, Jocko. I'm the one who did all the throwing out in shy. That was there. This is here. Yes, Jocko, I explained slowly. This is here. This is New York, pal. My town. I moved toward him. Mr. Forbes was standing in the center of his office his head going back and forth like a man at a tennis match. Now, now, he said, w what is this all about? I'm sorry, Mr. Forbes, Jocko said. I just happened to resent Dane's tactics. 
whatever he thinks may be happening at our warehouse. I don't care to say whether he may be right or wrong, but whatever he thinks is the trouble, it certainly has nothing to do with the police. I should hope not, said the Oceanic President. But regarding what you mentioned, Mr. Dane, I certainly don't think it's fair that you should extend yourself on behalf of my company for the sake of, uh, what did you call it, speculation. He cleared his throat. Since you are a professional investigator, I doubt if you would be spending your very valuable time on an affair unless you thought it important. Am I right? Naturally, I said. He smiled good-naturedly. Therefore, Mr. Dane, Oceanic is quite anxious to retain your services in this matter. We will be your client on one condition. Yes? That Walter be spared the terrible humiliation, said Mr. Forbes. My goodness, I certainly don't want Walter to think that I distrust him after all these long and wonderful years. That would be a terrible thing, Mr. Dane. Well, I began, but he stopped me. That's the condition, sir, and you may take it or leave it. Heaven knows I try to spend my life away from every unpleasantness, but if you do not accept my offer, then I'm afraid I'll be forced to take steps to forbid you from investigating my warehouse or my associates. Do you understand me, young man? If Forbes, the original timid soul, was a contradiction of what the head of a huge firm was supposed to be, then he was also a contradiction of himself when it involved the fair-haired Walter Huntington. Damon and Pythias. I understand, sir, I said. I'll investigate without Mr. Huntington getting wind of it, if that's what you want. That's what I insist on, and when you finish, you'll find that my trust in Walter is well placed. Why, the old man smiled, Walter would give his life for Oceanic, and I dare say that's more than can be said for anyone else who works here, including myself, Mr. Dane, including myself. Your reports, said Jocko, will be confidential, Dane, confidential and verbal. No need to write anything down, is there, Mr. Forbes? Oh, my no. You'll report to me on everything, Mr. Dane. I took a good long look at Jocko, remembering rule number one at Pioneer. Three copies of every investigation. One for the client, one for the boss, and one for the file. As you say, Jocko. Then that'll be all, Jocko said. You can go now. There's one more formality, I said. The loot. Jocko turned to his employer. Our employer. Dane wants a retainer, Mr. Forbes, he said, and I thought it sounded unpleasant. Mary will give you a check, Mr. Dane, I reminded him again. He smiled at me slightly. I just wanted to hear you say it, young man. Great Dane, didn't you say? I try, Mr. Forbes. He walked to me and extended his hand. Goodbye, Mr. Dane. I'm sorry that I can't wish you any luck. I really do think you're wasting your valuable time. His old hand felt firm in my own. In a way, I told him, I hope you're right. Loyal assistants are hard to find. And harder to lose, he said confidently. I turned from both of them and headed for the door. It swung out toward me before I reached it, and when I walked into Mary's room, she smiled up at me and pressed a red button on her desk. The door closed. On her desk, she had an open checkbook, and she had already filled in my name. Will 1,000 serve as a retainer? she asked. I nodded. She finished writing and handed me the check. Her name was signed at the bottom. I thanked her. She lifted one of the earphones and said, What? I thanked her again. These things, Mary said, are certainly silly. But Walter thought of them, I reminded her, so they must be wonderful. Her face was noncommittal as I left the office. Down the hall from Mr. Forbes, I remembered passing an open door labeled Walter Huntington, and I walked back that way casually. It was only a swift glance, but enough to show me a medium-sized, distinguished-looking man, seated behind a desk. I had the flash impression of neatness and good grooming, and the voice that he dictated to his secretary in went smoothly and capably. He didn't raise his eyes as I passed, but kept them on the girl with the steno pad. All I saw of her was the back of her head, long black hair that hung to her shoulders in defiance of the fashion, a thin waist and long, slim legs. She gave the impression from the rear of being a beautiful girl and from the way she held Huntington's attention, I was sure of it. I moved on thoughtfully to the elevator, still wondering where this shill game was going to lead. At least I told myself I was moving in the right direction. The fifty I had returned to Evelyn Huntington had come back a thousand. That's progress, my boy, I said to myself, and decided to take a cab back to my office. End of chapter 6 
Chapter 7 The driver, a squat man with a day-old beard, coaxed his hack down Wall Street somehow and had to sneak onto Broadway even though we had the light. We started north toward Times Square. For five whole blocks, I counted them, we moved at the alarming speed of twenty miles per hour, but then we hit the City Hall snarl and had to thread perilously across the eastbound Brooklyn Bridge traffic. Canal Street and then Broom kept us in a nerve-edging second gear, but he found rolling room for another five blocks until the long jam started below 14th. From there to 44th, we really crawled, and I found out how to solve New York's traffic problem. Send everything on wheels via New Jersey and fly what's left. Or, damn it, let the city's traffic engineers pay my cab fares. A buck and a quarter to go less than three miles. I carried the thousand-dollar check into the bank in my building and watched the lady write it into my book. That brought my balance to $1,003.75, plus the 28 cents that jingled in my pocket. I moved over to another window and took 300 bucks back. I thanked everybody, went from the bank to the liquor store next door, decided on a full quart of Seagram's, and got on board the elevator. I had a new outlook on life, and as I turned the special lock on my door, I whistled my hometown as a one-horse town. I got a foot inside the doorway and kept on whistling, but I flatted the tune badly. I had a visitor. He was in my swivel, with his elbows on my desk and his broad, mean face cupped in the palms of his hands. His real sharp, bright green hat was set flat on his head, and the brim was turned up all around, just the way it came out of the Adams box. I looked at him and stopped whistling. He looked at me, and his tongue moved around inside his cheek as though it were digging things out of his teeth. Something to the left caught my eye. I had two visitors. He was not as wide through the shoulders as his friend at the desk, but his hair was just as overgrown on the sides, and it had started to curl black and oily over the collar of his covert cloth topcoat. The hat, tilted back on his head, was violet blue, the latest thing. He was a handsome Italian, except that he didn't look too clean and his mouth was too sardonic. He didn't look up at me, but concentrated on the long, tapering fingernails he was manicuring. Neither of the two spoke to me. Stay loose, the voice just above a whisper turned me around to the right. I had three visitors. The third was half the size of the others, but he had the wide-brimmed hat and white-gray, and he was a lot more active. He got up from the client's chair and moved toward me in a floating motion, a queer, languid smile on his chiseled face. It didn't fit at all with his quick, nervous-looking features. The first thing he did was lift the quart from under my arm and set it on the desk. Then his slender hands were busy on my body, touching, patting, feeling. Where is it? His voice sounded empty and deadly. The lazy, out-of-the-world sound of a snowbird. This little greaser was coked to the eyebrows. Where you think? He purred at me. I hocked it, I said, and that was true. My old forty-five was resting in an oiled rag in Uncle Sam Panansky's safe a block away on 8th Avenue. The one behind the desk laughed. The sound exploded unpleasantly in the small room. The lush racket our friend has he told everybody. He's got to hawk his heat. He sucked in air noisily through his mouth, and I took another look at him. Sure enough, his nose was flat against his face, a fighter's nose, with the bone removed, and that explained the extra wide shoulders. Now all I had to have explained was how they had opened the double lock, and what the hell did they want with me? From the looks of them, they belonged to Rocky Castell. I turned to the hophead. How's Castell? I asked. Stotelizitje. He drawled at me in that unique-sounding New York Italian. Shut it tight, you fink. He leered up into my face crazily. It's those needles, I told him. You only think you're ten feet tall. He swung, and it was funny because it came at me in slow motion. I picked the punch off half a foot from my face and pushed him gently to the floor with my right hand. Then it wasn't so funny. I thought that the guy coming at me from behind was right-handed, so I had my right shoulder raised and was turned toward the left. That put my head right under it. I heard the air swish, and then I was down on the floor, on my hands and knees. And my nose was only a few inches from the terrible, blazing eyes of the hophead. He relieved himself some by spitting at me crazily. Then with a weird, half-strangling sound, he scrambled to his feet and began to brush hysterically at his yellow camel's hair coat. That's the way it goes with these fastidious dressers on the west side. I shook the cobwebs out of my head, and with a watchful eye on the quick-moving pug who'd sapped me, I got back up. We gazed at each other, level-eyed, and from the slight sway of his head I knew he was balanced on the balls of his feet, ready for another left-handed try at my head. Hurt? he asked in an amiable growl. Why? 
He shrugged and closed his eyes. <laughs> I don't know. We come here to work you over, so I guess it don't matter none if it hurts or it don't. He sucked in air, and there was a thin whistling sound in his nostrils. Shut up, Wemo. The little ace snapped all the purr gone from him since his trip to the floor. He moved over till he was at my shoulder and then jammed what he thought was hard on my instep. A friend sent us, he told me. He got two things for you not to do. Number one, you punk, stay away from the broad. Understand, creep. He dug his heel into my instep again. Don't go near the blonde, understand? Number two, keep your nose away from... His doped mind struggled for a name. Walter Huntington, said the handsome one quietly from his seat against the wall. Shut up! The hoppy whirled on him, and Handsome smiled to himself and went back to his fingernails. Nobody talks, screamed the tiny one. Me, I talk. He jabbed at his chest with a thumb. Everybody else, stote le gich, understand? There was a thin stream of spittle spilling onto his chin as his reddish, sick eyes danced over my face. It was really wound up, this crazy one, and the more he screamed, the tighter he was getting. Now, so suddenly that I almost missed it, he flicked the wrist of his right arm, and when I glanced down, he was holding the long-bladed, evil-looking shiv in his delicate, pale fingers. Grinning, he placed the sharp steel point against my groin and leaned toward me. Oh, for Christ's sake, Vito, the pug said warily. What the hell? You think I'm scared, Wemo? The hophead's voice was soft once more, soft and serious. It was a spot. If I made a bad move, it would send him off again. But he was pressing the shiv, and if I didn't move... Go ahead, Weem, he said. Tell me I'm scared to open him. Go on, say it. You're not scared, kid, said Weemo without enthusiasm. But what the hell? You will be, said the one in the corner, when you lose that snow and rocky ears. The blade didn't press so tight. Yeah, Weemo said. Rocky only wants we should run this bastard down. He would have said cut him if he wanted we should. The hophead's eyes went flat and there was a click. Then the blade was out of sight in his sleeve again. I swung at him, and my shoulder was into it. It was a gamble, the idea being to chill the maniac and have him fall into the other one, knocking him off balance. It worked, but not for as long as I needed. The big guy tossed his unconscious friend to the carpet and moved in on me, his body weaving with the blackjack cocked in his large left fist. I fainted with my own right shoulder, and he ducked. My left hand caught him below the cheekbone, full the way it should. He poked the left into my face, but he was hurt. And a second later, he was hurt more when I buried the knuckles and wrist of my right hand into his solar plexus. But there's more to it than hurting somebody. If he'd only gone down, that would have given me a chance with Handsome. But he had to come up behind me, measuring me, I guess, for his own sapper. Either way, I was washed up in this brawl, but it was my tough luck that Handsome was an expert. None of this messy skull wrapping. No taking chances on killing somebody when you're hired for something else. All it took was one crack, hard on the collarbone close to the neck. The pain was classic, down my whole right side and up into my head at the same time. I was paralyzed with it, and my right leg crumpled under me. But not before the pug I'd slammed exploded a brand new pain with a right fist against the bridge of my nose. And there I lay, unable to move, completely conscious, and every nerve in my body begging for death. It hurt so bad I couldn't even stop biting through my lower lip long enough to scream. It's a fabulous thing that tendon in the collarbone. Hanson was speaking to me from a great distance. We'd stay and play with you, sweetheart, but we got to shove. Don't want the little man here to wake up and find you so easy to take. His quiet voice echoed all around me. I watched Big Wemo lift little Vito like a mail sack. What you got was just the trial offer, Hanson said. Stay away from that blonde queen or we'll be back with the real treatment. And stay out of Walter Huntington's life. I was going to be sick now, and I was gagging on the effort to hold it back. One thing more. I closed my eyes tight. Make it a point to stay out of Vito's way. He's a bad actor. I heard his foot scruff the rug and opened my eyes just in time to watch him lift his right shoe and drive the tip of its pointed sole into the side of my head. So long, soldier, I think is what he said. Then the three of them were gone, and I had the pain and the sickness all to myself. When I opened my eyes again... The sun was throwing long shadows across the rug. The shadow I noticed first was the one that made by the quartz still standing on the desk. Despite the terrific spike through the middle of my skull, the idea of going to work on that bottle seemed like a good one. So I crawled over my desk, climbed into my swivel, and got the wrapping off. 
I sat there till it got dark, nursing the whiskey and licking my wounds. It was only twenty-five hours since a girl had come into this office and called herself Evelyn Huntington. Since then, my life had taken on a certain zest, a richness, a je ne sais quoi. I longed for those times, the day before yesterday, when everything was quiet and there weren't so many people eager to meet me, physically. Like hell I did. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 New York gets dark and the lights come on, and that just seems to make it darker. But from my office window I can look beyond the explosion of neon on Broadway and my eyes are not harassed by more than 10,000 nervous little bulbs that fidget their way around the outside of the Times building, dealing out all the news that's fit to be forgotten. The light I see from my window is the soft glow that bathes the tower of the luxurious Winchester. This is my evening star, far, far away, farther than China. In my mind I can see into the tower suites. I can watch the fabulous Raj of Jonapur, life and death to 30 million souls in his Asiatic kingdom standing spindly and helpless in his drawers as a team of valets prance around to dress him. In another huge apartment, I imagine some ancient wrinkled billionaire being hand-fed as poached egg unsalted. Or maybe tonight it's farina with five soggy raisins in it. This billionaire can't buy false teeth that fit him, and his greatest pleasure is to sit in a soft chair by the window and gum these raisins for hours. He wouldn't even breathe faster if he could look into the less sumptuous but still fashionable tower suite directly below his own. There the girl with the world's shapeliest legs, roundest breasts, biggest salary, and most complicated private life is in town from Hollywood for two civilized weeks after the strain of her third technicolor epic this year. Now she's stretched luxuriously in a tub, directing a pale, bug-eyed young bellhop in the scrubbing of her perfect pink back. Two hours from now, the boy will close the door of her suite behind him dazed with a story none of the other bellhops will believe, and especially the bell captain. Later, though, he'll see her, besabled, come flouncing across the lobby on the arm of her next husband, en route to the stork club, where the party will include two former husbands and the agent who got there first six surprising years ago. At four tomorrow morning, he'll see her flouncing back across the lobby, and he'll be working the elevator, and she'll pinch his cheek and go down the hall to her room with the agent." And somewhere in my own building, a few floors below me, the $1,200 a week publicity director of that girl's studio is still at his desk and quietly bleeding his ulcer. Not about her. Hell, who'd print a bellhop's confessions and name names. What he's fretting about is their big western star, the six feet four of screen bashfulness who grosses the studio three million every time out because he always turns his profile away from the busty heroine when the saga ends and kisses the horse. Tex was due at ten this morning in Grand Central, but he crossed up the six guards assigned to meet him by getting off the 20th century at 125th Street. Now he was probably somewhere in the Harlem jungle, changing his luck, and the last time he had done that, the studio had paid $15,000 to some dark entrepreneur who had taken a home movie of Tex, and he wasn't in bed with a horse. That last time had been my first freelance job in New York. I'd gone up to the tenement just off Lenox at 140th forked over the 15 G's and taken the film and the pride of Texas out of there without the both of us being sliced in small pieces and floated back downtown on the North River. And I'll never forget the 16-year-old girl who had been Texas co-star during that wild night. She was octoroon, fairer than springtime, and her hair was a soft chestnut color with lights of natural auburn sparkling in it. Maybe she was the most beautiful thing in the world, and maybe I wanted to stay there or come back because she smiled at me. Tonight she was 3,000 miles from here, out in Beverly Hills, disguised as a governess for one of the producers at Texas Studio. He had seen the film. Crazy business. Crazy world. I screwed the top back on the bottle and stood up experimentally. Pain or no pain, it was 7 o'clock and time to get back down to the Harmony Bar and find out what I could have overlooked down there. Obviously I'd missed something in the warehouse that was important to quite a few people, and the list was growing by the hour. Rocky Castell was included to stay. That was for sure, and I didn't need my aching skull to remind me. I was halfway out the door and looked at the thief-proof lock I'd been conned into buying when the phone tinkled on my desk. Jocko Robinson said, "'How are you feeling, Timothy?' "'How was I feeling?' "'I'm not bragging,' I told him. "'What's up?' "'We've had an accident down here,' he said in a voice that was even more iced than usual. 
Walter Huntington just committed suicide. I looked at the receiver in my hand. He what? Half an hour ago, he jumped out the window, 43 floors, and then a sudden stop. They just swept him off the street. You're taking it well, Jocko. I'm trying to, he said. Mr. Forbes, of course, is pretty hard hit. He asked me to tell you about it. Then start telling. Well, Jocko began, and he didn't seem to know where to start in. Well, it went like this, Timothy. More or less, after you left here, Mr. Forbes got to brooding about what you'd said and what he'd just hired you to do. The more he thought about investigating Walter behind his back, the unhappier he got. His conscience bothered him, you might say. So he told him about it, I put in. Exactly. About an hour ago, he decided to call Walter in and get it off his chest. He said to him, Walter, I hired a private detective today. And then an amazing thing happened. The shock of Mr. Forbes' life. Walter went all to pieces. He confessed the whole thing. What whole thing? The whole thing about his embezzling, Timothy. For the past year, he's been stealing Oceanic's money. Were you there when he spilled it? What would I be doing there? It was personal between them. Mr. Forbes called me here at home and asked me to get in touch with you. He's quite upset, you might say. I think he's been near a complete collapse. How was Huntington stealing? Where does the warehouse come in? I have no idea, said Jocko. I don't think Mr. Forbes knows, either. All that Walter said, apparently, was that he was embezzling on his accounts. No details. So what happened? Mr. Forbes listened to him and couldn't believe his senses. He said that he must have had a fainting spell and that Walter carried him over to the couch in his office and revived him. When Mr. Forbes could speak again, he told Walter that what was done was done. He assured him that we all have our weak moments. It's quite a weak moment, I reminded. A year? Perhaps, said Jocko quickly. At any rate, that's how Mr. Forbes felt, Timothy, and it's his money. He forgave Walter, and Walter thanked him and promised to repay all that he had stolen. They shook hands. Jocko paused. They shook hands, and Walter went back to his own office. About six o'clock, Mr. Forbes left to go home. He passed Walter's door, but it was closed and the light was on inside. Mr. Forbes didn't go in. At half past six, Walter Huntington jumped from the window. That's the police report? That's the police report, he repeated. From several hundred witnesses walking down Wall Street to the subway, Huntington landed right in the midst of them. It's surprising that he didn't fall on anyone. Yes, I said. It always is when they jump. Tell me something, Jocko. Just what did Huntington do at Oceanic? He had a very important job. It was his responsibility to see that every policy secured for our clients was letter perfect. All the clauses, the special notations, the legalities. Why? Why not? Where does the warehouse come in? Did he also have charge of cancelling the policies? I think you can forget about the warehouse, Jocko said. I can what? That's why Mr. Forbes had me call you. He wants the whole matter hushed up immediately. In fact, I've given the police and the newspapers the been in bad health routine. I don't get it, Jocko. And if I do get it, I'm not sure I'm going to like it. Really? Well, those are the old man's orders. He wants you to keep the retainer, which I think is very fair, considering that you haven't done anything to earn it. Except bring something very fishy out into the open. Except to uncover a thief right in your own goddamn backyard. That's all, Jocko. Just as you say, Timothy. However, the orders are to stay away from the warehouse. That's what I've been told to tell you. What's your own feeling about it? I asked him. Jocko didn't answer right away. I'd say I had no feeling at all about it, he said finally. But I can understand yours. As far as Mr. Forbes is concerned, I think his principal concern right now is to avoid any possible scandal. His dearest friend is dead. A suicide. Forbes is an old man. Too old to make attachments that would mean as much as Walter Huntington meant. And after all, it's his company and his warehouse. There are no stockholders in Oceanic. The money that Huntington stole belonged to Forbes and nobody else. So long, Jocko. The investigation is off. So long, Jocko. Don't go buying yourself any trouble, Timothy. If I do, I said, it'll be all mine. No stockholders in Timothy Dane, either. Goodbye. I dropped the phone and hustled out of my office. On Broadway, I flagged a cab and gave the driver the Harmony Bar address. Last night, I'd had time to walk over there, but now time was running out and I was in a sweat. But so was the fire department. Lots of it. A cop flagged my driver to the curb as we turned off Lexington, a block from the Harmony. I got out on the sidewalk to see what was up. I counted ten pieces of fire equipment, 
all jammed around the bar and the warehouse behind it, with good reason. The whole building was ablaze. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 I had to get down to that fire. Not out of morbid curiosity, for there's no sight more sickening or sorrowing than the evil red tongues of flame defiling the black night, devouring and destroying with the passion of a maniac. But I had to get close to it, and I began shoving and elbowing my way through the fascinated, saucer-eyed onlookers toward the fire lines erected by the police. If you think it's tough to cross Fifth Avenue on St. Patrick's Day, then try getting through a fire line without credentials. But I was going to get inside, and was just bracing the first of the big-chested cops when I got lucky. Four feet away, directly, a squad of firemen hauling a great round hose already live and humping with the pressure of water was Bill Stevens in the white helmet of a fire department lieutenant. Bill! Bill! His head turned. Timothy! For Christ's sakes, boy, come back tomorrow. Can't you see I'm busy? Get me inside! I shouted in competition with the ominous crackle of the fire. The roar of the water from the hoses and the voices of the men engaged in the battle. Bill motioned me through with a wave of his arm, and the cop stood aside. "'What the hell do you want?' my friend yelled at me. "'When are you going into the building?' I trotted along with him until we came to stand at a spot on 3rd Avenue, less than 30 feet from the blazing entrance of the Harmony Bar. "'In there? We'll be on our way out in about two minutes,' he shouted. "'We're going to tear it down from the inside!' "'Can I go with you?' "'Are you drunk?' he cried. "'Or crazy! Keep your distance, Timothy. I've got work to do!' He ordered a direction change on the stream of water and waved a chemical spouter shaped like a mortar, brought closer to the blaze. "'It's business!' I yelled, holding him by the arm. "'I gotta get inside, Bill!' "'Then you're in the wrong business, boy! Now beat it! Can't you see I'm busy?' He hurried over to his battalion chief where he spoke a few words, listened to a few, and nodded his head. Then he began pulling a white one-piece asbestos suit over his rain jacket and boots and slipped an oxygen mask over his face. A half-dozen firemen, unordered, began climbing into identical rigs, and then all of them picked up wicked-looking hook axes, formed a single file behind their lieutenant, and followed him into the inferno. A powerful concentration of water and chemical poured over their heads into the building. Watching them, I was back at Ewo, except that Bill Stevens was where I had been that sunny afternoon. As soon as they had disappeared into the fire, its intensity seemed to increase. With a great roar, a sheet of flame burst through the roof and out the sides of the already buckling warehouse. From somewhere inside came another explosion, and then the night was turned into a flickering, frightening, unreal daylight. Smoke, tremendous, billowing black clouds of smoke, poured out behind the ugly flame, and from somewhere to the west came the hysterical wailing of more sirens as another company sped along treacherous streets to join the fight. Another squad, under another lieutenant, were climbing into those men from Mars as best as suits, and off they trotted to help or to find Bill Stevens' crew. The new trucks roared up, and in the confusion of their unloading, amidst the thousand orders going around, I grabbed an asbestos outfit, an oxygen mask, and an axe. In fifteen seconds, I was racing across the threshold of the Harmony Bar, and though I couldn't see a thing, I knew where I was going and how to get there. It was either the fire or the axes of Stevens men, but now there was no searching for the door that led into the warehouse. They had simplified it by taking down the entire wall. I stopped beyond where it had been and wiped the glasses of my mask. From inside, I could see the two demolition squads working quickly but efficiently at cutting down every loose beam, every partition, every possible piece of the structure that could be separated from the burning mass. And there it was as bright and as eerie as though you stood on the sun itself, surrounded by an unbelievable incandescent light. Only the floor, the concrete floor, was not a fire. In every other square inch of the huge barn-like warehouse there was terrible flame. I moved slowly toward the files and gazed stupidly at the twisted, still-glowing and white-hot mass of now meaningless metal that sagged grotesquely in every direction. I poked at the things with the tip of the axe, not hopefully, and rightfully so, for the parchment policies they had contained were gone. Gone, as far as my reading them again, or trying to make sense out of them, was concerned. Gone as clues as to why they had been guarded so carefully, and perhaps how a man had used them to embezzle and then kill himself less than two hours before they had been destroyed. I poked at another thing that had once been a sturdy metal file, and there was still nothing that looked like an insurance policy. 
not even to my inexperienced eyes anything that even looked like the ashes of one. But I knew one thing. It had taken a special fire, an especially hot fire, to do what this fire had done to that steel. Something jabbed frantically into my spine. I spun around to face a Martian, signaling to me in high excitement to follow him. I started to shake my head. I wanted to look at those melted files again. I say I started to shake my head. The eyes behind the other pair of goggles suddenly burned as hot as the fire about us with indignant recognition. Bill Stevens had spotted who the extra fireman was. Suddenly he ducked, drove his wide shoulder into my midsection, and as I jackknifed forward he lifted me onto the same shoulder. Then he whirled and out I went, my arms flailing but helpless against the famous fireman's carry. But being in that position across his back I actually saw what he had only sensed a moment before. Slowly, as though my eyes were a marvelous slow-motion camera, but fast, faster than anything has ever happened before, the street-side wall of the warehouse came tumbling in on us. But it wasn't a wall of wood, it was a solid mass of orange and white and blue fire. As it struck, a great ball of it flew away and struck me right against the goggles of my mask. Other chunks, hideous pieces of flames, hurtled all around us. But still I was being carried and moving in some direction away from the terror behind us. The pavement, this time the actual roadway of Third Avenue, rushed up to meet the back of my head. Then the mask was ripped over my head, and the most furious fire lieutenant in New York City was gasping for air and trying to bellow what he thought of me at the same time. You son! You son of a... You... You... You crazy degenerate! You miserable... Hey, Luke! Chief wants you in a hurry! Some fireman, some nameless, sweating, wonderful Joe, saved me from the unholy wrath of my pal Bill Stevens. Still gasping for air and begging heaven to send down some new words to express what he thought of me, Bill turned and hurried to his business. I raised myself to one elbow and watched his retreat with relief. The fireman stood over me. You crazy jerk! What's the matter? You a firebug or something? I smiled up at him from the street. I was chilly, I explained. Then I climbed to my feet, shed the asbestos rig, and walked over to the fire line where I belonged and was happy to remain. After the collapse of the wall, the firefighters went to work in earnest. Backed by powerful streams of water from what seemed to be a hundred hoses, plus the mortar-like chemical guns, they finally snuffed out the flame that had fallen across the floor of the warehouse, and now they swarmed into the open building. In fact, a large hook and ladder was backed up over the sidewalk into the place and began pulling the wall in toward the center of the demolished structure. Then, with a suddenness that left me blinking, the fire was out, and in its place was a hopeless mess of black, water-soaked wood. Even the clouds of smoke were diminishing. It was all over. Powerful motors roared into life all around me, and the equipment that had responded from stations outside this district began rolling back home to await the alarms that would send them out to new disasters. I thought that would be a good idea for Timothy Dane, too, but a little guy in a saggy blue serge suit, a crushed brown hat pushed to the back of his head, had words for me. He was a sharp-eyed individual, and the eyes moved around my face, photographically, before he quickly flashed a buzzer under my nose. The badge said that he was a fire marshal of the city of New York. Well, he said. Nice fire, I said. You liked it? Not especially, but somebody did. I can take my fires or leave them alone. Why didn't you leave this one alone, then? He asked, turning his hawk-like face sideways to spit expertly on the already soaking street. I left something in there. I told him. I looked up to see Bill Stevens coming toward us, holding his white helmet in one hand and wiping perspiration from his matted hair with the other. You left something? The marshal asked. Last night. You sure it wasn't tonight? It wasn't tonight, I said. I think it was, he said. I got here after you did, Marshal. I came by cab from the west side. Hack license, 4325. The driver is named Jack Katz. He wears glasses. It was a merciless smile that creased his weathered face. Got it all down pat, haven't you, mister? I looked over his head at Stevens, who stood there saying nothing and being worried. It's a habit, I answered. The point is, I didn't get here till after you did. That's what you say, mister. Now tell me why you stole various pieces of city equipment and entered a fire zone against orders of a city fire official. What else have you got to say before I take you in and book you? Nothing, Marshal. Except that I might be able to help you get the incendiary who started this thing if I were left outside the tombs. You know who started it, Timothy? Bill Stevens cried. The fire detective held up his hand. I'll handle this, Lieutenant, he said. Then to me. 
How come you so damn sure it was arson, mister? Aren't you? He shrugged his thin shoulders. I only know what I see, he said. And all I see is you. You look like a firebug if I ever laid eyes on one. Thanks, I said. But I know you're just saying that to be nice. Let's stop horsing around, Marshal. I was in there, you know. I saw those file boxes. Somebody soaked those things with gasoline and torched them. What file boxes? That warehouse stored files in metal boxes, I explained. Steel boxes. Whose files were they? Well, I said, you probably know that already, but just to show you how cooperative I am, I'll tell you that they belong to the Oceanic Brokerage Company. You work for Oceanic? I looked at him. Yes, I said. I work for Oceanic. I can check that, you know. I know, I said. I work for Oceanic. I'm a private investigator, and this job was confidential. Yeah, he said. It's always confidential. They catch you stiffs taking a leak in the middle of Park Avenue. You say it's confidential. He spat again. Beat it, he said. Get out of my sight. And if I catch you so much as leaning against a fire hydrant in the next twenty years, I'll run you in. Beat it. He turned on his heel and walked back to the ruins of the warehouse. Bill Stevens put a hand on my arm and started walking me in the opposite direction across Third Avenue. An elevated rumble by overhead. You maniac, Bill said. What's the matter with you, Timothy? You're going out of your head. I had to get inside, Bill. I really am on a job. That warehouse figured in it, but not the way it looks now. I was on my way down here to have a look at it when it was a warehouse, not a pile of junk and ashes. You think you know who did it? I shook my head. No, but I think I have as good a chance as you guys of finding out. You think Oceanic did it? I smiled at him. Why? To collect the insurance? Bill laughed. <laughs> yeah, that would be screwy. Who then? When I find out, if I find out, I'll let you know first. Okay, Timothy, Bill said, patting me on the back. But for Christ's sake, next time you're near the same fire I am, turn around and go home. I got enough on my mind without dragging you amateurs out of collapsing buildings. Yes, I said. And incidentally, thanks, Bill. You're not welcome, he said. Give me a buzz some night next week. I'm working days then. We can go out and hoist a few like old times. Well do, I told him. I owe you a drink. Yeah, he said, turning. And I owe you a kick in the pants. So long. Coincidence. I tell Jocko Robinson, an employee of Oceanic, that there is something peculiar going on at his company's warehouse. I tell him about it to be helpful. It has nothing to do with the job I'm on. My job concerns a girl and a crummy little bar and a man named Walter Huntington. Then lo and behold, who is Walter Huntington but another employee of Oceanic? Not an employee, but an officer. Coincidence. Walter Huntington dives through a window 43 stories above Wall Street. Jocko tells me that winds up my investigation. I am ordered to stay away from the warehouse. While he is talking to me, that very warehouse is beginning to smolder and burn. Coincidence. Here's another one. I hadn't until tonight seen Fire Lieutenant Bill Stevens in over six months. And now that I'd seen him, I was going to talk to someone else I hadn't heard from in six months. Another lieutenant who works for the city. Lieutenant Hal Harper, the professor. The homicide expert who runs the police lab at headquarters on Center Street coincidence. Why? asked Hal Harper on the phone. Should I be bothered about a corpse named Huntington? I'm still on homicide, Tim. Did you see Huntington? Never. Not in this life and probably not in the next. Look, you easy living lug, don't you think the citizens of this hamlet give me enough work? Enough sure enough homicides without my poking around suicides for it? Would you take a look at him? I asked. Hell no, why should I? Merry Christmas, Hal. What? I said Merry Christmas. Merry last Christmas. Now, Tim. It was Christmas Eve, I said. Snow was falling. The Christmas tree at City Hall was all lit up, and the mayor sent all the city employees home at three o'clock. All but Hal Harper. Hal Harper had a corpse on his hands. A nice, fresh corpse. A bullet through his head, and not a single identification. Aw, oh, Tim, for God's sake. Not a single identification. I went on, except a tattoo on his left arm. The homicide expert looked at the tattoo. Two symbols, it was. The expert said it was a fraternity symbol. The expert said, It could have been a fraternity. My fraternity, Sigma Chi, had two letters just like the ones on his arm. And the expert started to figure out how long it was going to take to identify the corpse just from the fact that the corpse 
went to college and had a fraternity sign on his left arm. It was Christmas Eve and everybody was on his way home. So the homicide man decides to buy himself a quick drink and then go back to work. Look, Tim. So who does he meet in the bar across from headquarters? He meets his old pal Timothy Dane, that's who. And where is Dane going? He's on his way to Larchmont to a great big party loaded with beautiful women and beautiful drinks. So he buys a drink for the homicide slave, the poor bastard, and the homicide slave tells him what he's stuck with. His words, and I can hear them now, were, Tim, you're breaking my heart. His words were, Tim, I'll be trying to identify that corpse next August. Why the hell couldn't he have gotten himself knocked off the day after Christmas instead of the day before? I can hear him now howl, and what does Dane do? Does he laugh in the guy's unhappy kisser and head to Larchmont and all those gorgeous dames? Like hell he does. He goes back to the morgue with his pal, and when he sees the symbol, he says, Fraternity hell, that's the guy's initials. This stiff is a Greek. Yeah, yeah, you're a genius, Tim. So they pick up a newspaper, and sure enough, the Greek ship George is in port. Down they go on Christmas Eve and bring back the skipper of the ship. The skipper takes one look and says, Christopher, that is my third mate, Zoladonidas Opilion. He has been murdered, the skipper tells us, and I know the rat who did it to him. And in 30 minutes, a patrol car is rolling into Center Street with the first mate of the George, and drunk as he is, he remembers knocking off poor Zoli. Case is closed. The homicide man goes home to his wife and kids for Christmas Eve, and Dane goes to Larchmont. When do you want me to look at this Huntington? Hal asked warily. Tonight, Hal, please. He's probably being embalmed right now, but if you could just look in on him. Just talk to the undertaker for a few minutes. That's all. Well, he said a little uncertainly. I guess somebody in the emergency squad will know who has the body. What am I supposed to ask the undertaker? How the hell do I know? You're the homicide expert. Oh, fine. All I've got to go on is one of your hunches that this Huntington is a homicide. Call him a coincidence for the time being, Hal. All I'm sure of is that the man is dead, and his being dead is quite a coincidence. Good luck. Yeah, Tim, same to you. And Hal, thanks. Sure, Tim. What the hell, huh, boy? End of chapter 9「ten. It was nine o'clock that night when I got home. I had gone home to try and do some thinking of my own, but my home, my room, is not the place for that. At ten o'clock the cacophony was going full blast on 52nd Street, and naturally the club of the world's loudest five-piece band, the High Hat, was the place nearest my window. From the den of it the floor show was on. Bang, 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 ta-ra, 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 baroom, baroom. The barooms meant that Tanya, the tassel teaser, was grinding it and bumping it in the center of the tiny blue-lighted floor. But nothing is what it seems in the hi-hat club. Not that little Tanya gave a damn how many square inches of her body were on display, but the police department cared or pretended to. The customers all thought they saw something naughty and would go back home to Zanesville and Litchfield and describe it to the unlucky stay-at-homes. But they didn't see anything at all. It was the blue lights and the bad liquor and the furious writhing of Tanya's hips and shoulders that made it look more entertaining than it was. Nothing is what it seems on 52nd Street, Voyager from one phony end of it to the other. So there I sat, worrying about other people's hangovers, smoking half a dozen cigarettes in the dark and in my shorts. I was waiting for some ideas to take form in my mind. There was material for a good idea, God knows. Huntington and Oceanic and Jocko and the fire. Plenty of food for thought, but the only thing my mind kept nibbling on was a character named Rocky Castell, New York's most lovable little bastard. And I thought about Rocky's organization, about Handsome, the slick one, and Wemo, the friendly one, and of course Vito, the crazy one who lived in a land where there was always the foggy, foggy dew. I heard Handsome's smooth voice again. Stay away from the blonde queen. Orders from the boss, Rocky the First, King of the Punks. Hands off, Sally. Costello himself had ideas about Sally, the golden girl. Taking pictures of her and selling them to the highest bidder, that was all right. That was business. Anything else was private. That was Rocky's pleasure, if and when, or rather, whether or not Sally had any ideas of her own about being Rocky's girl. It didn't matter. The important thing was that Rocky wanted her, and anybody who thought different got visitors. 
Sometimes it was the quick workover delivered with the message, as mine had been this afternoon. Sometimes, if the workover wasn't convincing, it was a no-return trip out to Coney Island. That was their favorite place to dump bodies, Coney Island. I don't know why. Maybe when guys like Rocky Costell were kids, Coney Island was the only place to go, and you didn't go more than once a year. My visit from the boys meant that Sally was being carefully watched. Rocky was protecting his prize. Everywhere she went, everything she did, everybody she saw or talked to or even glanced at, Rocky knew about it. He was after Sally. He wanted her. And he didn't want any interference from Timothy Dane. I thought about it. I listened again to Handsome's threat to stay away from her. Then I snubbed out my sixth cigarette, redressed in the dark, and went out to my room and down to 53rd Street. It was a warm, starlit night in Manhattan. A night to be in love, or fall in love. My feet were pointing west, and I started walking. If Castell's greasers were watching Sally's place tonight... I hoped that they didn't miss anything. The cute little redhead, the bombshell type, opened the door to the apartment and beamed up at me. Oh, she said before I said anything. Oh, come in. Wait, I mean, don't come in, she cried, grabbing at the front of a white wraparound that had suddenly fallen away from her body. I was hypnotized. I... You're Timothy. I... She was having a time getting that thing back where it belonged. Timothy Dane, you're a detective. I'm... Timothy. Sally was there in the doorway, smiling at me radiantly over her roommate's auburn head. Of all the nice surprises, she said, come in. Oh, yes, come in, said the redhead. Is it safe now? I smiled, thinking it was nice to be able to speak a whole sentence. That's up to you, the redhead warned me. In that case, I thought, looking at both of them, in you go, Dane. Well, Sally said, standing before me in a blue sweater that brought out new lights in her blue eyes and holding my hands in both of hers. I never expected to see you tonight. Expect the unexpected, I said, trying to connect this marvelous girl with all that had gone on in the last night and today, and now, tonight again. There was no connection, none at all. She made me feel like a beau dropping in for a parlor visit up there in Montpelier. She made me feel embarrassed because there wasn't a box of candy under my arm or six red roses. I looked at her, and I guess it was shining out of my eyes like a blinker signal. Somebody coughed politely. Oh, Sally said, laughing at me and herself. I'm sorry, Timothy. This is Jean Barnes. It's always nice to be formal, Jean said. This is the closest I've ever been to a detective. I like it. Yes, I said. Now it was Sally who coughed politely, and the little redhead grinned mischievously at both of us. You did come to see me, didn't you? Sally asked. That was the idea I started over here with, I told her. I came over to talk to you. Her face clouded. Oh, she said. I thought you might have come to see me just to see me. It was certainly a good idea, seeing her. I have something I want to talk to you about, too. You know what I'd like to do, Jean said suddenly. It's such a nice night. I think I'd like to take a walk for myself. Oh, no, Sally said. Timothy and I will go out. Well, what's the matter? Sally asked. I looked at Jean, not knowing how much to say. Does Jean know? I asked Sally. About a guy named Castell? The redhead answered. That horrible man. Yes, I know all about him. She laid a friendly hand on Sally's arm. What is it, Timothy? Sally asked. Nothing to lose sleep about, I said, not too truthfully. But I think Castell, or at least some of his friends, are hanging around your apartment. Oh, no. Around here? Just the thought of it was frightening to her. Why? I don't know, I lied. I guess he's just curious. You've got him guessing, Sally. Does it mean I can't go out? Jean asked me. Probably nothing will happen, Jean, but anything's possible as far as Castell is concerned. My thought is that you should both put off having anything to do with Castell as much as you can. This is terrible, Sally said. It's unbelievable. That's only part of it, Sally. Does Jean also know about a man named Walter Huntington? Sally shook her head. Huntington? Jean asked. I never heard of him. Sally's eyes searched mine. What happened? Maybe, I said not harshly. What Jean doesn't know won't haunt her. 
It was a suggestion, and Jean was quick to take it. Well, if I can't go outside, she said, at least I can get out of your way. She walked toward the bedroom. It's too bad, she added, that you have so many serious things to talk about. You look like you'd be fun. I am, I said, when I'm not working. When aren't you working? Jean asked. I've been working since I was ten. She pouted at me and closed the bedroom door behind her. It had been small talk between us, light and airy. Now I turned to the blonde. I didn't have any small talk for her, unfortunately. I decided to say it simply. Huntington is dead, Sally. Dead! It was wrenched from her throat. Now she sat down, lifelessly on the chair, and I went over and took a seat on the couch. When, Timothy? What happened? Earlier tonight, I said. He... He what? He died from a fall, apparently. A fall to the street from his office at Oceanic. What do you mean, from a fall? What kind of a fall? I frowned at the girl. You're asking the questions I'd like to be asking somebody. Tomorrow's papers will say that Huntington killed himself, Sally. They'll say he was in bad health. Wealthy broker in bad health. Was he? Well, if he wasn't, he certainly is now. The story about him killing himself may be true. If it is, then it simplifies everything for everybody. If Huntington jumped out that window of his own free will, then maybe it eliminates whatever business he had with our friend Castell. That means you can go on back home, Sally. No, it doesn't. Castell won't mail any pictures if there's no business in it. I still can't go back home, Timothy. Why not? She stood up and walked to the couch. What do I have to do? Write you a letter about it? I took her hand and eased her down beside me and then across my knees. If you do, I told her, then deliver it in person. I am. She pulled my head down to hers and we kissed. After a few moments, she said, And stop talking about my going home. All right, I said, but it's still a very good idea. This one's better. Yes, but for heaven's sakes, Timothy, stop talking to me. Do something else with your lips. Yes, ma'am, I said, and I did. It was very quiet in that room especially in the vicinity of the couch. Then a soft voice spoke. "'That's nice work since you were twelve, said the voice. It was Jean, and I looked up to see her in the doorway. "'It got so silent out here I thought something was wrong.' "'Nothing is wrong,' Sally said, making no move to sit upright. "'You're telling me,' then Jean said to me. "'I told you you looked like you were a lot of fun.' "'He is,' Sally said. It was their conversation, and I stayed out of it. Well, I guess I'll go back into the bedroom, then, Jean said. Sally slid to her feet effortlessly. No, she laughed. Don't be silly. I'm making tracks, I said. You're making something, Jean told me, and I don't think it's tracks. Jean. Oh, he's a detective, Sally. He doesn't shock like normal men. I think I'll be going, I announced, before the conversation gets over my head. You have to go? Jean asked. Say, wait a minute, that's what I'm supposed to ask him, Sally said. Well, ask him then. So long, I said. I really have to leave, no matter who asks. To Sally, I said, and be careful. If anything else happens, get in touch with me quick. I gave her my home address and the number. Goodbye, Timothy, Sally said. Don't be a stranger. No, Jean said. You mind your own business, Sally told her, but as the door closed behind me, they were both smiling. I walked through the lobby of the apartment, and the slender, dainty desk clerk eyed me knowingly. Good night, he said. It could have been, I told him. Then I went out into the beautiful, starlit night. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 I spotted three different characters loitering too casually in the shadows around Sally's apartment. One of them probably belonged to Castell, and the other two were some other kinds of lice. To make sure that the right one didn't make any mistakes when he turned in the full report to the head louse, I stopped under a light in front of Warner's building and lit a cigarette for a long time. Then I continued on across town, pushing through the crowds just leaving the South Pacific performance and heading for Sardi's, quickly crossed Broadway, a really heartbreaking sight when the neon is taken over, 
and on up 44th to 5th. Now there's a street. Summer, winter, night, or day, there's nothing like 5th Avenue. But it's especially good at 11.15 of a warm, leisurely evening. And that's what I had, leisure, as I strolled past the famous bank that's supposed to be unprotected against night thieves and is yet to be robbed, past the travel agencies with their posters of faraway places, past the Alexandra, a restaurant with the world's greatest bartender, Philip van der Kar, past the gleaming white office building that was a church a few months ago, and then, of course, the promenade at Rockefeller Center. I kept walking, though the soft music of the waterfall around the Prometheus statue, old safe at second himself, was a powerful lure to turn in there some night soon, when all this Huntington thing was a memory and I was strolling up fifth with Sally on my arm, and she wore a summer dress, and the worry was gone from her eyes. Any other night I would have kept straight on to the park for a couple of leisurely ones, outdoors on the sidewalk, at Longchamps or the St. Moritz. But tonight I came to 53rd, my block, and turned down toward the familiar and out-of-place modern art building, and if the front is out of place on that block, then the stuff they put on display inside is out of the world. A very strange outfit. But then maybe I don't understand them. All I know when I look at a nude, whether she's in oil, water, or flesh, I expect two breasts and the regular number of everything else. If some of the things they show in there are women, then the desk clerk at Sally's place is right about them, and the rest of us are myopic. That's T. Dane on art. I climb the three flights of stairs to my room, slowly not in time with the barooms that still accompanied Tanya and the hi-hat, put the key in the lock and opened the door. Besides the studio couch where I pretended to sleep, I own a small radio, a rug, a marvelous leather chair, and a lamp. The lamp stands over the leather chair. Next to the door is a wall switch, but that doesn't light the lamp. The lamp has its own switch, and to put it on you have to walk across the rug and lean over the chair. Hell, I've done it in the dark a thousand times and never had any trouble. But tonight... I had trouble. As I leaned across the chair, I tripped on somebody's big feet. The feet, as usual, were attached to a body, and the body apparently was sitting in my marvelous leather chair. From the body came a voice, a sleek voice, nearly familiar in my mind, but indelible. I turned on the light and looked down at Handsome. So you finally got back, lover, Handsome said. He was, as noted, sitting in my chair, and across his pinstriped lap was a shiny new-looking thirty-eight police special. I looked at the beautiful gun first, and then at Handsome. He was beautiful, too. Tanya would have thought so. For him, all the tassels would come off. To me, he was too greasy-looking and unwashed. Get out of that chair, I said. What? You heard me. Get up from my chair. Relax, Snooper. His hand dropped silently to the gun. Get out of that chair. There's nothing special about my voice, nothing that I know of, but I guess I sounded serious. Handsome stood up, the thirty-eight in his fingers, and walked over toward the window. Now, I said, what do you want? You're as crazy as Vito, he said. What do you got in that chair? A million bucks, gumshoe? What do you want? Get it off your chest and get lost. I thought we told you to stay away from the blonde. I laughed at him, and that made his fingers tighten angrily around the gun. What does Rocky give you guys, two-way radio? When you see him, Junior, tell him I had a good time tonight. You tell him, Handsome said. Rocky wants to see you. I'm busy. He'll have to phone for an appointment next year. He wants to see you. It's business, not about the blonde. Tell Rocky to put a finger in his eye. You tell him, Hawkeye. Come on. He waved the gun toward the door. Rocky wants to talk to you. And he sent you to get me? I laughed again. Not that Handsome put me in a good mood, but my laughing apparently bothered him. The gun shook in his hand. Yeah, he sent me. What's so funny? You are, you punk. Did you really think you're man enough to take me anywhere? You... I'll kill you. Maybe he meant it. Maybe he didn't. His voice sounded serious. Come on, he snarled. Get going. The gun waved me toward the door again. I moved in that direction, but instead of opening the door, I flicked on the wall switch. What's that? Turn it off. Turn it off yourself, I said, grinning at him. What's that switch for? All the sleekness was completely gone now. Handsome was confused. Things weren't going his way, and he was just another slow-thinking gunman. I've never met a smart one yet. 
It's a signal to my mob, I told him. You're cooked, Junior. You haven't got a chance of getting out of this joint alive. Turn that damn thing off! He had the gun pointed at my head, and excited as he was, it was fairly steady. There was about ten seconds to go, and I was set for what was going to happen. You turn it off, I told him again. Walk over here and turn it off. I'll kill- Here's the news! The voice came from behind him, loud and sudden, especially sudden. I was watching Handsome, and his face was so funny I almost lost my chance by laughing at it. But he whirled in to face the sound, and I was all over him in that instant. My open hand slammed down on his wrist, and the first thing that happened to him was that he lost his shiny new gun. Then he lost his breath as my left arm went wrist deep into his stomach. The third thing Handsome lost was his balance as I sent him back into the wall and down to the floor with a right. I stepped over his body and turned off the radio that had been put into action by the switch I had flipped. The gunman was at my feet struggling to get up. Then he changed his mind and decided to rest on his hands and knees. Stand up, Junior. I had something to settle with this one from earlier in the day. My neck and shoulders still ached from it. Stand up. No. Okay. I put my foot on his shoulder and shoved hard. It worked fine. He turned completely over, his nose and chin smacking into the wall. Stand up, I told him. Give me a break, buddy. I'll give you a break, all right. Stand up. He turned his face up to me and climbed slowly to his feet. I moved back about twelve inches. There's your gun, I said, pointing to the bright metal at our feet. I'll stand here and give you a chance to pick it up. The one who loses, loses. Like I said, Gunzels are all dumb. This fool bent over in what he thought was a quick move, but when he bent over, he put himself right in range. At the back of his neck directly below me, and my right hand came down sideways like a blade on the spot where it is joined to the body. Handsome had hit me there this afternoon with a blackjack. A little to the right of the spot I wanted on him. My spot was much better. That's the advantage of joining the Marine Corps when a war comes and learning such things in practice, instead of dodging the draft, as Handsome probably had, and reading about judo and books. But I wasn't so much interested at waving a flag at the bastard or pointing up a moral as I was in hurting him as I'd been hurt. If I'm a failure from here on in, I'll always remember tonight and be able to say I was a smash hit. Handsome kept going toward the rug, but he wasn't interested in the gun anymore. All he wanted to do was die. Anything but feel the way he did now. I turned him over with my foot and looked into the glazed, moisture-filled eyes which had been so mean and commanding just a few minutes ago. I smiled at him. I don't know, I said, how many guys you rabbit-punched in the last few years, but what just happened to you goes for all of them. Then I sat down in my nice leather chair, poured a straight one from the Seagram's bottle, and waited for my unhappy friend to get over the worst part. When he looked like he was ready, I picked up the gun, stuck it in my back pocket, and told him to get up. I was only kidding before, I said. I'd like to talk to your boss, too. On your feet, Junior, it's getting late. He got up and tried to shake the dizziness from his head. I'll kill you, you son of a... Sure you will. You and your little pal Vito. Now let's go see Rocky. Handsome followed me meekly out the door, and we grabbed a cab for the cabin in Greenwich Village. End of chapter 11《Chapter 12》You can say as many nice things about Rocky Castell's Cabin Club as you can say about Poison Ivy and Canker Sores. You can say as many unpleasant things as the Vice Squad will let you read from their dossier, an amazing record that takes in all the nine years since Castell opened its foul doors to the public. Three different men on different occasions have been shot to death at its bar, and the men who held the guns are still at large and presumably unknown to the police. The place is a notorious snowdrop, everything from the rather innocent marijuana to the tragic opium and cocaine. It has been fined and shuttered, as its political influence has waned, for indecent performances, contributing to delinquency, violating the state's alcoholic laws, and then reopened again as the right boys got back in the public office to continue as the furtive lair where all the scum of the city gather to speak in whispers of past immorality and plan new outrages for the future. It's inevitable that the innocent and the young sometimes stumble into this filthy trap, lured by the bright chrome, the soft leather, the sleek lighting, and, sleekest of all, the thin-waisted, hatchet-faced, evil-eyed characters who appear silently from every dark corner of the single room and seem to infest the place. One of these punks, handsome, guided me now around the outer edge of the room, 
past the red leather bar, the black bakelite tables, past the tiny bandstand and the microphone where one of the innocents, Sally, had sung her songs and where, at this moment, a statuesque, high-bosomed, black-haired girl was singing to a half-attentive audience. The singer's dark round eyes shifted to us briefly as we glided by, but darted away again as Handsome glanced back at her. He slowed for a moment, and I wondered if the look on his face meant that she had already been photographed and if that was what the gunman was remembering. We walked on and seemed to be heading into a leather-covered wall, but it was a door, and he pushed it open easily to let us through. We were now in a sort of foyer in whose center was a black door lettered discreetly in gold with the word private. Handsome stopped suddenly and wheeled around. We're here, he said. Give me back the gun. I smiled at him and slid the shiny thing from my pocket and handed it to him, barrel forward. But how are you going to explain what the side of your face looks like, sweetheart? Your lip is up like a balloon. He said something obscene. The cops are right, I sighed. All you guys will ever understand is a good kick in the teeth. What do you want me to do, take the gun away from you again? He had started to replace the gun under his armpit, but now he didn't know what to do with it. Finally, he put it out of sight and patted his shoulder reassuringly. I laughed in his face. That's the first smart thing I've seen you do, I told him. Now open the door and let's go see the guy who owns you. His eyes were hot with rage as he rapped on the door and waited. It was opened a trifle, and the sharp-pointed features of little Vito peered out at us. Then the door swung back for an instant, and we slipped inside. The office followed the color scheme of the club. The walls were covered with squares of red leather, and the furniture was black and chrome. At the far end of the room was a curved black desk whose bright finish caught the subdued reflection from the indirect lights hidden in a recess that ran around the walls near the ceiling. In front of my side of the desk was a large chair and on the other side, watching me narrowly out of hooded gray eyes, was the one who called himself Rocky Castell. He looked trim and sleek and unsafe. I knew he wasn't a tall man, but sitting there he appeared to be. The deception came from the way he held his head thrown back, and now as he followed my movements the head was still and erect. It wasn't a bad-looking head, well-formed, with olive-complexioned features that were in good proportion. A face that would leave an impression— and the impression was made stronger by the careful trimming steel gray sideburns that hung below the jet black wavy hair. Castell was in his middle forties. No need to sit down, Seamus, he said to me abruptly. This isn't going to take very long. I'm a busy man, Dane. I sent for you to talk business. I want to buy something. I want to buy it quick. I. The long string of eyes stopped abruptly. He was looking beyond me toward Handsome. Mario, he said ominously. What the hell happened to you? Nothing, Mr. Castell. The voice was surly. Nothing. The sharp eyes flicked in my face. What happened? He asked me. I hit him, I explained. The eyes widened for a moment. Just like that. You hit him. You're a pretty fresh boy, aren't you? I shrugged my shoulders and reached for a cigarette. When it was between my lips, I couldn't find any matches. I picked up the lighter on the gangster's desk. It was in the shape of an ebony nude, and the flame appeared from an unexpected place. Typical bric-a-brac. I replaced it on his desk carefully. Castell had watched every move I had made. Now there was a nerve twitching in his cheek. You bother me, he said. I'm not sure it's worth it. It ain't, Mario said flatly. If I need advice from you, Castell told him, I'd be in tough shape. Just shut up. Now you, let's get this over with. Show me what you got to sell. I don't know what you're talking about, Castell, I said. The lids covered his eyes completely and opened again slowly. He turned his sun-browned hands palm upwards and gazed at them as he spoke. You were told to butt out of this thing a couple of days ago. The word was to lay off a man named Walter Huntington. And a girl, right? He didn't look up from his hands. That's right. Did you lay off? No. Now his eyes were on me. No, but we won't talk about the girl. Not now. You'll just tell me all about Walter Huntington. Why? I asked. His voice was unemotional. Because, God damn it, I tell you to. You stuck your nose in my business, and you got in my way. I was shaking my head at him. I didn't stick my nose into anything. I was invited in. By the girl. She came up to my office because you told her to. She gave me fifty dollars of your money. 
and then you were told to get out. But every time I turned around, I started bumping into you. What happened to Walter Huntington tonight? He asked suddenly. He died, I said. Why? The papers will say he was sick. Eat it, he snarled. Sick! All right, Dane, I think you know something. I'll buy what you know. I don't know anything, I told him. Don't stretch your luck, it's so thin now I can see through it. What is that supposed to mean? I asked him. It means that Vito or Mario are itching to work you over. Don't give me any reason to let them. Lousy Seamus, Vito said. He walked, or rather swayed, toward Castell's desk. Let me take him, he said plaintively. For one hour, Mr. Castell. Castell's eyes moved from Vito to me and back again. Go on upstairs and lie down for a while, he told the hophead. I'm all right, Mr. Castell. Beat it. Go upstairs. I'm all right. Vito, Castell said, and that was all. The little one turned slowly, looked at me with a sad expression, and sauntered from the room. The door closed softly. You see what I mean now, Castell said. Nobody likes you, Dane. You'd better smarten up. I am, I said. By the minute. Why don't you stop trying to impress me and get to the point? I warned you not to stretch your luck, Dane. Vito's gone, but Mario's right behind you. He'd sooner knock you off than look at you. With what? I laughed. Air? I turned to look at Handsome's raw, swollen face. I held up my hand toward Castell and showed him the six slugs for Mario's empty gun. I dumped them on the desk next to the strange lighter. If you think you have something to talk to me about, I said, let's get to it. Castell dragged his eyes away from the slugs and stared at Mario. Remind me, he told him, that I want to talk to you later. There was a sharp intake of air from Mario, but nothing else. Why did Huntington jump out that window? Castell asked me. I don't know. You're a liar. What happened when you went down to that little joint last night? I had a beer and came home again. Nothing happened. You're twice a liar. Why? I asked him. Did you send the girl to see me? What did you think was going to happen down there when I went? I'll do the asking, Dane. Who set fire to the place? If you know about it, I said, then you know as much as I do. He slammed on his desk. Talk, Dane, and stop cracking so goddamn wise. I'm not used to it. It gets on my nerves. Who burned that dump? You did, I said. What? How the hell do I know who set the fire? How the hell do you know there even was a fire? I reached over and jammed my butt into an ashtray and then sat down in the chair facing his desk. I hope I looked sore. You got me into this rat race, I told him. Why? What's it all about, Castell? Why'd you send Sally to my office? I said I'd do the asking. Why did you send her to me? I repeated. Let's get that angle straightened out first. He was watching me quizzically, an odd expression in his eyes. You and I, he said, better not talk about the girl. You know what I mean? If it makes you nervous, I answered, let's put it another way. How did you come to pick my name out of the hat to be your shill? You didn't come out of a hat, Castell said. It was the one before you that I lifted blindfolded. Jameson, I told him. His eyebrows went up. You're quite a snooper, he said. Ever think about leaving that penny ante racket you're in? And do what? Work for you, Castell? Don't make me laugh. Why are you so tough to get along with? He asked quietly. It wouldn't have helped anything to tell him. You found a name in the Red Book, I said instead. Jameson. You had the girl send him down to the Harmony. Then he ran into trouble and you picked me for the job. Why? The gangster shook his head. I didn't send Jameson to the bar. That came later. I just wanted Jameson to think he had to tail this other guy, this Huntington, around town. Jameson did. Why? That's my business, friend. My personal business. Shakedown? That's a nasty word, Castell said. I don't like the sound of it at all. Since when? Castell sighed loudly. It really beats me, he said. Why aren't you wrapped in a bag somewhere, Dane? I smiled again. And dropped out in Coney Island? Handsome had come to his feet at my words, and now he stood there waiting, watching Castell. Why Coney Island? 
Castell asked without emotion in his voice. Why not? He laughed an unhumorous sound. That's right. Why not? Now, where were we? You were telling me about the shakedown, I said. Bang went the hands on the desk. God damn it, Dane, I... He stopped and closed his eyes with an effort and then reopened them and looked at me. Ah, skip it, boy, he said. I've never laid eyes on anybody like you, and I've seen a lot of different types. That makes us even, I said. Now let's get back to Huntington and Jameson and the job he was on. The job I inherited. Fine, Castell said. Well, the way it turned out, Jameson would pick up Huntington about five o'clock when he left his office. The Oceanic, he nodded. That's something else you weren't supposed to know about. Why not? Jameson knew Huntington worked there. Why not me? Because you and Jameson are two different characters. You both carry licenses to do your snooping, but one of you is, how do you say it, a harmless little guy. Good for shadowing people, see, you're not even very good at that. The other character, he went on, gazing at me steadily, I'd had reports on from a friend of mine uptown. The other snooper wasn't supposed to be told anything that would get him in trouble. Your friend uptown sells pictures, doesn't he? I asked. A fat oily, ugly bastard who owns a camera and sells pictures. When you say uptown, you mean Harlem, don't you? I wish he were here for that description, Dane. Castell laughed. He'd love that. Yeah, he added. This guy sells an occasional picture. He sold a couple of very good reels to you. At least you were the strong-arm boy that came to pick them up. It was the caper when I'd taken Tex away from that little octoroon. But I didn't know I'd impressed anybody. Okay, I said. Now I know how I came into it, but back to Jameson. Who the hell came to see who? Castell demanded. Try to get it through your head, Seamus, that you're here to give me information. That's the only reason you're still able to talk. Sure, I said. Now, back to Jameson. He picked up Huntington in front of the Oceanic. Then where'd they go? I had to wait until he stopped shaking his head and emoting behind the desk. When he spoke again, his voice was thin and irritated. Some nights they went to Grand Central. Huntington got on a train and went home. Home where? Castell smiled. You don't know? You mean there's something you don't actually know about my business? It'll take five minutes to find out. One phone call. Make it three minutes. He lives in a town called Westport. That's up the line somewhere in Connecticut. Some nights he went to Westport. How about the other nights? Most nights he went to Westport, Castell corrected. Then one night he went to that little dive, the, what's its name, Harmony. Huntington went into the Harmony? What did Jameson do? I asked. Well, Castell said, that part's a little vague. You see, Seamus, I never talked to the guy like I'm talking to you. Every night after he'd tell Huntington, he'd send a report over to the girl, and she'd bring it down here when she came to work. Sally, I interrupted, was working here, singing during that time. Castell scowled. Sure, she was working up here until yesterday when I sent her to see you. You know, he said, it looks like as soon as I made the mistake of getting you, everything went screwy on this job. Next time you'll know better, I advised him. So what happened when Huntington went into the Harmony? Jameson, said Castell, apparently hung around outside for a while. What do you mean, apparently? Relax, boy, you'll see what I mean. He apparently hung around outside waiting for Huntington to have his couple of drinks and continue on uptown to Grand Central. But Huntington didn't come out of the joint. Apparently, Castell said. And so this bright bird dog I hire barges right into the place and asks the barkeep where's the guy who came in ten minutes ago. That, and I got all of this secondhand and vague, is one of the last things this Jameson sucker remembers. The next time he opens his eyes, he's in St. Vincent's Hospital in very tough shape. He looks like a truck hit him, right smack in the guts. The hospital report says he was picked up by two cops sprawled in the grass along the East River Drive. In fact, their report even now says it looks like a hit-and-run case. How do you know what the report says? I asked. Well, Castell answered, a day goes by, and there's no word from Jameson. I have the girl call his office, and there's no answer. Then the guy's wife calls the girl, and she sounds all broken up, so I hear... And what I just told you is what the wife told the girl, and the girl told me. So you immediately set me up for another hit-and-run operation, I said. 
Castell smiled maliciously. Not immediately. First, he said, I send Mario here down to this little dump to, how do you call it, the Harmony. Tell the Seamus what happened, Mario. Handsome's voice was flat and expressionless. I walked into the joint. I bought a drink. What a dump. Nobody's there but me and the bartender. Then I look up and I see an old friend of mine standing down the other end of the bar. Where the hell he comes from beats me. Your friend, I said, is a big guy named Bull. Bull Hinman, yeah. He's a very big guy. I seen him one night in a whorehouse. He took a guy's arm. Tell what happened in the bar, snapped Castell. Leave your love life out of it. Yes, sir, Mario answered quickly. So the bull spots me like I spot him, and we cut up a few touches about the old times. I ask him what's his racket, and he dummies up tight. He tells me he ain't doing a thing, but I know different. He looks too good to be on the bum, so I tell him I'll see him and I duck out. He thought, I said, that you just happened to drop in for a drink, is that it? You didn't talk to him about Jameson or Huntington? Castell answered. Mario didn't say anything to him about anything. He told me what had happened, and I knew it wouldn't be smart to have any of my boys try to smell it out. That's when I thought about you, Dane. Sally just told me to go down to the Harmony and look it over. That was the general idea, along with the cock and bull story. What did you figure that would do? Not, said Castell, as much as it did. I was just trying to find out if you'd get worked over if you mentioned Huntington's name in the place. And I wanted to get your ideas on why a guy with a job like Huntington's would go into a dump like that. I paid fifty bucks to find out. So far, Dane, I haven't had anything for my fifty bucks but a lot of annoyance. His gray eyes were hooded as he studied me. Yes, I said, not listening too hard as my mind tried to make some sense out of it. From what he'd said, Castell knew nothing about the warehouse behind the Harmony Bar. So now I want my fifty bucks worth, he said. Give. He didn't even know about his fifty bucks. Not yet. I smiled at him. You got what you paid for, I said. I got nothing. And that's what you paid for. I was sent down to look at the Harmony. I looked at it. Do you want me to describe it, Castell? Is that what you want for your fifty dollars? I want information. What's this bull do down there? Why did Huntington go there? Why did he jump out the window? The longer his list got, the wider I smiled. <laughs> that's a lot for fifty bucks, I told him. How much would it cost me? I ignored the question. What was the story between you and Huntington? I asked instead. Who was buying what? What's it to you? He was getting sore again. Not a goddamn thing, I lied, and stood up from the chair. I'll be leaving now, I added, and turned toward the gleaming black door. Hansom moved in the same direction, a step ahead of me. That's okay, Junior, I told him pleasantly. I know my way out. Castell's voice cracked like a whip at the back of my head. Sit down, Seamus. Where the hell do you think you're going? I looked over my shoulder at him. He was on his feet and the nerve in his cheek was pumping furiously. I'm going home, I said. Betty, bye. Good night and thanks for nothing. I was at the door, eye to eye with Handsome, whose back was braced against it desperately. Out of my way, Junior, I warned. He crouched, waiting for me to make the next move. Whatever was going to happen, Castell's voice postponed it. Don't do it the hard way, Dane, he said in a different tone. Come on back and sit down. Mario, make us a drink, and I'll tell you a little story about that guy Huntington. That was what I'd come to hear, and the drink sounded like a fine idea. I took the invitation. Can he really make a drink? I asked with a nod toward Handsome. Does he really remember to put in the ice and the water and the whiskey? I sat down again in the chair and stretched my legs. Don't get on his nerves any more than you already have, Castell said. He pressed a button somewhere on the desk, and a part of the red leather wall began to slowly turn in toward the room. When it had made a full pivot, I was looking at a bright chrome bar loaded with all sorts of goodies. What'll it be? Castell asked expansively. I ordered rye and water and watched Handsome fumble a couple of ice cubes onto the rug. But I didn't laugh. After I was gone, he'd still have to explain to his boss why the bullets for his gun were in my pocket, and I guess my heart went out to him. The punk. When the whiskey was cascading silently down my throat, I spoke to Castell. What went on between you and Huntington? Well, Castell began, it's a funny story. I mean, it had a lot of angles and a lot of puzzles. 
It began about six, seven months back when I got a phone call up in my apartment at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now right there is a puzzle. Lots of guys put in private phones, but they have so many friends they start giving out the number right and left. First thing you know, it's as private as Gloria Dawn's or Penn Station. But not me. I got a private line that's so private, hell, the telephone company had forgotten the number. Yet the damn thing rings at three o'clock, and when I pick it up, a dame is purring in my ear. Mr. Castell, she says, can you be at the Eastern Hotel, Suite 1341, 830 tonight? What the hell? Sure I can, I said. But it would sure surprise me if I were. What's the matter, sister? You crazy or something? She told me no, she wasn't crazy. If I went to the Eastern tonight, I'd find a man waiting for me. I can imagine, I told her. I can just see him there waiting for me. Only, I won't see him at all because he'll be sitting there in the dark. All I'll see is the flash from the rod he's pumping. I don't know who dreamed this up, honey, I told her, but you and your friends will have to do better. Imagine a guy like me, Dane, walking up to a flea bag like the Eastern Hotel and walking into Suite 1314. I can't imagine it, I said, and held my empty glass toward Handsome. Castell nodded, and the gunzel took it away, refilled it without spilling any ice, and handed it back. Thanks, I said. Handsome's answer was obscene and a physical impossibility anyway. I turned back to Castell. The dame on the phone said I had her all wrong. This man was going to meet me and discuss money. Fine, I said. Whose money? His or mine? His, she said. That's money that will be paid to you. Fine, I said. Why? There's something he wants you to do, she said. I figured there was a catch in it, lady, I told her, and started to hang up. It's a great deal of money, I heard her say considering what you have to do to earn it. That I've heard before, I said to her, but she had me a little curious, especially since she had called on this very private telephone of mine. What, I asked her, does your friend consider a great deal of money? About sixty thousand dollars, she said, just like that. About sixty thousand dollars. And what do I have to do? Can't I just send over there to pick it up? That was a joke, see, Costell explained it to me. But she takes it straight. Oh, no, she says. You'll have to come to the hotel in person. It's very confidential. It will all be explained when you get there. Not to me it won't, sister, I said. You tell your pals they'll have to come up with a better idea than this one. You're talking to Rocky Castell, I told her. I got experts trying to finger me 24 hours a day. I don't fall for any gag as simple as this one. Well, that made her quiet for a few seconds. All right, she said. Here's what to do. I'll hang up and you call the Oceanic Brokerage Company. On the level, that's what she said, Seamus. You call the Oceanic Brokerage Company, she said, and ask for Mr. Walter Huntington. When Mr. Huntington answers, you ask him if he'll be in Suite 1341 of the Eastern Hotel at 8.30 tonight. Naturally, she said, all of this is very confidential. Naturally, I said, and she hung up. In ten minutes, I called the Oceanic and asked for Huntington. A guy comes on sounding all business, and when I ask him the question, he says, yes, he'll be there. Will I? I tell him, maybe. I got to think about it. He says it's a nice piece of money involved and very little to do to earn it. I said I'd think about it and hung up. Castell moistened his throat with a long pull from his glass. So, he continued, I thought about it and even called back at Oceanic. The same guy answered when I asked for Walter Huntington. Then I checked the name a couple of other ways. It seemed to check out. Did you keep the date at the hotel? Costello smiled and nodded. <laughs> what the hell? Sixty G's. And the way it was set up, I sure wouldn't be declaring any taxes on it. That thought started him chuckling. And <laughs> that, he said, is how I got to be interested in Walter Huntington. Wait, I said, holding up my hand. Aren't you leaving something out? Like what? Costello said, not smiling any more. Like why you hire private detectives to tail him around six months after you do business with him, I said. And like what you did for him that was worth $60,000. Costell scowled. In the first place, I didn't get 60000 I got 30000 In the second place, pal, I'm through spilling my business to some two-bit snooper. Now you start talking. 30000 I repeated. And just a few minutes ago, you were screaming about $50. Mario. Costell said. Am I going crazy or what? Have you ever seen anybody like this guy? 
I'll kill him, Mr. Castell. The boss laughed a short, choppy-sounding noise. I looked over at Handsome, and we stared at each other for a long, quiet moment. I told him, Before you figure out how you're going to do it, how about mixing me another drink? Handsome mouthed something foul again. Something about what he would mix for me. If you want a drink, Castell said when he was finished, maybe you'd better get it yourself. In that case, I don't want it, I said. I'm trying to figure out, I continued, what it was you had to offer Huntington that would cost sixty or even thirty thousand dollars. I've seen the kind of dirty pictures you sell. A million of them aren't worth five dollars. Who's talking about pictures? Who said anything about pictures? I did, I said. Well, forget them, Castell growled. Why? I pursued. Did Huntington meet you in the Easton Hotel and want to buy pictures? What the hell do you keep talking about pictures? Because it makes you jump, I answered. That's why. Every time I say pictures, you'd think I touched you with a live wire. Mario, get us a drink, he commanded. So you don't like the pictures I sell, he said to me. I shrugged. Of course, I'm no pimply-faced kid, I admitted. Or like Mario here, or Vito. All I know is I've seen them and they stink. You take some broken-down dame who wouldn't even get a tumble if she walked naked through the courtyard and sing-sing, turn a spotlight on her in front of a black sheet, tell her to stare off into space, drink your drink, and then you call that a picture? You don't know anything about pictures, Castell said defensively. The needle was working. I kept turning it. The trouble with your pictures, I said, is that you let your own taste guide you. Why, you goddamn... And your taste stinks. I told Rocky Castell and then stared into my drink and tensed myself. But he didn't say anything. I looked up again to find him grinning at me. Besides, I said, it's a cheap nickel-chasing racket anyway. You wouldn't make thirty grand at it in thirty years. I knew better than that, but I said it to get a reaction from this egomaniac. He was still smirking at me. You think so, do ya? He asked in an oily voice. I got bad taste, huh? How about that blonde, Dane? Could she walk naked through Sing Sing? Could she? How'd you like to hear about some of my special pictures? Very special ones. I had known when I started that it might come around to Sally. Here it was. I gazed into my ice cubes again and said nothing. What's the matter, Dane? Cat got your tongue, fresh guy. Look at him, Mario. I'm looking, Mario leered. It looks good. He's got a bad for a certain dame, Mario, said Castell. A blonde twist. But Castell saw her first, see, and Castell has her all wrapped up ready for delivery. I jiggled the ice in my glass, made it revolve around and around. Okay, Seamus, he said. Since you want to hear so much, keep your ears open. I'll tell you about some pictures worth thirty thousand dollars. You want to hear it? I looked up at him. If it gets boring, I said, all I have to do is get up and go home. He was still grinning at me maliciously. We'll see what you do, he said, and leaned back comfortably in his chair. I told you this happened six months ago. I went up to that hotel room and met Huntington. He looked just the way he sounded on the phone. The typical well-heeled big businessman. Solid as a rock and loaded with honesty. Costello laughed as he remembered how Walter Huntington had looked to him that night. A real Boy Scout, he went on. And he came right to the point. He said he wanted to buy some pictures from me. Pictures? I asked him for sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, he said, but not the kind of pictures you sell to everybody else. What I want, he said, are very special pictures. Exclusive, he said, and nobody owns them but me. <laughs> How do you like that, Dane? He was an art collector. Costell laughed again. Yeah, he was an art collector. Very funny art. You hear about perverts said Castell, and I do a big business selling to guys who just sit around looking at a naked dame and drool. But this Huntington was the world's champion screwball. Wait till you hear about what he wanted. First of all, he said, they had to be nude pictures of girls who wouldn't in a thousand years pose for a nude picture. Castell watched from my face for a reaction. I tried not to give him any. Get the guy's angle, Seamus. He was a goddamn peeping Tom, but he wanted the dame to stand still so he could watch her. Ever hear of a character like that? What did you tell him? I told him it sounded like a tough job. Sure it is, he said. That's why it's worth so much money. Who, I asked him, is supposed to pick out the girls? And when they are picked out, they won't want to pose. 
I told him it didn't make any sense. He said he'd find somebody else who could do it. Relax, I told him. I'll do it. Okay, he said, and here's how we work it. You photograph a girl like I described. She's got to be beautiful, he said, and fresh as a daisy. No dames like I'm taking pictures of now. Dames? I interrupted. Was that your word? My word. Any objections? No, I said. I'm just trying to get a picture in my mind of Huntington. What were his words? His words? His words were beautiful and virginal and unprofessional. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. So, Castell continued, he wants beautiful virgins posing in the nude, just like that. All I gotta do is put an ad in the Times and every gorgeous dame in New York comes running down here and pulls her clothes off. Except that he wants the ones who think a long time about posing like that for their own boyfriends. Anyway, that's what he's willing to pay good dough for. He tells me that I'm to let him see at least one every month, and for every one he likes I get 5,000 bucks. And he gets the negative in all the prints. In all, Huntington tells me he'll buy 12 pictures. That comes to 60 G's. Gastel stopped and gave me a sour look. What do you use, Seamus? A stomach for that liquor or some bottomless pit? Mario, make this sponge another drink. When I had the fresh glass in my hand, he went on with his story. Well, he said, taking these pictures is a lot of trouble, but not so tough as I thought. I run a hell of a risk, naturally. I'm dealing with a type of dame I never even met before let alone take pictures of. His lips inched back in a mirthless grin. Then it's a lot more pleasure than I ever had. It's getting to be a hobby, he said. How did you take these pictures? I got ways, said Castell. It's involved and it takes time, but I get the pictures all the same. You said you made 30,000. That's six pictures. Now Huntington is dead, I said. What about the other six? There aren't supposed to be another six. That's the whole point, wise guy. Like you say, I delivered six of them. Then I started having trouble with Huntington. What kind of trouble? Well, he doesn't want any more. You see, Dane, the sixth picture just happens to be the blonde queen. How do you like that? I was supposed to be jolted out of my seat by the news. His face was lit up like a Christmas tree with expectant excitement. All I did was gaze back at him and take a swallow from my drink. How do you like it? I said. I like it fine, Seamus, just fine. You haven't got any idea how much I like it. I like it so much I'd kill a guy who got in my way about it. I put the glass down and smiled at him. I'm a popular guy, I said. Little Vito, this greaseball here. I threw a look at Handsome. And now you want to kill me? I'm a popular guy. You'd have a tough time buying life insurance, Castell said. A very tough time. Here we go, wasting valuable time, I said. Let's finish your tale so I can go home. I'm starting to get bored, Castell, and very tired. You fresh bum, he said. Okay, like I just told you, I gave Huntington the picture of the blonde, and he gives me 5,000 bucks cash. Then the next day I get a call from the dame that had contacted me the first time. Thanks, she says, for all you done, but we don't want you anymore. What do you mean, I asked her. I'm burning. There's still six more to go on the deal. What deal, she says. Do you have some kind of contract? Put Huntington on the goddamn phone, I told her. Quick. Then Huntington tells me that after looking at the last picture, he's decided he doesn't need any more. He says anything else I gave him would be an anticlimax. See what I mean, Dane? It's some picture. You'll never find out, but that kid has a body nobody's ever seen before. How do you like that? He bought her picture and then quit. I said, to keep the story rolling and get away from how I liked it, which I didn't the more I listened. What did you say to Huntington? I told him he was doing business with Rocky Castell, that's what. I told him to write out a check for $30,000 and put it in the mail quick. That bastard laughed at me. That's when I decided to look into his life a little. What do you mean, look into his life? Figure it out yourself, said Castell. Here's a guy who's got a very big job and a very big company. It's such a big job that he's ready to pay $60,000 and has already shelled out 30 of it for a thing like a nude picture. Any guy who's as screwy as that Seamus is screwy in a lot of ways. What I want to do was find out about some of the other things and also annoy the hell out of him when I was doing it. Shakedown, I said, just like I told you before. Shakedown hell. The guy agreed to do business for 60 grand. Now he reneges, so I decide to pester the bastard and scare him private cops until he comes across. Meanwhile, I'm finding out what makes him tick. 
for a shakedown. You're an annoying guy, Dane. Will you, for Christ's sake, stop saying shakedown? He turned his hands around and stared at the palms again. All right, he spoke again. Now you know everything I know. Let's hear your ideas on why he jumped out that window and why that harmony joint burned down. I haven't got any ideas, I said. The hell you haven't. What were you doing up at Oceanic this morning? And my boys spotted you at the fire. What were you doing there? What were your boys doing there? I'm watching everything, he said. I'm watching the Goyle, I'm watching Oceanic, and I'm watching that bar. At least, I was. Hell, I even figured to pull a stick out up in Huntington's place in Westport. Why? I asked. Why all the red-hot interest? Costell turned in his chair and looked at one of the walls. When he spoke, it was slowly. A hunch, he said. Just a feeling. From the first time I ever saw that guy Huntington, something smelled wrong. You mean, don't you, that Huntington didn't look like the type who bought pictures? Something like that. I've sold too many of them to too many people. You get so you can spot the screwballs by just passing them in the street. And he acted like one and talked like one, but didn't look like one. Yeah, he turned to face me again. Now, let's have it, Dane. Spill it. I have nothing to spill. I went down to the Harmony and I came back. I went down to Oceanic and I came back. Now I'm down here in this lousy joint of yours and I'm going home. How much, Dane? See how I treat you? I ask you like a businessman, how much do you want for your goods? I'm a lousy businessman. I have nothing to sell. Who are you working for? You know I wouldn't tell you, even if I was. You'd be surprised what you'd tell me, Dane. Surprise me, then, I told him. Now you're getting annoying again. I'll give you 5,000 bucks for what I want to know. You're amazing, Castell. First you want a lot of information for 50 bucks. Now you offer 5,000 for the same thing. What kind of businessman do you call yourself? Do you want 5,000? I shook my head. No deal. Ten, Dane. Ten thousand in cash. More than you figured you'd earn all year. Ten thousand if you go to work on this thing. Give me all the answers. More, he said, than I'd figured to earn all year. For one job, this sleek thief was going to hand me ten thousand dollar bills. My impulse was to shake my head again, but I stopped the motion. No deal, I said. But I'll tell you what I will do. You have a print of the picture you took of the girl. Huntington has, or had, the negative. It's hanging around somewhere. You give me your print and I'll clock this whole caper for you. All the answers, like you said, for the picture. The gangster stared at me in amazement. You're crazy, Dane, he said. You're the craziest of them all. Is it a deal? My offer was ten thousand dollars, he said. That picture stays with me. And pretty soon, he added, I'll have the negative back. Nothing doing, Dane. I stood up, my mind crowded with many thoughts. All night, I told him, you've been talking about me getting killed because you don't happen to like me. Well, I'm telling you something, Castell. That picture of the girl is liable to get you killed. By you? By me. I want that picture. I want it bad. You don't get it. And you don't get the girl. This is your last notice, Seamus. Stay away from her. Forget you ever saw her and forget about the picture. And stay out of this Huntington thing from this moment on. Both the girl and the business belong to me. And if you don't want to play it smart, then play it dumb. But don't bump into me along the line. Don't get in my way, Dane. Now get out. That was how it went that night in Rocky Castell's cabin club. Oh, there was something else. Hanson wanted to make a good impression on his boss as I left. He grabbed my arm roughly and began to hustle me out the door, murmuring obscenities along the way. I flattened him with a left hand. It wasn't much of a punch, but then Hanson wasn't much of a man. And I don't think he made much of an impression on his boss, what with one thing and another. End of chapter 12「Thirteen. I don't own an alarm clock. It isn't down at Uncle Sam Panansky's keeping my forty-five company. I just don't own one. Never have. When I go to bed, I tell myself what time to wake up the next morning, and give or take five minutes, there I am. 
The morning after my visit took Estelle, still dripping cold shower water and pulling on the day's first cigarette. I called Sally and woke her. How are you with money? I asked. Wonderful, she said sleepily. You'd be surprised. There was a pause that must have been a yawn. Are you asking me to marry you? I'm asking how you're fixed for money. Do you mean, do I have any? Yes, sweetheart. All I have is... Did you call me sweetheart, darling? Yes. Oh, that's nice. Her voice was smiling. You should wake me every morning, Timothy. Go on, tell me some more. Sweetheart, I said, have you got any money? I told you, she answered. All I have is what he gave me. Castell, I'd rather borrow a C&I dog and beg nickels on Broadway than touch any of it. Fine. I've got some here that's comparatively clean. I'll see you in half an hour. I picked out my blue worsted, a white shirt, a dark red tie, blue socks, and my black, severe-looking shoes. I wasn't being fastidious. I was dressed in the only presentable clothes I owned for my visit back downtown at the Oceanic Building this morning. Then I took a quick breakfast and went over to Sally's with a hundred dollars. Jean had already left when I arrived, and Sally greeted me at the door, looking like a piece of sunlight that had chipped off. For the next hour, I told her I had work to do, and she kept agreeing with me and pouring coffee and saying things like, The way I'm walking around here, practically in a nightgown, you'd think I was on my honeymoon, <laughs> wouldn't you, Timothy? But I left, and when I did, things had come to a pretty pass between us. So pretty that I had forgotten all about Rocky Castell until I was entering an elevator in the lobby of the Oceanic Building. The prim, flat-chested thing at the desk told me it was not only impossible, but unthinkable to see Mr. Forbes without an appointment. Call him, I said. And from the look of horror in her eyes, you'd think I was something that had crawled out of the wall and was waving my antenna at her. Call Mr. Forbes? I reached over, picked up the phone, and spoke the sacred name into it as the receptionist began a silent, face-contorting swoon against the desk. Mary, I said to Forbes' secretary. Timothy Dane, I'm in the reception room, and I'd like to speak to the old man right away. Fine. Will you tell that to the watchdog out here before she chokes on her own indignation? I walked on through toward the Citadel. Huntington's ex-office, or vice versa, looked the same as it had the afternoon before. The dark-haired girl had her back to me, and she was taking dictation again. Except, and I almost tripped over my black shoes, the man dictating to her was Jocko Robinson. Aye, how us private slobs were getting up in the world. And fast. Very fast. I stood in the doorway and looked in at him. He was studying a paper as though it was all he had ever done in his life, and I had to keep staring to convince myself that this was the same Jocko who had crawled with me on his belly through the slime of the sewer under State Street, looking for $300,000 worth of uncut diamonds. He lifted his eyes from the paper, and there was nothing in them to show how surprised he should have been to see me. "'What do you want?' He greeted me, and I guessed he had forgotten all about that sewer crawling, among other things. The girl with the shoulder-length hair, slim waist, and long slender legs, turned around in her low-set stenographer's chair and gazed up at me out of languid black eyes that had no place in a business office, and I knew now why she had been holding Huntington's attention when I looked in yesterday. She had left more of her prominent chest out in the open than was enclosed, and straining hard beneath the delicate-looking material of her blouse. We surveyed each other silently, and for some reason there was an electric hostility between us. Why does that happen? Is it chemical, or is it the same thing that short-circuits dogs and cats on first sight? I watched her warily out of the corner of my eyes, though I expected her to spring at my throat, and answered Jocko Robinson's question. What the hell's it to you what I want? I said. Because, Jocko snapped, it happens to be my business, Dane. I thought I told you how things should be between you and this company. You told me, I answered, but you forgot to mention the fire that somebody was starting while you were assuring me that everything was settled up here. What do you mean, I forgot to mention it? I guess it slipped your mind, Jocko. Hell, you're such a busy little beaver these days, you can't be expected to remember every little warehouse that's burning to the goddamn ground. He was around the desk and pointing his little terrier's face into mine. His eyes were blazing behind the glasses. What do you think you're saying, Dane? What do you mean by a crack like that? I backed off from the little fireball. I didn't want to get singed. The man, after all, had been practically a boss of mine at the Pioneer Agency, and ex-bosses leave their mark no matter where your different trails lead. Well, what did you mean? 
His voice could have split an iceberg in two, though it wasn't even loud enough to carry into the hall beyond the office. I looked away from his furious face and found the peep-show brunette smiling at me in the unfriendly way I thought she would. I'll tell you what I mean, I said, when I'm through with the guy that still owns this place. And what does that crack mean? Still owns this place. You figure it out, I said. But I was halfway out of his office by then. Amazing. I sass Rocky Castell and practically run away from Jocko Robinson, a guy who'd give me about as much trouble in a fight as your Aunt Matilda. I turned to see him pounding down the hall after me in the direction of Forbes' office. I stopped and faced him. Where are you going, Jocko? I asked. I'm going to see Mr. Forbes. Where are you going? You know damn well that's where I'm going. What are you sticking your nose into it for? There's two things you'd better get straight right away, Dane. The first is that you're not wanted at Oceanic by anybody. The second is that I'm personally going to see to it that you don't disrupt the operations up here. Now, if you've wrangled an appointment to see Mr. Forbes, and I don't see how you have, then I'm going in with you. What the hell has happened to you, Jocko? Did you really get married? For a moment the sharpness left his eyes and I thought his shoulders fell in an, an inaudible sigh. But I must have been wrong. Time's changed, Dane, he snapped. Someday if you live long enough, you'll understand that. Times change and people change. I'm not the fool I was when I was risking my life seven days a week in Chicago for forty dollars. Plus expenses, I reminded him. Expenses? Your idea of expenses is a fifteen-minute lunch in a hamburger joint. A taxi instead of a trolley car. You don't know what expenses are, Dane. If you're going inside, I said quietly, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. But unless you want a punch in your ugly little kisser, you'd better get in there quick. Those days right after the war were good, and I wasn't going to listen to the guy who had shared them with me run them down. Jocko knew what I meant. Without another word, he swept by me in the hall and opened the door that led into the anteroom where Forbes' secretary, Mary, held forth with the microphone and listening equipment. "'I understand,' Jocko said, "'that Dane here has an appointment to see Mr. Forbes.' Mary looked at both of us, blinking her eyes in confusion. "'Well,' she began, I don't know whether you'd call it an appointment. Jocko spun on me. I thought so. What is this, Dane? More strong-arming? Will Mr. Forbes see me? I asked Mary, ignoring him. Should he? She asked, a thin smile on her strong, kindly-looking face. Yes, I said. He should. She looked at Jocko for verification. Maybe he should, he said. Maybe we can clear up Dane's business in about three brief minutes. Mary picked up the little hand mic and adjusted the earphones over her gray hair. It looked out of place, but at the same time she looked capable of doing it. "'Mr. Robinson is here to see you,' Mary said into the mic. "'The private detective, Mr. Dane, is with him.' As she said my name, she reached beneath her desk and pressed a button. That opened the door to Forbes' office, and the two of us went in. The timid little man, looking even more cowed and shy than I remembered from yesterday, sat behind the huge desk that swallowed him. I said hello, and he just continued to gaze at me. It was one of the saddest and most frightened faces I've ever looked into. Not terrified, but cowed. I said, I know that by your instructions I'm not supposed to be investigating the business of your warehouse, or the fire, or Mr. Huntington's death. No one seemed inclined to answer me, so I spoke again. I came up here this morning to find out if those instructions still hold. Don't ask me why I was so formal. Maybe it was Forbes who kept looking up at me like a cocker spaniel that's just been smacked across his rear end with a newspaper. Still, nobody talked to me. If that's the way you want it, Mr. Forbes, I said, then I'm going to return the retainer you gave me yesterday and consider myself relieved of all obligations to this company. That means, I added, that I'll feel free to sell my services to anyone that wants to buy them. Who, asked Jocko as I expected somebody would, would want to buy your services? Maybe, I replied, talking to the old man and not Jocko. I used the wrong word when I said buy. I meant I think I would turn over my report to the authorities. What report? asked Jocko. What authorities? I gave him what should have been a dirty look, but he returned it blandly. I turned to Forbes to answer Jocko's question. By authorities, I mean the city's homicide bureau, a very curious crowd, Mr. Forbes, and the fire department. Mr. Forbes? said Jocko, has already been bothered by the fire department. What did you tell them? I asked the old man. 
Mr. Forbes told them everything he knew about the warehouse, which was all he was able to tell them. The fire was a regrettable accident, Dane, but apparently it looks like some sort of detective story coincidence to you, and you alone. Do you mean to say, said Forbes at last, that you think there was some connection between poor Walter's act? He took a deep sigh. Between poor Mr. Huntington's demise, he went on quickly, and the fire at the warehouse. His milky blue eyes were as round as two silver dollars. Yes, I said. I think there was. But, but in what possible way, Mr. Dane, I said, frowning. The name is Dane, I said again. I can't tell you what the connection is between Mr. Huntington's death and the fire. Forbes seemed to recoil at the mention of his assistant's death. I only know that I feel a connection, Mr. Forbes, and I'm going to keep after it until I've been proven wrong. But you will, cried Forbes. You will be proven wrong. He was breathing strongly. There can't be... There mustn't be any connection. It's... Why, it's unimaginable, Mr. Uh, Dane. When he finished speaking, his mouth hung slightly open from the passion he seemed to feel. In that case, I said, I'll return the money you gave me not knowing where the hell I was going to raise the rest of his thousand bucks, and investigate independently. That will be fine, said Jocko. Good luck to you, Dane. Oh, no, said Forbes. Oh, we don't want that at all, Walters. There must be, no. Oh, how do you say it, muckraking into Walters' unfortunate act. I, well, if I felt there was something I could do to prevent any scandal from touching Walters' memory, and, and I failed to do it, Oh, oh, no. If Mr. Dane is so insistent, I think we should allow him to proceed. I say that because I know that Mr. Dane is a scrupulous person. He will not do anything that he knows serves no other purpose but to spread a necessary scandal upon poor Walters, upon his grave. The old man swiped furtively at his eyes. Well, said Jocko grudgingly, if that's how you feel, Mr. Forbes. It is the only way I can feel... But I don't mind saying that I am greatly disappointed in you, Mr. Dane. Tremendously. I thought that your sensibilities... Yes, sir, I said. But my senses won't let me abandon this thing. You've given me $1,000 to conduct a confidential investigation of your warehouse. Somehow that investigation began by concerning Mr. Huntington. Now, I added, picking my words carefully to keep the old guy from jumping like that, certain... Events have made it unfair for me to take that thousand dollars, and... Oh, I'll pay you another thousand, Forbes said. What? Both Jocko and I said the word in unison. The thousand, or whatever it was you received yesterday, was for what you thought you suspected at the warehouse. This is something different. This new investigation from what you say concerns Walter, or rather, Walter's memory, God rest his soul. I insist that you accept another retainer. Oh, yes, indeed. I knew Jocko was staring at me. I could feel the heat of it burning my ears. If he hadn't been, and if he hadn't been so surly before, I would have answered differently. I think that's very fair, I said, and out of the corner of my eye I saw Jocko rocking as though I'd slugged him. It felt just as good. Is that, I added cruelly for Jocko's benefit, in addition to expenses? Whatever is usual, said Forbes and it was obvious he hadn't even read about guys in this line of work. "'Very good, Mr. Forbes,' I said. "'Now I'll need something else.' "'Something else?' "'Yes,' I said. "'I'll need the fullest cooperation from the... Mm, employees at Oceanic. "'They'll have to be helpful, Mr. Forbes, if I'm to get anywhere.' "'Of course,' he said. "'For example,' I said, "'I'd like to start this morning by having a good look at Mr. Huntington's office.' "'Walter's office?' he was dismayed. His office? To begin with, Mr. Forbes, and I'll need all of the cooperation I can get. That means Mr. Robinson here. As I suppose you know, Mr. Robinson occupies Mr. Huntington's office now. Forbes nodded, not understanding apparently what was going on in here. And I'll need help from everyone else I may want to question. I understand, Forbes said. The voice that came from all points of the room spoke out suddenly. I'll instruct the staff. Mary said through the apparatus, to answer your questions and cooperate. Would you thank her for me, Mr. Forbes, I said. Obediently, the president of Oceanic picked up his own microphone. Thank you, Mary, he said into it. Then I thanked him and Jocko, and I left his office. 
As I emerged, Mary removed the headset and began writing another check. You are a very expensive man, she told me. I hope I'm worth it, I said. Yes, the old lady said. I hope you're worth it. I followed Jocko back to his office, keeping a safe two paces to the rear. From the set of his head on the bowed neck to the pistol-crack sound of his heels, Jocko was sizzling. All right, Weisenheimer, he said when we were facing each other near the dark-haired girl's desk. Now let's see you perform. You've got sixty seconds to work in. Get going. I've got all day to work in, I said, and all day tomorrow and the next day. After all, the old guy gave me a thousand dollars. I've got to be thorough. One thousand? Two thousand? And for what, Dane? You may kid him, but don't forget who you're talking to now. How could I? I said, walking around him to the large window behind the desk. He jumped from here? I asked. I told you that last night. That's what you told me, I agreed. Don't start that again. I'm warning you. If you don't want to cooperate, Robinson, I told him in a different tone, then I'll have to conduct this investigation differently. Holy Hannah, he breathed. Conduct this investigation differently. Have you ever heard anything like that? No, the girl said in a throaty, vibrating voice. I've never heard anything like that. I'll bet you've heard a lot of other things, though, I told her, looking out of the window at the scene below. It would have looked something like this to a man getting ready to jump. I beg your pardon, the girl said in that dirty voice. Granted, I said. Then I turned to Jocko. When the police came back up here to investigate Huntington's fall, who did they talk to? In the office, he said. The only one still around was Mary, Mr. Forbes' secretary. Besides Huntington, of course. Everyone else had called it a day and gone home. It's all in the record downstairs, he told me. The building checks everybody who leaves after five and arrives before nine. The police looked at that record, I suppose. What do you think? I smiled at him. I'm getting a thousand dollars. Two thousand, to think, Jocko. Very expensive thoughts. That made him snort. Where was Mary when the cops arrived? She was clearing Mr. Forbes' desk and getting ready to go home herself. Why don't you ask her? Jocko, if you don't want to cooperate. Look, Dane, I'm very busy. Besides my own work, I've got to handle Huntington's as well. Yes, I said. How come, Jocko? Since when are you a big insurance expert? Ask Mr. Forbes that, he said. He hired me. You've got a hell of a nerve, I said, yapping about my two thousand bucks. What's your haul up here, Jocko? Of all the goddamn gall, he said. Of all the goddamn gall I've ever listened to. This window, I interrupted. I assume it was open when the police arrived. Of course it was open, he answered angrily. Is this your idea of an investigation? <laughs> no, I laughed. Come here a minute, Jocko. He stood beside me and we looked out the window. I don't know anything at all about Huntington except what I've heard. I saw him once, and that was yesterday and only for a second. Do you know what he looked like to me in that second? What? He looked like a man who would stand here at this window for ninety years and never jump out of it. Jocko was silent for a long moment. Then he said, The man had his troubles, Dane, as you know. Jocko glanced to his side at the secretary who was watching us intently. He was very ill, been in bad health for some time. Finally, it looked to him like a better idea to be dead. Yes, I admitted, not wanting to fill her attentive ears with anything that didn't concern her. He had his troubles. All God's chillin' got troubles. All God's chillin' have their own ways of getting out of them. Huntington is out of his. For heaven's sake, let him rest in peace. I sighed and turned to look down at the desk. On one corner was a stack of insurance policies. The policy on top was stencil with the bright red word, cancelled. On the other side of the desk was another pile of policies from various companies, and these were not stenciled. What are these? I asked. This is part of Huntington's work, said Jocko. The brokers have to cancel their copies of the policies that lapse. I'm sending these over to the warehouse. What warehouse? We've rented one on First Avenue, he said. I picked up one of the cancelled documents and read it. The amount of premium was $38,000. What's this thing? I asked Jocko, pointing to a large square stamp in the lower left-hand corner of the policy. It had also been stenciled with the red cancelled. That's the federal tax stamp. What are you doing, taking a short course in insurance? 
Yeah. What do you mean a tax stamp? Since when do insurance policies carry stamps like this? Life insurance doesn't, he explained. These are marine insurance policies that Oceanic secured abroad. Any marine insurance placed by a foreign insurance company gets taxed by our government, Dane. We pay the tax by purchasing these stamps from the Treasury. How much is the tax? Buying the stamps was one of Huntington's jobs, Jocko said. Don't you know how much they were? He shrugged. I don't know. Maybe they run four or five percent of the premium. I whistled. Four cents for every dollar is a healthy cut for Uncle Sam. But what's all this got to do with anything? I told you I was busy, Dane. How about getting the hell out of here? Don't crowd me, Jocko. Give me room. Is that what you call being busy? Canceling policies? It's got to be done. That's the law. Yes, I answered. And you were always the boy who obeyed the law. Now look, Dane. Don't be so touchy, I told him. Sit down and play with your pretty red stencils. He didn't sit down. Are you getting out of my office? His voice was tight. For a while, Jocko, I said. See you around. He didn't say anything more as I left the office, but the dark-haired girl with the extraordinary build said goodbye with an inflection that was lost on me. I continued down the hall through the reception room, in and then out of the elevator, until I was finally out on the street again. I was thinking of nothing but what Jocko had told me about the policies and what I remembered seeing in the warehouse files two nights before. Maybe the law did say to cancel those internal revenue stamps on policies that came from abroad, but the one I had looked at had been issued in London, and it hadn't been cancelled. It didn't, in fact, even have a stamp in the lower left-hand corner. And that was how Huntington had been embezzling Oceanic. He had been buying stamps for the foreign policies, all right. But when a policy lapsed, say one in ten, he had not cancelled the stamp, but had transferred it to another policy, a new one that had been placed with some company like Lloyd's or Commercial Union. Then he had charged his department with the amount of the stamp, 4% of whatever the premium was, and in due course a company check would come to him as reimbursement for the tax money that had never been paid to the government. If he had been stealing in that way for a year, as Jocko had told me, the amount probably ran into six figures. A hefty theft, and an annoying one to track down. Unless, of course, you had been shilled into it. Then you stumble into a warehouse and blindly open up the exact file that tells the story. Where else would there be any evidence? Not in Huntington's office. All the policies there, the ones still in force, would bear the tax stamp. Only the policies I had seen in the warehouse. Their ashes I had seen last night would show what was going on. To me, that meant the fire in Huntington's death had to have a connection. And when they had a connection, then Walter had not willingly jumped from that window, and the fire had been deliberately set to cover up the embezzlement. Someone in that building had been working with Huntington. That someone had made him expendable. I told the cabbie to drop me at a Western Union office. The message I sent was addressed to Fred Shelby, owner of the Pioneer Agency in Chicago. It read, What do you hear about Jocko Robinson? Urgent and love, Timothy Dane. Then I got back in the cab and went on uptown to my office. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 My telephone had only been jangled once that morning, and after causing a high-grade disturbance in the bank with the deposit of a second thousand dollar check, I sat down to hear the girl from the answering service tell me to call Lieutenant Harper as soon as possible. I did. I gotta look at your friend, Hal said. They were just signing a release for his body at the medical examiner's when I walked in. The examiner was peaceful about him? I asked. Death by his own will is a result of a fall, he quoted. Huntington was a suicide. He was. Well, Hal said and paused. I looked at him, Timmy. Naturally, everybody started to fuss around because a homicide man was poking his nose in. The examiner started to op off very expertly, and I just kept nodding at him and looking at the corpse. Now listen, I wouldn't in 10,000 years want to get quoted on this, and it wasn't even enough to warrant holding the body from the undertaker. It could have happened naturally. What could have happened naturally, for God's sakes? The shape of his body, said Hal. The condition of it. You mean he didn't fall from that window? Oh, yes, Tim, he fell. Lord, yes. Huntington came down 43 floors and hit the pavement. Make no mistake about that. Then what are you talking about? I'm talking about the shape he was in after a fall like that. Tim, I 
looked at a guy three months ago. He was about this Huntington's age, 48, 50, and this guy jumped ten floors. Well, this guy's body is a lot more disarranged, if you know what I mean, than Huntington's. I don't know exactly what you do mean, I said. Bones broken, dislocations, limbs sprung from sockets. There was a lot less of that on this Huntington than on the guy who had dropped ten floors. What does that prove? I asked discouragingly. Proof? Tim, like I said when I started, it doesn't prove one blessed thing. But if you called me last night on just a little bit more than a hunch about this guy, then I advise you to keep after it. Because he didn't have as many bones broken. Exactly. You see, Tim, even when a person has made up his mind to jump from a building, even when they actually do jump, it's only natural to fight to fall. They stiffen up, Tim, sort of a desperate last-second bracing against the impact. It's when they stiffen up that their bones get broken and dislocated. That's why cats can take a hard fall. They're loose when they strike the surface, instinctively. Same is true of a trapeze artist. When he's doing a double spin and his partner misses him, he heads down through space toward the net. Now, if it was you or me falling, that net would snap our neck in two or break our back. But the trapeze boy lets himself relax, and nine times out of ten, he comes out of it with nothing worse than a bad neck burn. That all may be true, Hal, but I don't think Huntington was a trapeze artist. Besides, he knew he didn't have a net to hit. All that was waiting for him was Wall Street. Right. But suppose he didn't know he was falling, Tim. Suppose he came out of that window unconscious and never regained consciousness through the length of the fall. If he were out, he'd be loose and not tightening his body to resist the shock. Drunks and sleepwalkers take astounding falls, Tim, and just get up and walk away. Babies who haven't learned to be afraid of falling sometimes drop six stories and there isn't even a broken bone. Your guy could have been unconscious when he left that window. Could he have been dead, Hal, before he struck the pavement? Hal said no. He was killed by the fall, that is definite. Hell, boy, that was the first thing I asked the medico. The fall killed him and he might have been... Might have been, Tim, unconscious when the fall began. Could he have lost consciousness during the fall? I asked. Could he have blacked out? Hal said no again. If he had the energy to climb through a window and jump, he would have been conscious at the time he hit. Well, I said, thanks an awful lot, Hal. As you said, knowing a thing like that, or even thinking that it could be true, gives me something to hang on to. Thanks. You're welcome, he said. Naturally, anything you happen to turn up on it, you're going to get in touch with me immediately. You're not going to be one of these heroes who withholds evidence. Naturally, I said. People lose licenses for being heroes like that. Thanks again, Hal. He said goodbye, and that was that. What he had told me, of course, made me surer than ever that I was heading in the right direction. All I had to do was to find who had pushed Huntington out the window. Mr. Forbes, according to what he told Jocko, had passed Huntington's lighted office at 6 o'clock. Huntington jumped at 6.30. But Oceanic was empty of people except Mary, or so Jocko said the building's records would show. Things like that bother the hell out of me. It means I have to work. I had the phone all ready to lift and dial Sally's number to check on everything at her place. She had been on my mind steadily, and I thought that tonight I could pick up a few groceries, a steak, and a quart, and we could have dinner over there. But my phone rang before I could get a signal. I said hello to the girl who had said goodbye to me an hour ago in Jocko Robinson's office. She sounded as suggestive as before, and as it turned out, she actually did have a suggestion. She said that she didn't think Mr. Robinson had been very cooperative with me, but that if I wanted to try a few questions on her, I'd find her very cooperative. I told her that was very cooperative of her and was all set to throw my first question when she interrupted. Of course, she explained, I could be very cooperative too, and I could start by taking her out to dinner tonight. Why dinner? I asked. This is strictly business with me, sister. Exactly, she said. Strictly business. The dinner would be evidence of good faith, and after all, I did have those two thousand dollars and no cooperation up at Oceanic. What? I interrupted her. Did she have in mind? Exactly. She had three hundred dollars in mind. Exactly. For three hundred, I could buy information about Walter Huntington, about Jocko Robinson, about Oceanic, and, if I was interested, about Lorena Dahl. About who? About me. She said, I'm Lorena Dahl. Well, I said to myself, that makes sense. 
You didn't look like a secretary. You don't talk like a secretary. And unless Billy Rose has opened a business school, you aren't even named like a secretary. Aloud, I asked her what made her information worth $300. The same thing, said Dahl, that made it worth $2,000 to you. Sorry, I told her, but I doubt if you could give me $10 worth of news that I haven't gotten already. You lousy cheapskate, said Lorena Dahl. So long, lady, I said. Make it a hundred, she said, plus the dinner. It was the old story. Pleasure versus business. Sally against this man-eater. Okay, I said, all business. Where do I pick you up? She named New York's famous women's hotel. She said eight o'clock in the lobby. She said bring the hundred with me, in cash. She said goodbye. I held down the button on the cradle of the phone, let it come back up again, and dialed Sally. I was just going to call you, she said. How would you like to come over here and let me cook you a dinner? Oh, fine. Steak? I asked. And what a steak. But first there'll be cocktails, and after dinner... I'll have to get a rain check, Sally. I'm working tonight. Oh, no. But you have to have dinner somewhere. That's where I'm working, I explained. At dinner. She was silent for a moment. Will you call me when you're through? She said. No matter how late? With pleasure, I told her. Goodbye, Sally. Bye, Timothy. And Timothy, whoever she is, I hope she chokes on her antipasto. She hung up. At 8.15 that night, Lorena Dahl slithered across the spacious lobby of her hotel in a shimmering dress of coal-black satin that she should have bought at half price. It was only half a dress. The front was two strips of satin that tied around the back of her neck and plunged their separate ways until they joined the body of the dress in a V, just a sixteenth of an inch above her navel. With each undulating sway of her body, two very round and very firm breasts fought to get out from behind the thin strips that held them. The breasts seemed to be winning, and if Lorena Dahl ever took a deep breath, the battle would be over. I stood up and said hello, wondering if we'd be arrested before we got out of the lobby. I'm a little late, she purred. I took some extra time getting dressed tonight. I wanted to look special. You do, I said truthfully. That's good, she answered. I think our conversation this afternoon went all wrong. I really do want to be of some help to you, Timothy. She cocked her head at me seductively, and the two black eyes promised all a man needs but help. We got out of the hotel safely, and after we were in the dark interior of a cab, I asked her where she would like to eat. Someplace special, said Lorena snuggling into the seat comfortably. Some place where we can pretend we're just a man and a woman going out on a date. A very nice-looking man, incidentally. Some would say she had a voice that was charged with sex and passion and longing, and the promise of longing fulfilled. But it just annoyed me, and the words she spoke annoyed me more. It was a phony sex, and laid on with a trowel. Where would you like to eat? I asked again and the driver was turned in his seat waiting for the same information. The Skylight Club, said Lorena Dahl, and when she said someplace special, that was what she meant. Let's just sit on top of the world, just you and me. I gave the address to the driver, and we were there in several minutes. An express elevator climbed relentlessly for sixty-four stories, and we stepped into the rather breathtaking lounge of the Skylight Club. The man behind the plush rope glanced appreciatively at the girl and quizzically at me. "'Good evening,' he said. "'This is Mr. Dane,' Lorena told him. "'Ah, oh, yes,' he said, glancing at a card in his hand. "'We have the table you requested, Mr. Dane.' A look that was supposed to be supercharged with meaning passed from his eyes into mine. But, of course, I didn't get the point as yet. He held the rope down for us with a flourish, and we followed him across the expensive, thick-rugged room, past a very inviting little bar set unobtrusively against the wall, and out onto a small balcony that really did overlook the whole world. The balcony had room for only one table, and this glowed in the soft light of a single candle. Around the table ran a sort of couch, and I held the girl's tanned bare arm to help her sit down. "'What will your cocktails be?' asked the captain. For me, a martini, she said. Very, very dry. Very, very powerful. As mademoiselle wishes, he answered, his eyes making a photograph of Lorena Dahl's figure. And what does monsieur wish? I wish that everything was just as it was, except that the girl in the satin, uh, dress, 
had honey blonde hair, a warm voice, and an honest smile. Out loud, I wished for a dry Manhattan. My old standby, rye on the rocks, seemed a little crude for the balcony table at the Skylight Club. And as I suspected, the bartender here knew how to blend a cocktail so that the vermouth was impossible to taste. The drink was good and cold, and I sipped it appreciatively. The girl went after her crystal-clear martini as though somebody had poured water into it by mistake. Then she was lifting her second one and smiling at me brightly in a toast as I worked my way halfway through my first. Well, she said, how do you like my arrangements? If you overlooked anything, I replied, I don't know what it is. Isn't it special, Timothy? Isn't it a date? It's something, I said, and she can make what she wanted to out of the word. When do we eat? Her eyes opened in great surprise, and she leaned forward to rest her hand over mine. The movement, of course, played havoc with the narrow halter over her chest. Eat? Oh, Timothy, we've just arrived. Drink and be merry, said my half-naked companion. For later we eat. Don't you want to be merry? Her head was tilted far to the side, and the great mass of jet-black hair hung provocatively just above the tabletop. I looked at her eyes, and her eyes moved to the opening in the black satin. Be merry with me, Timothy. Just as suddenly she was erect and the fire had died in her eyes. Lorena wants a martini, she announced. Very dry, please. I moved my head and a waiter appeared out of nowhere. I ordered the drink and a second one for myself. I've changed my mind, she said to the waiter. I'd like a double martini and make it snappy. When he got back, I asked for menus, and when he got back again with those, Lorena Dahl ordered another martini, double. It was an amazing performance. Not the quantity the girl took, but the fact that they didn't seem to have any extra special effect. Except for the dead seriousness with which she ordered the martinis, drinking them didn't seem to make her especially sloppy or even drowsy. She was still laying on the charm broadly, just as she had in the lobby of her hotel. You don't like my dress? She told me. Why do you say that? Oh, I suppose you like it, she said, glancing down at herself critically. But you're not crazy about it. It doesn't make you drool, does it? You don't look at me and get ideas like every other man does. Who the hell are you, anyway? She asked suddenly. That was a tough question, and I was saved from answering it by the arrival of two marvelous-looking fillets. And not only did they look marvelous, they tasted delicious. In fact, I became so absorbed in the steak that I was hoisting my third forkful before I looked up to see my undressed lady watching me intently, her knife and fork lying innocent and unused beside her plate. "'What's the matter?' "'I didn't come here to eat,' the girl said. "'What did you come here for?' "'I didn't come here to eat. I want another drink.' "'It's a beautiful steak,' I told her. "'I want another drink,' she repeated like a broken record." When it arrived, she attacked it as though she had just crawled across Death Valley. "'You make me sick,' she said. "'Don't confuse me with those martinis,' I told her. "'Do you really feel sick?' "'Go to hell,' she said. "'I feel fine. Stop eating that damn steak and look at me. Don't I look good enough to eat?' She held her fingers on the thin strips of the halter as though she were going to pull it away from her breast. I slammed my fork hard on the table. "'Look,' I told her sharply, keeping my voice low. You can cut out the goddamn nonsense right now. You conned me into this thing, this date, as you call it, but now you can stop trying to prove you're something special in women. Sit there and drink this place out of its gin, I growled at her. But for Christ's sake, stop threatening to take your clothes off every other second. Did you bring my hundred dollars? asked Lorena Dahl, sitting erect and holding her head back. The deal's off, I told her. You can't, she cried. I need the money. What you need is a rest, honey. Go join a nudist colony. Her fingernails dug right through my jacket and into my arm. Please, I need the money. I can tell you all about Mr. Huntington and about Mr. Robinson. I looked at her closely. She didn't look tight, but very much sober and in earnest. And you ask about those insurance policies this morning? She said. What about them? Do you have the hundred dollars? Yes, I said. What do you want me to do, take it out and give it to you here? She nodded and held out her hand. I shrugged and took an envelope full of five-dollar bills from my inside pocket and laid it on the table near her tiny purse. She scooped it up, counted the bills carefully, and put the envelope in the purse. Then she smiled at me. 
Now, she said, suppose I told you to go to hell, what would you do? Don't try it, I said. She laughed. If you made a fuss, do you know what I'd do? I'd stand up and scream to the whole place. I'd say you slept with me and gave me a present, and now you want it back? I'd like to see your face then. I watched her and knew that was exactly what she would do. But you wouldn't like to see your own face, I told her. I'd slap you silly, sister. Your teeth would rattle. It was her turn to watch me, and I think she knew I meant it, too. All right, she said. What do you want me to tell you? Start with the policies, and don't pull any more of your act on me. You know, she said, you could sleep with me, tonight, if you wanted to. I don't like you at all, she added, but I'd like to go to bed with you. All I'm buying is information, sweetheart. Tell me about the policies. It'd be for free, Timothy. One on the house. There's a little hotel just around the corner from here. Well, tell me about the policies, damn it. I'll tell you about them in bed, she said, if you're still interested. You'll tell me about them right now. Right now. She began to sulk, but she also began talking. Mr. Robinson lied to you when he said he didn't know exactly how much the tax stamp cost that goes on the policies. He knows what they cost. I've heard him talk to Mr. Huntington about it several times. I offered her a cigarette and lit one for myself. He talked to Huntington about the stamps? What did he say? Oh, he'd just come in the office and pretend he was curious. It was never official, really. Mr. Robinson would just act friendly and interested. And was Huntington friendly with him? Well, he wasn't unfriendly. Listen, can't we leave here, Timothy? No, I told her. And then the waiter came to ask us about dessert. I ordered some brandy and iced coffee. He brought that, and I asked the girl to go on with her information about Jocko and Walter Huntington. I really don't like you at all she said. Understand that, but you're certainly different, and... And you're a masochist, I interrupted. Stop talking about us going to bed, Lorena. We'd probably kill each other. Stick to things like tax stamps. Did Huntington ever let you cancel them when he was busy? Never, she said. What the hell's a masochist? Look it up when you get home. He was pretty careful about who stamped the policies and canceled them. And how? And I'll tell you something else. You said that Mr. Huntington didn't look like the type who would jump out the window. Well, I was his secretary for six months, and I know he wasn't the type to do a thing like that. And he wasn't in bad health, either. I guess you'd know about that, I said. She shook her head. No, she said, shrugging. Not that at all. Mr. Huntington was one of those happily married types. All he ever talked to me about was the insurance business. I guess it was the look in my eyes. Honest she said. He never said boo to me in all the six months I was there. She sounded like she meant it. How did he come to hire you as a secretary? I asked. He didn't hire me. I was assigned to him. Who did hire you? She looked at me strangely. I'm selling you information about Mr. Huntington, she said. Isn't that your job, to find out what made Mr. Huntington jump out from the window? In a way. What's so mysterious about who hires you at Oceanic? Ask me questions about Mr. Huntington, she said. I sipped at the brandied iced coffee. Okay, I said. Did Mr. Huntington like your picture very much? She had been lifting her own tall glass, and now it slipped from her hand and clattered to the floor. A squad of waiters appeared and whisked the broken glass away. I waited until Lorena Dahl had a fresh drink before speaking again. Isn't that how you became his secretary? Because of the picture? She poured the brandy into the coffee very deliberately. What? she said very quietly. Do you know about my picture? That's not important, Lorena. I haven't seen it, if that's what you mean. What is important, at least to me, is that you give me a song and dance about Huntington's virtue and all the time you know that the man made a hobby out of collecting pictures of nudes. And not only that, a picture of you is included. She was shaking her head as I talked. No, she said. You're wrong. You don't know anything about it. You've got Mr. Huntington all wrong. He doesn't... He didn't... Then she stopped. He didn't what? Are the pictures important? She asked me. Are they important in what you're supposed to be doing? Everything about Huntington is important. If I told you the whole story about the pictures, she said, how much would you pay me? I just gave you a hundred dollars, I reminded her. 
yes, but that wasn't for what I know about the pictures or why I'm working at Oceanic. Those things are personal, she said. They cost money. How much do you want? Three hundred dollars. Okay. Do you have it with you? No, I said. I'll give you a check for it, or an IOU. Cash, she said, shaking her head again. Would you give me five hundred dollars in cash? Five hundred? You must think those pictures of yours are as important as a hydrogen bomb. Maybe they are, she answered. I never thought of them in connection with Mr. Huntington's death. Maybe five hundred isn't enough. If you talk to yourself long enough, I said, you'll be up in the millions. I don't have to talk to myself about the pictures. I don't even have to talk to you. Maybe I'll talk to somebody else about them now. Who? She gave me that cruel smile again. Wouldn't you like to know? Come on, she said. I want to get back to my place and telephone somebody. What are you turning this into? I asked. An auction? That's right, an auction. What do you bid? Three hundred. All right. You take me home and I'll call some people for their bids. It goes to the highest bidder. I stood up from the table and left money for the check. You're making a mistake, I told the girl after we were in a cab again and on the way to her hotel. An auction is one thing, but what I think you have in mind is blackmail. Blackmail is a very bad occupation. Not if it pays, she answered. And this will pay. We didn't talk about it any more until she was leaving the cab. You go home, she said, and I'll call you. If three hundred dollars wins, then you can bring the money and I'll meet you somewhere. You're making a mistake, I warned her again. Blackmail never pays off. Lorena Dahl only smiled at me and walked away into the lobby of her hotel. I gave the cabbie my address and went on home to wait for her call. There was a telegram shoved under my door. Nobody at Pioneer talks about Jocko Robinson anymore. Love, Fred Shelby. The chief of the Pioneer Agency, I knew, loved to send cryptic messages. But what the hell did this one mean? Had Jocko quit Shelby, or had he been fired? Had he left for a better job at Oceanic, or was he in disgrace back in Chicago? I stuck the telegram in my pocket and then remembered my promise to see Sally no matter how late I got back. It was 11.30 as I dialed her number. Her roommate, Jean, answered. Timothy, isn't Sally with you? No, of course not. Why should she be? She went out an hour ago, Jean told me, fear and surprise in her voice. She was in a terrible hurry. She said she was going to meet you, that you were in trouble. Did she get a call? Yes, and then she flew out of here. Oh, Timothy, I'm scared. So was I. Plenty. But I didn't say so. I hung up and started out the door again. A dark shape faced me in the dimly lit hall. What the hell do you want? I asked it. I want to see you, Timothy, said Jocko Robinson. Save it, I said, pushing around him. Now I'm too busy to talk. He moved his body in front of me, and we collided. Wait, he said. Before you get into any more trouble, you'd better talk to me. What do you mean, any more trouble? Don't tell me you're lined up with Castell, too, you thieving bastard. Castell? Rocky Castell? What the hell are you talking about? Get out of my way, Jocko, before I knock you over. You and who else? He snarled, and I let him have it. He went down with a crash, and I stepped over him. I'd finish that right now, I yelled to him over my shoulder. But I'm busy, you lousy thief. I heard him call my name as I went out the front door to 53rd Street. I climbed into a cab on 6th Avenue and ordered him to get down to the cabin club as fast as his heap would take us. We were halfway there before I finally took time to think. And when I thought, I realized how badly I missed that forty-five of mine in Sam Panansky's safe. That would get me in and out of the cabin, if I had it. But I didn't have it, and I was going to get in and out of there anyhow, and Sally would be coming out with me. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 It was easy. Getting into Castell's office was easy. It required no more effort than simple walking. I paid off the cab, entered the cabin, strode past the bar, around the edge of the tables, past the high-bosomed brunettes singing on the bandstand, through the hidden door in the wall, across the foyer, and threw open the black door marked private. Rocky Castell was there, in the chair behind the desk. He wore a soft gray flannel suit, and his black hair shone with brilliantine, highlighting the gray sideburns. 
Handsome was there, standing near the desk. His face was still raw and discolored from last night. I forget how he was dressed or whether his hair was as shiny as his boss's. Sally was there, cowering in the chair I had occupied. She wore a sheer dress that was white and striped with blue. She was beautiful and worth anything. Especially after the indescribable way she cried, Oh, Timothy! and sprang from the chair and into my arms. I held her shaking body against me and whispered something or other to her that was probably trite and not worth remembering. Then I tried for a grand slam and missed an eyelash. I whirled Sally around and grabbed for the doorknob. As my fingers touched it, something in the lock clicked and the knob turned uselessly and unopening in my hand. From the desk, Castell had locked the door. Now what, sucker? I heard the mean, familiar voice at my back. What's your next play? Even if you'd gotten the door open, you'd have run into Vito. He just stepped out for a second. I took my arm from Sally's waist. Over there, I indicated the farthest corner of the room. Stand over there, baby, and don't move. Timothy, don't. Her great round eyes pleaded with mine. I moved my head again to the corner, and she went obediently, out of the immediate danger zone. I'm touched, rasped Rocky Castell in a voice that quivered with fury. This breaks my heart, Seamus. I turned to them. Both he and Handsome watched me from narrowed eyes, guns in their hands, and pointed at me. Knuckles rapped insistently at the door. A muffled voice said, Open up, boss. It's me, Vito. Wait there, Castell shouted back. Stay where you are. Then I dove headlong down toward the floor and across it in the direction of Handsome's legs in front of the desk. He had carried his gun at the hip with the barrel pointed at my head. I knew he would have had to read my mind to lower the sights in time to hit me. It worked. The shot passed over my head, and now my momentum carried me crashing against the gunman's legs, putting the wide expanse of the desk front between my body and Castell's own gun. Sally was screaming in terror. My shoulder hit Handsome just below the knees and lifted him off the floor and over my shoulder. His gun thudded against the thick carpet, and as I grabbed it, I rolled to the side of Castell's shiny desk. Outside, Vito was pounding on the door and yelling to get inside. Sally screamed again. Castell, surprised by my sudden dive in the noise and confusion, had no idea where I was. When he did see me, I was already coming up at him, and the slug from his gun damaged only the rug. My outstretched hand, the one that now held Handsome's gun, struck against his wrist and forced his arm upwards. He stood there like the Statue of Liberty when I hit him with everything my body held. Something inside his jaw made a dull crunching sound as he reeled backwards against the wall and slumped to the floor. I whirled to face the oncoming Handsome. Tonight he had the blackjack, and it was inches from my head as I turned. But tonight I was moving in luck. I wheeled away from it, and the force of his swing carried him head on into the upsweeping gun barrel I held in my fist. He cried out horribly and pitched forward on his face. The pounding on the door went on, but now Sally had stopped yelling. Her side was winning temporarily. I shot her a grin and told her to stay in that corner. Then I dug my fingers under Costell's expensive flannel lapels and hauled him to his still wobbly legs. The picture! I shouted into those glassy gray eyes. Where's the picture? The gangster began to shake his head, but I stopped that abruptly by rapping against his broken jaw with the side of the pistol. Where? Desk, he mumbled. Even moving his face to talk was painful to him. I shoved him against the wall again and turned to the desk. Desk, hell. All I could see on the desk was a row of colored buttons. No drawers, no nothing. It was as smooth on his side as on the other. I grabbed for him again angrily. Red, he pushed out through his lips. Red button. I jammed my finger on the red button and a panel on the right side of the desk slid sideways, revealing a shelved section. The middle shelf held a small stack of photographic prints. My arm darted inside and came back with the pictures. There they were, six prints of the six naked and beautiful girls that this louse had delivered to Walter Huntington for thirty thousand filthy dollars. Sally, my Sally, was on top, where she belonged in any crowd, posed singing as she had described it. I flipped through the others quickly. Lord, what women. On the bottom was Lorena Dahl, sitting at a typewriter, but turned around and apparently taking dictation, just as she did every day at Oceanic, except that in this picture she was not half-nude, but completely. Sally stood at my shoulder. Don't look at them, she said, just like a woman. Okay, I told her. I bent the prince double, picked up Castell's nude lady lighter, and touched the flame to their edges. You're burning mine, too? she asked just like a woman. I haven't got any use for your picture, 
I said, and then I had an idea. I slapped the burning edges of the prints against Castell's desk and got the fire out. I put them in my pocket. So you are saving them, she accused. Yes, I said, but I'm damned if I know why. Now, I added, comes the tough part. What do you mean? We both got in here, I said. How do we get out? Oh, Timothy. Are you all right, honey? What did that... What did he do to you? As I spoke, Castell began to get to his feet slowly, holding the left side of his face with his hand. Handsome still lay motionless on the rug. Outside of frightening me half to death, Sally said. He didn't have time to do anything. What did he say to you? He said he was going to take care of me for a while. That's what scared me. He said I was going to live upstairs over the club in a nice room. I was going to have everything my heart desired, including Rocky Castell. She stared at Castell and then turned her head from him quickly. What did you tell him? I told him... Sally stopped and looked at me like a little kid. I told him Timothy Dane would rescue me. I actually used those corny words, Timothy. I smiled back. And what did he say to that? He laughed and told me to act my age. He said I wasn't living in a fairy tale. And then, bang, you came charging into the room, just like a fairy tale. If I get you out of here, it will be one. I turned to Costell, whose eyes bored into my face, full of pain and terrible anger. The knocking on the door, which had stopped for a few moments, began again. Mr. Costell, came Vito's voice into the room. Everything all right, Mr. Costell? It's Vito. Let me in. The problem was whether to open the door and let him in or not. The brief silence before might mean that outside was not just a little hophead, but half a dozen more. The second problem was what button opened the door. Besides the red one, there were five more, all different colored. Suppose the blue button didn't open the door, but brought the half dozen guys on the run. Come over here, I said to Rocky Castell, but he only continued to glare at me out of those maniacal red-gray eyes, and I knew I couldn't frighten him into doing anything to help us get out. Even if I forced him, he wouldn't care if his own life was in danger. All that went through his mind as he stared was to kill me, and I didn't want to think of what he would do to Sally. Timothy, I'm frightened. She had seen what was in Castell's eyes as he stood there silently rubbing what seemed to be a badly aching jaw. Castell, I began again, knowing it was no use. What will it get you except a lot of trouble? Why not play it smart? Point out the button that opens the door and come over here and stand in front of us. Let us get out and forget about us. It was no use. His hot gaze moved between my face and Sally's, coming to rest on her. The girl, I said. Let the girl out. I'll stay here. No. Sally's voice had begun as a protest, but ended with a piercing, terrified, Timothy. The warning came too late. I felt a vicious, powerful blow against my leg behind the kneecap. Handsome had made a sucker out of me. He hit me again with the sapper, and the leg buckled under me. I went down on one knee and Handsome came up on one of his. My luck had run out. The blackjack came at my head with murderous swiftness, and though I ducked forward, it still caught me full behind the ear, hard, and I pitched forward. I felt the blackjack again. He struck at the collarbone where he had hit me yesterday. I lay on the rug face down and the room swirled crazily. Above me there was a terrible confusion of sounds. Sally's voice and dismayed sympathy trying to reach down to me. Handsome's and triumph. Castell's, just a mad, unintelligible roar, and then the sound of the door swinging open. Vito's high, choked voice sounded as meaningless to me as his boss's, but I knew that I had guessed badly. He had been alone outside. All I had had to do a short moment before was press all the buttons at once and take care of Vito as quickly as possible. That was all. The shattered nerve in my collarbone pained as much as the last time, but I had other things to think about now. I had Sally to think about. But all I could do was roll over on my back, unable to get up on my legs because there was nothing in my legs to get up on, and try to protect her from the floor. What with? Your eyes? I asked myself ferociously. No, you slick, stupid bastard. Then Rocky Castell was standing directly above me, and his hand was stretched toward Vito, a feverish gesture for the knife. The sharp, evil shiv appeared in Castell's shaking fingers and as I stared up at him helplessly, his arm darted above his head, and he came down toward me. A thunderous explosion rose above every other sound in that room. Four thunderous explosions, separate but in frantic succession, and four flashes of orange flame. Four shots from the doorway, 
and Rocky Castell came down toward me and the knife dug into his expensive rug. The man who had held it was draped lifelessly over my body, four holes in his body, one through the heart and the others in a straight line that ranged to the top of his head. It seemed very important to twist my own head around and see who stood in that doorway. To do it, I had to go through more tortures than hell itself, but it was the most important thing in my life to see who held that gun. It was Jocko Robinson who held a smoking police thirty-eight in his sure hand, and now it moved slowly between Handsome and Vito, who stood frozen on each side of me in the dead Castell. It was Jocko who had come through that door during the last possible second, and who knew that he must fire enough slugs to kill a man already in the swift act of murder, and still save two slugs to defend the new situation. It was Jocko, just like old times. "'Well, Dane, get up,' he said. "'What the hell are you waiting for? The second feature?' Nothing ever hurt so hard or felt so good. I smiled at him foolishly and got up, and I was glad that Sally was still too stunned to help me do it. If somebody had tried to help, I'd never have made it to my feet. "'What kept you?' I asked him, and fell down again. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16. I lay sprawled on the couch in Sally's apartment, my head in her lap, and she was taking the kinks out of it with the tips of her long, cool fingers. We both watched Jocko Robinson and listened to him. Back at Castell's there had been a lot of police. Jocko, being Jocko, had insisted we all hang around and wait for the formalities, and the law had come charging in, intimidating everybody they could lay their fat hands on. But the intimidation had stopped abruptly when Jocko went off into a corner with a sharp-eyed captain and let him look at something in his wallet. Now, in the apartment, I was looking at it. A neat gold badge lettered in blue with the words, Special Agent, Treasury Department, and in the center was the U.S. seal. This, said Jocko sarcastically, is what I wanted to talk to you about at your place. But you have to do everything the hard way, just the way you did up at Oceanic. If anybody did it the hard way, I told him, it was you. First you're a claims man, now you're in the treasury. Why all the hocus pocus? Jocko smiled patiently. This is only temporary arrangement, thank God. I'm not working for any sixty dollars a week when I'm a partner in the Pioneer Agency. Oh no, a what? Partner, he repeated. And your telegram about me to Fred was very sweet, Timothy. He called me and we had a laugh over it. That's why I came to see you. After Fred sent his wire back, I didn't want to get involved with that ridiculous forty-five of yours. What the hell do you mean, ridiculous? Timothy, Sally scolded. What the hell do you mean, ridiculous? I repeated. Skip it. He smiled, and the smile widened when Jean entered the room carrying a tray of cups and coffee. He watched her move around appraisingly. You girls, he said, have a very homey place here. The redhead beamed at him. We've never entertained a tea man before, she said. Jocko grimaced. Don't call me that, he said. The job was only a cover-up. I'm a partner in an agency, a very good agency. Have you ever been to Chicago? He added. No, I haven't, she admitted wistfully. Jocko, I interrupted. Let's not stray. Why are you working for the government? What were you doing up at the broker's place? It's a tax evasion job, he said. The Treasury boys had an idea that Oceanic should have been buying a lot more tax stamps than they were. They sent somebody around to see Mr. Forbes, and he referred them to Huntington. Huntington opened up the lot files and let them look at all the copies of their clients' policies. All the foreign policies had the stamps on, and the stamps weren't counterfeit. So the revenue guy went back to his office, and as far as they were concerned in New York, Oceanic brokerage was clean. But Fred Shelby was in Washington on business— and he got to talking shop with someone in the treasury. This fellow wasn't convinced at all. Fred asked him if a private outfit like Pioneer uncovered it, would they be entitled to the 20% that the government pays off for all tax evasion money recovered? This fellow said, sure. When Fred got back to Chicago, he got credentials for me as a special agent, and we figured out how to handle it. I came here and spent a week getting myself in a very run-down condition. When I thought I'd looked seedy enough, I went up to Oceanic and asked for a job as a claims investigator. Huntington talked to me, and when he asked for references, I mumbled something about having worked at Pioneer. Huntington said he would let me know. Jocko stopped to sip at his coffee. This tastes wonderful, he said. So what happened? I asked. Jocko gave me a look. So Huntington hired me. 
He had checked on me at Pioneer and got back a report that I was unreliable. It didn't accuse me of anything in particular, but it didn't have anything good to report either. And when Huntington hired me after that, then I was positive he was the thief I was after. Who else would want a claims investigator like I look to be? Gosh, said Jean, that was clever, Mr. Robinson. Jocko, he corrected her. Thanks. So you got yourself inside the place, I said, postponing their negotiations. What did you find out? I found out that Walter Huntington was a very cautious thief. For a thief, he held the stamp operation all to himself. Not even his secretary, that doll girl, could help him when it came to cancelling policies or stamping new ones. I tried to get into the act myself, but he shooed me away. Then one night after I'd been there spending Pioneer's good money, half of it mine, incidentally, I played a hunch. That afternoon Huntington had been busily cancelling policies, and I waited outside the building for him after quitting time. He carried a briefcase with him, and I followed him uptown to the Harmony Bar. You too? What? Everybody in New York must have followed Huntington to that little dive at one time or another. Well, I know about you, said Jocko. Who else? Millions of guys, I said. For millions of reasons. Tonight you killed a louse who had one of the reasons to tail Huntington. It turned out that he had the wrong reason, though. Castell had absolutely no idea why Huntington went in there. But you did, Jocko told me, and I was just getting ready to rig a trap for Huntington. Actually find him in the warehouse where he was lifting stamps off old policies to put them on new ones the next day. But you had to come nosing around and bring everything to a boil. It was accidental, Jocko. When I called you that night, I was just a shill. I was down there on Rocky's business, but I didn't know it. It was all my fault said Sally. Jocko shrugged. All's well that ends well. Pioneer doesn't get twenty percent of all the money that Huntington stole from the treasury. Why not? I asked. He smiled. Believe it or not, all that Huntington had in his safe deposit box was four thousand dollars. His bank account was higher, but his wife will be able to prove that the money came legitimately. The man must have gotten away with plenty, but where it is, is anybody's guess. I shook my head. There's still something very fishy, Jocko. He laughed. Oh, Bulldog Dane. The case is closed, Timothy. It died when Huntington jumped from that window. I started to say that Pioneer won't get twenty percent of any half million, but I went in to see Forbes this afternoon and explained myself to him and what I was doing. You've already told Forbes? Why not? The poor old guy ought to know, now that it's over. Besides, I've got to get back to Chicago. So soon? Jean asked. Well... Jocko began expansively. I don't... What did Forbes say? I broke in again. He took it hard. Very hard. But then he pulled himself together and said that he understood. He agreed that Pioneer should get something for its trouble. He's certainly a fast man with a buck, I said. He's got it to be fast with, Timothy. The next job you're on, you'll work a month for a hundred dollars. This one is wound up in half a week and you're two thousand ahead if it's wound up. Suppose, I said, that Huntington was only a part of the story. Suppose there's more. He grinned and shook his head. If you're thinking of hitting the old man for another thousand, you can forget it. Mary's going to keep Forbes away from you and every other private detective for a long, long time. We'll see. If Huntington was the beginning and the end of this job, Jocko, then who put a match to the warehouse? Jocko shrugged his thin shoulders. That's the fire department's headache. That warehouse fire was just one of those things, Timothy. A coincidence. Coincidence, my eye. Jocko's jaw set. Walter Huntington was a louse. He had everything he could ever want from Forbes. And instead of being loyal, he tried to steal the old man blind. That's what you say. That's what I know. Hell, I walked up there for four months, watching Huntington like a hawk every hour of it. He walked alone in this thing. There was no other thief but him. Let's take a walk, Jocko, I said. A walk? Now? Come on. Sally said, Let's all go for a walk. I never thought that being able to leave this apartment could seem so important. Why don't you go to bed? I asked softly. It's been a hard time, honey. You mean you'd rather we didn't go? You and I, I told her. We'll take a walk tomorrow night. Some place special. Where are you and Jocko going? We're just going out for a while. It's business, Sally. Isn't this mess over yet? Her voice had a quiver in it. 
For you it is, I said. For some other people, I'm not so sure. Timothy, Jocko said, if you're trying to ease your conscience about that money you got, why drag me into it? All you're doing is frightening the girls. Not as much as having to look at you. Come on, bright eyes, I said, taking him by the arm. The hands on the big paramount clock glowed at 1 a.m. as Jocko and I walked up 44th to Broadway. We had crossed 8th before I spoke. You still handy with electricity? I asked. Good lord, you mean you actually hold me out of that nice apartment to fix some busted lamp in your room? <laughs> no, I laughed. Another question. When you went in and resigned, let's say, from Oceanic, did you give Forbes your building pass? No, I didn't. I'm glad you reminded me, Timothy. First thing tomorrow morning. It's already tomorrow morning, I reminded him. I want you to hold on to that pass, Jocko. Come off it, will you, boy? All this talk about electricity and building passes. I think Castell and his friends put you on Queer Street tonight. I turned him into Louis, the hideaway bar that's a favorite of mine. The boss gave us a smile and pointed to the table I always use. When there were two drinks in front of us, I told Jocko why Huntington wasn't working alone. I told him about Hal Harper in the medical examiner's report. I tore down his coincidence theory about the warehouse fire. I told him about Castell's angle, about Huntington and the pictures. When I was finished, he was pulling on his chin and studying the snow-white tablecloth. Finally, shook his head. You yeah, make it sound good, Timothy. But Huntington is dead, and now Castell is the same way. If Huntington had a partner, if, then it was Castell. There's your case, all wrapped up and down at the morgue. He looked at me over the top of his glass. If you carried your ideas all the way out, he said, then I'd be number one on your list. I swallowed some of my own drink and put the glass down. You certainly would be, Jocko. You certainly were. Were, Timothy? I nodded. Costell and Huntington have been doing business for over six months. You've only been in on the case for four. Besides that, I smiled. I need you to help me nail down this thing. Well, thanks, he said. I still say you're crazy. I took out the picture of Lorena Dahl and handed it to him. Tonight, I said, this dame was ready to spill what she knew, and I think she knew who it is I'm looking for, but my price wasn't high enough. She went home to telephone somebody, maybe the somebody. She was also supposed to call me back. I hope she has, even though I wasn't there. I hope that whoever it is she's trying to blackmail about these pictures won't do business with her. Jocko looked thoughtful. Could have been Castell, he said. No, Lorena doesn't have much sense, but she's been around long enough to know you don't shake down Rocky Castell, or didn't. Jocko, I asked, who would have hired her as a stenographer? Huntington, he said, surprised. He didn't. Who else? Well, they don't have an out-and-out -out personnel man. One of Mary's side jobs is to take charge of the secretarial help. I frowned. Mary and these pictures don't ring a bell. For God's sake, Timothy, don't look at me like that. He was swallowing hard. I like girls as well as the next man, but I like them in all three dimensions. In three dimensions, like that little redhead we just left. That leaves Forbes, I said. Forbes? Jocko almost choked on his drink. That harmless old man. Holy Toledo, you're living in a dream world all your own. He put his hand out and laid it over my arm. Listen, he said. The girls are probably still up. Let's rustle up a quart of this stuff from your friend here and go back and have a little party. I haven't had a party with someone like Jean in years. I, Forbes, I said again. That's what I want you to help me with. If I'm right, Jocko, the fee you got in my 2000 are going to be just so much chicken feed. How's that? He looked like a partner in an agency now. We split whatever we get, I said. If I'm right, you take home half to Chicago. You can buy Fred out. Oh, I wouldn't do that, Timothy. After all, Fred was good enough to take me in. I wouldn't even suggest... Let's hear your idea, he finished suspiciously. I gave it to him in detail. Then I got up and called Hal Harper. I told Hal the pros and the cons. It's strictly for the robo boys, he said. It may turn that Huntington suicide into something else, I reminded him. When do you want to pick up the stuff, Tim? We were at Center Street Police Headquarters in 20 minutes. Ten more, and we had the portable wire recorder, the clamps, and the rolls of extension wire. The cab started up again and took us further down to the Oceanic building. A sleepy-looking night watchman examined Jocko's pass and took us up to the 43rd floor. We told him not to wait. 
that we were going to be busy for a while. We were. It took Jocko an hour and a half to make the tap in, and to make it look good. We tested it for 30 minutes more. It was 4 o'clock when I was finally back in my room on 53rd. When I dropped Jocko off, he hadn't looked happy at all. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 They had Lorena Dahl on the front page of the morning news. It was Lorena's long black hair and her slender waist and her beautiful legs, and she was in a negligee. She was lying on Madison Avenue, and there was an ambulance off to the side of the five-column cut. But the ambulance wasn't necessary because Lorena Dahl was dead. There were a few people standing around helplessly, and cops. The cops were staring into the camera, and if there was any expression on their faces, it was puzzlement. The caption was 72 points high and funereal black. Beauty and Death Leap, it said. The caption told who she was and said she came from Los Angeles, California. It went on to say that, she had been private secretary to Walter Huntington, who had killed himself in a similar leap the day before. According to police, said the paper, Miss Dahl and Huntington had apparently shared an illicit love affair. Huntington, they pointed out, was a married man with a family. His suicide had proved too much for the girl, and she had followed him in death. Other pictures were on page three in the centerfold, the caption concluded. I read the words over and over. I pretended I didn't know the girl and read it neutrally. That made it just as the paper said. Unrequited love. Suicide pact. No way out. But I had eaten dinner last night, and I had told the girl with me that blackmail was dangerous, and she had said, not if it pays. She had also been very sure of herself, and the breasts, which must have been warm then and full of life. I thought of the little hotel around the corner and how she talked like a nymphomaniac. What would it have taken? An hour? Two hours? Two hours out of my life. And how many would it have added to hers if I'd gone there and in her passion she had told me what the pictures were for and who they were for? The newspaper was wrong. Lorena Dahl hadn't died for love. She lived for love. But she died for money. For blood money. She died for $300.10. $0.10 cents for a phone call. And death had answered. It was 9.30. Things ought to be brisk and business-like at Oceanic by now. Every busy little bee in his hive making honey, storing honey, feeding the queen bee all the honey she could want. But there wasn't a queen at Oceanic, just a king. And the king wasn't big and fat, but small and frail and scared of his own thin shadow. A king whose heir apparent had jumped from a window. And Lorena Dahl was a number on a slab at the morgue. Maybe Hal Harper was still studying that body and scratching his head. Maybe, maybe there weren't the right number of fractures and dislocations. Maybe Hal was looking at Lorena Dahl and thinking of Walter Huntington, and remembering what we had talked about. Lorena was dead, and time was wasting. I dialed the number and got put through to Mary. I told her I was coming up to see Mr. Forbes. I'm afraid that isn't possible, Mr. Dane, she said. Why, isn't he there? Mr. Forbes is here, but I don't think he'll talk to you. He had... Another tragic upset this morning. Secretaries come, I said, and secretaries go. Or was Mr. Forbes particularly fond of Lorena Dahl? I beg your pardon, she said crisply. Mr. Forbes hardly knew Miss Dahl. It was a terrible thing, her suicide. But the upsetting thing to Mr. Forbes is the insinuations about the girl and Mr. Huntington. Mr. Huntington was like a son to Mr. Forbes. So I've heard it said, I told her, any number of times. "'But I have to see him anyway. I have something to return to him.' "'Oh,' she said, "'why don't you just deduct your expenses, Mr. Dane, and mail Mr. Forbes a check for the rest?' "'It isn't the retainer,' I said. "'I'm still working on this case.' "'But you said—' "'I said I have something to return to him.' "'What is it?' "'It's quite valuable. I want to give it back to him and collect my reward.' "'You're being quite mysterious,' Mary told me. "'What is this thing?' "'I'll bring it up with me.' "'You can only see Mr. Forbes for a few minutes,' she said. "'Mr. Forbes cannot bear any more irritation or excitement.' "'It'll only take a few minutes,' I answered, and hung up. "'The cab wormed its way downtown at an agonizing pace. "'Other cabs, thousands and thousands of them, "'huge buses, aggravating traffic lights, foolhardy pedestrians. "'Everything ganged up on us to keep me from reaching the Oceanic building. "'But then we were there, and I was paying the fare and tipping him. 
for exactly what, I'll never know, and the elevator was making its familiar climb to the 43rd floor. The girl with the inhaled chest gave me a frightened glance and immediately warned Mary that I was already going through the reception room and on inside. Mary greeted me with a tired smile. "'You seem to terrify the receptionist,' she said. "'Are you really such a dangerous person, Mr. Dane?' "'I've had my moments,' I said. "'Is he briefed and ready for me?' "'Mr. Forms knows that you are coming in to see him. I'll announce you.' "'That will be nice,' I said, and watched her pick up the little microphone and speak into it. "'The private detective is here, Mr. Forbes.' Then the door swung open, and I stepped in and got a surprise. Forbes was not alone in his tremendous office. Sitting uncomfortably in a chair against the wall was a stranger. To me, he was a stranger. What he was to the old man who watched me from behind the desk remained to be learned. "'Be brief, Mr. Dane,' said Forbes. "'This has been a terrible ordeal. I've had quite enough of death in detectives.' I turned to look at the stranger. He was a short, squat man, heavily built through the chest and not fat. His face was square and might have run to jowls if he hadn't kept himself in shape, which he definitely had. It was a face that looks dark with beard five minutes after shaving. If I say Jack Dempsey, you'll know the face. But he was a head shorter than Dempsey and not half so pleasant. If that makes you smile, then you'll know just how unpleasant the stranger who was scowled at me from beady eyes that were sunk deep in his head below black bushy eyebrows. "'Who's this ape?' I asked Forbes. The ape reacted. He grunted. "'You don't know this gentleman,' said Forbes. "'I don't,' I admitted. "'He isn't Margaret O'Brien, is he?' The ape reacted again. The reaction brought him out of his chair, and now he stood at full height. Five-two was my guess, and about three feet of it was in his big iron barrel of a body. "'Cecil,' said Forbes quietly. "'Cecil.' "'Cecil? What did Cecil make me think of?' It made me think of Clarence. Clarence Holbert. How's the bull? I asked the ape. It's you, he said in a snarling growl. You're the one. He took a step forward before Forbes stopped him. Cecil, sit down. It stopped him. It stopped me. This was Forbes speaking? The voice he had used on the ape was no timorous pipsqueak. It was a voice with volume and authority and malevolence. Now, Dane he said to me in the new tone. What is your business? What do you have of mind to return? Speak quickly. Instead of speaking quickly, I reached into my inside coat pocket and took out the packet of prints. Five of them. Sally's stayed in the pocket, but the others I laid on his desk fanwise. These, I said and watched his face closely. Forbes' head was motionless as he stared at the pictures. In his eyes was grand disbelief and then even grander confusion. The head and eyes moved, but not up at me. Without willing it, his glance swerved to one of the paintings on the wall, a still life of apples and pears and a vase. Then he gazed at me. "'What are these things?' he said. "'Those are women. Five beautiful women. They're for sale, Mr. Forbes.' "'Why bring them to me? Why would I be interested?' "'Aren't they yours?' "'Of course not.' I looked disappointed. "'Oh,' I said slowly. "'Well... Would you like to buy them? I have the negatives, and I'm going to print them up. Can I make you a set? No, you don't have the negatives. You don't have them. The authority in his voice had cracked. He was shrill now, out of his mind and crying. The hell I don't, I said. They're mine, he sobbed, sweeping the pictures toward him with his old bony fingers. Mine. I bought them. No one can see them. No one else. The voice that I had heard speak through the pictures on the wall was speaking now. Mary's voice. But it didn't come from the wall, it came from a spot a foot from my right shoulder, and something long and pointed was pressing into my back below the shoulder. "'I warned you,' said the voice, "'not to make the old man excited. Walk over this way.' The gun that was at my back indicated a direction toward the ape. "'Cecil,' Mary said, "'see if he carries a pistol.' The ape slid out of his chair with cat-like ease. The bull, the one in Bellevue, was this one's brother." But little brother moved even slicker. His large hands went over me expertly. Nothing, he told Mary. Can I have him? he asked. This is the one who sent Claire to the hospital. You may have him, said Mary, when we have talked to him. That would make three suicides, I said. Two from the same building in three days. What is that supposed to mean? Mary said. But I looked at Forbes. It means that this is the guy who pushed Walter Huntington out of the window the night before last. 
the fellow you loved like a son. Take him out of here, said Forbes. Throw him out the window. Who throws me out? I asked. Mary or this ape? I can kill you right now, Mary said. But that wouldn't be as cute as the window business. What did you do to her, Mary? Did you get her to drink until she passed out, or did you hit her on the head? What are you talking about? I'm talking about Lorena Dahl. She died on Madison Avenue last night, or was it early this morning? But she came through a window in her hotel. A woman's hotel, Mary. A man couldn't have come up there to see her. She knew that when I had dinner with her. That's why she wanted to go back there and make her call. She was calling a woman, someone who would come up and see her, and not even be noticed by the desk clerk or the people in the lobby. You were the woman she called. She asked how much it would be worth not to tell about the pictures. She wanted to know how much Forbes would pay for her to keep quiet about the pictures and the fact that she had been hired because Forbes liked the picture so much. I whirled to the old man behind the desk. Some picture, wasn't it? A private secretary taking dictation without a stitch on her back. You poor, perverted bastard, I told him. You looked at that picture and you thought it would be good to have the girl around. Actually, have her as a secretary. I didn't, he said. Like hell you didn't. But even that wasn't enough. You send your trained seal out on another dirty job for you. Walter Huntington, the man you loved as you'd loved a son, has to find out who the girl is that Castell photographed. He did locate her, and Mary here hired her as Huntington's secretary. And every day you'd watch her and then come sneaking back in here to slobber over her picture. Take him out, croaked Forbes. Throw him out the window. Mr. Dane, Mary said, you're such a fool. Imagine coming up here to tell us such things and then try to brazen your way through it. Nothing's going to happen to me, I told her. She laughed. Of course not. All that's going to happen to you is that you're going to die. Like Huntington, I said. Like that girl last night? Don't kid yourself. Oh, not exactly like them, she said. The only way for you is to disappear. Cecil will see to that. She pointed to the wall near Forbes' desk. That hides a private elevator, she explained. You and Cecil will descend to the sub-basement without a soul being the wiser. Rover boys, Hal Harper had cracked last night. Fantastic. This old man, this nice old lady... Knocking off the government for all that money. Buying pornography, having people killed. Now she held a gun in her motherly hand and was sounding off about secret elevators and sub-basements. Anytime Cecil wants to start, I said, is all right with me. But I'm going to give him a little more trouble than he had with Huntington. If I shoot him, Mary said dispassionately, it may be heard. That will bring the dreadful police again. Cecil will throw him out the window said the old man with the one-track mind. Make him unconscious, Cecil. Throw him out the window, like Walter. And then you can go down and start another fire, I told the ape, who was on his feet now and looking me over with a weird smile. Maybe Mr. Forbes has another warehouse you can burn down. Who told you about the fire? Mary asked. Why do you think anybody had to be told? The deal you've been working is all pegged out. Huntington was the fall guy all down the line. He didn't figure out the tax deal, but he was the sucker who had to carry the ball for it. Then Forbes got tired of the regular smut he was getting, so Walter had to front for that deal, too. Then I came into it, via Castell. You had no idea Jocko Robinson was smelling you out, but you knew I had to be handled. The first thousand you paid me was to keep me away from the cops. That gave you time to get rid of Huntington. Then Cecil puts a torch to the warehouse, and that should close me out tight. But I showed up the very next day, so you come through with another thousand. That was a big mistake. I'm just a poor working stiff. Two thousand dollars is a lot of money to me. And for what? For nothing? It was screwy, and my nose started twitching. Stop all this drivel, yelled Forbes. Stop this ridiculous talk. What did you come here for, Dane? More money? You fool. You walk in here looking for more money, and what you'll get is the end of your life. Like Walter. Like that silly girl who threatened Mary last night. Like everyone and anyone who is useless to me. He was puffing like a bantam cock. Of course it was Walter who changed the stamps. Who did you expect would do it? Mary? Myself? Someone had to, so Walter did. Walter! The fool actually thought he was going to inherit this business some day. Mary's voice soothed him. Don't get overexcited, Franklin, she said. I'm all right, dear. 
Oh, if it hadn't been for that scheming girl, that Lorena. No, I said. If you're looking to find out what happened this week, why it all blew up in your face, then blame yourself. Blame your greed, old man. If you'd been satisfied with less, you might have gone on fooling that treasury forever. And if you'd stuck to your deal with Rocky Castell, he'd have never gotten curious about Walter Huntington. Forbes sniffed at me and spread the five pictures on his desk. There's one missing, he announced half gleefully. The best of the lot. You didn't get that one. His face leered at me, senile and obscene. I didn't want any more when I had her. I have the blonde, I said, patting my inside pocket. His eyes traveled to the wall painting again. I shook my head. They're not in there, I lied. I broke in last night and took them all. You're lying to my brother, Mary cried. Your brother? I peered at her, unable to see any resemblance. What do you do with your share? Retouch pictures of Alan Ladd? The old man had come to his feet as I spoke, and now he ran toward the painting. It swung upward under the pressure of his hand, revealing the safe. He whirled the combination feverishly. Its small door swung open, and so did the big door behind us. Jocko came through that, along with Hal Harper and a young, uniformed cop. Mary made a strangling noise in her throat and pointed the gun toward her breast. My wrist deflected it, and the shell exploded at the ceiling. Before she could try again, I snapped it from her fingers. Harper was busily barking orders to the confused roomful, and I took a chance at reaching inside the safe. My hand came back with the negatives and a piece of paper crowded with numbers. Then everybody went uptown to police headquarters. It took an hour to book Forbes, Mary, and Cecil on all the counts that Jocko, Harper, and I had to explain to the open-mouthed assistant D.A. But then it was done, and Jocko and I left while Hal stayed behind to play the wire recordings for his boss. None of it, we knew, would amount to a damn as court evidence. It wasn't even worth an indictment. But it was enough to give the police and the revenue department a lead on what they could squeeze out of this trio. The next stop was the Treasury Office in the Woolworth Building. There, I turned over the numbered list, which carried the code names of the banks and the deposit boxes where the stolen tax money was stashed. It was when I had the agent's receipt in my hand that I finally stopped feeling like a shill. I've called myself a shill. I said I was taken for a ride by a blue-eyed blonde who didn't even give me her right name. Well, I was taken for two rides. The second ride was by train to an unheard-of place miles beyond even Montpelier, Vermont. It isn't even a town, just a half-hearted collection of stores that run alongside the railroad station. You walk a hundred yards from this town and you're in a deep, cool woods. We're a thousand yards beyond that, in a cabin that hangs out over the river and is surrounded by silence. The cabin looks rugged from the outside, but the inside is quite a surprise, even for a city boy. Oh, that agent from the Treasury Department. He said I was entitled to ten percent of all the money they find in Forbes Safety Deposit Vaults. It'll come to, he said, about $15,000. I'll believe that when they send me the check. End of the Perfect Frame by William Ard